Good evening, I'm calling to order the August 3rd, 2020 regular meeting and special town council meeting for the town of Fairfax. We just adjourned a closed session. There were no reports or findings from that session. And the regular meeting for this evening and the special town council meeting this evening will occur concurrently. Uh, Michelle, will you take a roll call, please? Yes, Madam Mayor. Uh, council Member Kohler. I'm here. Council Member Goddard. I'm here. Council Member Ackerman. I'm here. Vice Mayor Cutrano. Present. And Mayor Hellman. I'm here. All Thank present. you. And may I get a motion to approve the agenda, please? So, so moved. Moved. Second. I heard motion Goddard, second Cutrano. Can you take a roll call, please? So, yes. Council Member Kohler. Aye. Council Member Ackerman. Aye. Council Member Goddard. Yes. Vice Mayor Cutrano. Yes. And Mayor Hellman. Yes. Motion passes. And Council Member Ackerman, would you like to read the land acknowledgement this evening? Madam Mayor, if I may, um, were you going to report out on closed session first? Oh, I, I made a statement about that earlier, but I can say it again if you like. Sorry, no, I just missed it. Okay. Yeah, I, I advise there was no report. Okay, the Fairfax Town Council acknowledges that we are located on the unceded ancestral lands of the Coast Miwok people of present day Marin County. We honor with gratitude the land itself and all of its ancestors past, present and emerging. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, as far as meeting protocol, the mayor shall maintain order at the meeting. The council and the audience are expected to refrain from using profane language and or ridiculing the character or motives of council members, staff, or members of the public, and to maintain the standards of tolerance and civility. So with that, uh, the council will review the agenda at 10 p.m. to ascertain which items, if any, will be continued to another meeting. Any matter not started by 11.30 p.m. will be continued to an adjourned or regular council meeting unless the council votes to suspend this rule. We have a few announcements this evening. We Mayor, have can I just interrupt? Do we need to start the other meeting as well, which is just supposed to run concurrently? I already announced that at the beginning, Barbara. Oh, I apologize. I'm sorry. That's okay. Thank you. <laughs> I have several announcements. I'll try to make it quick with a very full agenda this evening. Um, we have vacancies on the following boards and commissions. You can find information on our town website or write to our clerk, Michelle Gardner at mgardner at townoffairfax.org. We have vacancies on the Planning Commission, Climate Action Committee, Parks and Rec Commission, the Volunteer Board, as well as Open Space Com Committee. And regarding last uh, meeting on consent, uh, if you recall, we had the letter uh, by council, a draft letter, and the council all agreed we want to the, excuse me, the letter to the Ross Valley School District concerning the matter of the Fairfax San Anselmo Children's Center. And we'd agreed to make some adjustments to the letter. And I just wanted to share publicly that uh, Council Member Goddard and I worked together on making some enhancements to the letter. We had gained further insights from a meeting with Ross Valley School District and the Children's Center. Um, so that, that letter has been sent. And if anyone wants to see it, it's a matter of public record. And we're happy to share that with you. You can write to our clerk. Um, on the subject of PG&E, we have been receiving ongoing um, inquiries and concerns related to the enhanced vegetation management program. Uh, town staff and myself have been uh, in discussions for several months now, uh, raising concerns about communication, the lack thereof. And um, we've been doing our best to get the word out into the community about what the scope of this program is. And PG&E has agreed to host a webinar and we'll send you um, information about that webinar. It's on the 13th at 1 p.m. We have the URL, it'll be in our newsletter. Um, in the meantime, 
Um, we have been putting the email and the phone number as far as where to share your um, comments or concerns with PG&E. Uh, Heather, do you have anything to add to that? No, Mayor. Okay. Does anyone else have any announcements? Mayor, if I might add just one thing. Yes. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to uh, note for the members of the public listening that on Sunday, August 7th from four to six, uh, the Fairfax Open Space Committee is gonna be doing a summer bio blitz uh, in the Elliott Nature Preserve. Um, the, you know, it's gonna be a great opportunity to get out in the nature preserve, but just a reminder, there's not a lot of parking back there. So please you know, ride your bikes or take some form of active transportation to get back to the nature preserve uh, uh, at 4 p.m. on the 7th. Thanks. Thank you. Those are very fun and meaningful events. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Anyone else? Okay, well, I'm really honored to make um, our next uh, introduction. We have a presentation by our California State Senator Mike McGuire. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. We're really honored and delighted to have you. Madam Mayor, it's wonderful to see you, Mr. Vice Mayor, uh, to the City Council and Madam Town Manager, thank you so much for allowing me to be here tonight. M Madam Mayor, if, if it's uh, all right with you, just give a quick update about what's happening and I would love this to be able to have a collaborative conversation with you and the Council about uh, concerns, um, whether it's issues of PG&E or issues of homelessness, uh, on budget or housing, I look forward to the conversation, Madam Mayor, and it is truly an honor to be with you. And I want to say thank you uh, for your work and for the council's work uh, in Fairfax. Um, if it's all right, I'd like to be able to quickly touch base on where we're at on the budget economy, get quickly into issues. Long story short, California has reclaimed the vast majority of jobs lost prior to COVID. Um, we're at about 97% of the job base today where we were prior to going into the pandemic. Some really interesting statistics is Marin continues to lead the way in uh, unemployment in California. Marin is one of the lowest unemployment rates in the state. It's hovering between 2.3 and 2.4%. The statewide average is about 4.3%. And as we know, if you're a small business owner uh, or run a small business, it's incredibly challenging to be able to find uh, employees to be able to keep the doors open. That's one of the biggest challenges that we hear from the small business community across California. We're in our 12th straight year of a surplus. Are we seeing a slowdown? Yes, we are. We are seeing that slowdown hit California. Is it gonna be a massive dip like what Europe or Asia may see? Most likely not according to the top economists that work for the state of California, but we do anticipate a slowdown nevertheless. Um, so let's talk about inflation. There's been a lot of discussion about gas prices, a lot of, uh, rightfully so, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, home costs, whether it's issues of going and buying clothes or buying groceries. Long story short, California is about to advance the largest middle-class tax cut in a generation. Uh, about $9.5 billion will be returned to California taxpayers here in the coming months. About 95% of all Californians will receive a debit card coming back to you of that $9.5 billion. I'm gonna quickly go through it. Bottom line is this, is that, uh, Anyone making 75,000 single, 150,000 family four will receive a $350 debit card coming back. If you do direct deposit for your state income tax, those dollars will automatically flow into your account and you will not receive a debit card. If you make about 125,000 single or 250,000 family four, you'll receive a $250 uh, debit card or direct deposit and up to two children will get an additional $250. And in, if you're making 250,000 single, 500,000 family four, it'll be a $200 uh, debit card or deposit coming back to you. So that's gonna be rolling out starting September, October, November, December, uh, and those debit cards and or direct deposits will start arriving in that four month time frame. Quickly on the issue of public schools, um, 
it's going to be the highest year for school funding in our history. In fact, it's a 16% permitted increase in K-12 public education funding uh, this year compared to last year. In addition to that 16% ongoing funding bump, schools will receive a $7.4 billion uh, block grant that will go for employee retention, attraction, and or paying down their STRS, PERS, their pension costs. That's absolutely vital um, to be able to continue to attract and retain the brightest in California's public schools. We also just passed about $250 million in our bill that will attract 12,500 new school counselors focusing on mental health in our school system. If you are getting uh, your marriage and family therapist license, if you are a counseling license, getting a counseling license or psychologist and you dedicate four years to a school district, we will erase 20,000 of your student debt up to 12,500 uh, residents in California who dedicate themselves to school counseling. In addition, there will be another 1.5 billion one-time funds to be able to purchase um, zero fuel electric buses and or hybrid buses for school districts, really trying to get those dirty burning buses off the road uh, and looking to uh, either electric and or hybrid in the more rural areas that are mountainous. Quickly on the issue of wildfire, about 2 billion will be moving this year for wildfire prevention. The vast majority of that's gonna go into wildfire prevention grants that Fairfax will absolutely be eligible for. We would be honored to work with you on that for uh, vegetation management, dead and dying tree removal, uh, management of emergency evacuation routes for brush and trees. I will tell you, this is a big year for Marin County Fire. We've been able to uh, go from $8 million budget for Marin County Fire to 13 million with new funds coming from the state. This is a new baseline for Marin County Fire. So we'll go again from 8 million last year to a new permanent $13 million annually coming from the state of California for Marin County Fire. So what the hell does that mean? That means we're gonna look at two additional new hand crews. Uh, dedicated to Marin County. There's about 14 women and men per hand crew. So we're gonna double the hand crews in perpetuity in Marin County based off this budget. So that's huge. I know that Marin County Fire has been doing work around Fairfax um, and that's gonna continue. And we're gonna be able to double the number of boots on the ground starting next fire season. Uh, the chief will start hiring up this year but I don't fully anticipate that we'll be fully staffed until next year. A couple other issues in regards to drought. If you are interested in drought funding, purple piping, for example, uh, if you need assistance in regards to drought tolerant landscaping, et cetera, there's another $3 billion in unspent drought relief funds for cities. We'd be honored to work with you on that. If this is something that you're interested, Madam Mayor and City Council, uh, we'd love to be able to work with you to be able to secure some of these funds. About 93 million has moved so far into Marin, Sonoma, Mendocino, and Humboldt counties. And there's another 3 billion over the next 24 months to be able to combat this worst drought that we're seeing in 12 centuries in California. We'd love to be able to talk more about that. I'm going really quick so we can have time for conversation. I'll just mention this, um, for transportation, about 20 million will be invested into Highway 37 on the Marin stretch. That's gonna be uh, redesigning and rebuilding the Novato Creek Bridge, uh, which is just past Highway 101 on your way uh, east going towards Sears Point, as well as raising uh, interim, raising some of the most vulnerable sections of Highway 37. $10 million has been secured to help that historic flooding in Marin City that has just happened year after year after year. And let's just be candid. It's unacceptable. It's been happening this long in Marin City. Uh, and that's why uh, we work so hard to be able to secure those funds. I want to talk quickly on the issue of PG&E undergrounding and all the frustration that I know exists in regards to the vegetation management program that they're been running. And then I'm going to stop talking um, quickly. So look, my firm belief is vegetation management is not a sustainable practice for pg and &E. I'm gonna be blunt with each and every one of you. Um, I have great respect for the women and men that keep our power on every day, truly. 
there doing the hard work that so many would never do. I have huge challenges uh, with their board and the upper management uh, who run the company. It's America's largest utility. It's a broken utility. Uh, and candidly, uh, we had the bill that would have broken them up. It didn't pass the legislature. And now we got to try to fix it since we couldn't get that legislation through the legislature. Just being all honest about that. So where I have felt really frustrated, the Senate district that we live in goes from <clears throat> the Golden Gate Bridge all the way up to the Oregon border. And you look at the devastating utility caused wildfires in Northern California, it has to stop. This is simply not sustainable. So we have legislation this year that would mandate that PG&E puts 10,000 miles of their most high fire threat utility lines underground. That's ultimately where we need to be able to go in Northern California. San Diego Gas and Electric has undergrounded about 60% of their most higher threat, high fire threat lines over the last 17 years. PG&E is way behind on their metrics. So this bill would get these 10,000 miles of the most high fire threat lines underground. Number two, it would appoint an independent monitor to make sure that the utility stays on budget stays on their scope as well as their timeline. And it also mandates that they have to use the billions of dollars from the feds first before they go to the rate payers. The rate payers should not foot the damn bill uh, and try to play catch up where PG&E should have been for decades now. The last thing I'll say on this issue is that we can't accept this as our new reality. In 2020, wildfires in this state caused the equivalent of 28 million vehicle, uh, the, the wildfire smoke was the equivalent of 28 million vehicles being on the road all year, the emissions from wildfires. This is not sustainable in this state, in our planet, and that is why we have to get these lines underground. The last thing I'll just say is this, uh, on reproductive health. I don't know about you, but I have been incredibly um, upset about what we're seeing at the federal level in the Supreme Court rolling back Roe v. Wade. And I want to be clear that the golden state is always going to stand strong for a woman's right to choose. And I'd like to be able to outline where California is going when it comes to reproductive health and abortion services. So first and foremost, we're putting a constitutional amendment onto the ballot this November. It's Proposition 1 that will enshrine in perpetuity a woman's right to contraception, reproductive health care, and abortion. It will enshrine that in the constitution, it will be constitutionally protected forever. Two, we've recently passed legislation that no longer shares the identity of a woman who comes into California to be able to receive an abortion or reproductive health care into the federal data system. So just like flu or COVID or any other uh, medical uh, procedure or uh, in our healthcare database, the feds keep track, right, on who's receiving reproductive health care or abortions, et cetera. The name will no longer be attached if that woman chooses to be able to receive an abortion in California. So she is not penalized when she goes back home to Mississippi or Georgia or Texas. We'll still upload the information. We're simply going to redact the name. The other really important part of where California is going is Medi-Cal now covers uh, health, reproductive health care and abortion services for all women, no matter their income. And we've also uh, invested about 200 million to be able to explain, expand reproductive health care across the state. We know about 1.1 million women will be entering the state from out of state over the next 30 months to seek reproductive health care. Uh, and we stand ready with expanded services uh, when we start seeing women take cars and buses and trains and planes into the state. Uh, Madam Mayor, I've gone on way too long. I apologize and I'll turn it over to you. And again, I just wanna say thank you for this honor to be with each and every one of you today. Absolutely, thank you very much. Um, do we wanna open public comment and well, then we'll circle back and have a final discussion. Michelle, will you open the public comment, please? Yes, if any members of the public would like to comment, 
on Senator McGuire's presentation. This is the time. Please raise yeah, your and hand. I should add that this evening, given our um, anticipated length of, the, of our meeting and our and our topics this evening, we're limiting public comment to two minutes. Okay, I see one hand raised, and that is Sandy Hancher. You are unmuted now. And you may have to unmute yourself. Senator McGuire, I've worked with you before. We met with you as Noah of Marin uh, about anti-hate crime legislation. And uh, I, my, I just wanted to compliment you because my impression of you is as the best public servant, you start everything with how can I help you? And your presentation tonight has been exactly like that. And I just really appreciate you. Thank you for all the work you do. Thank you, Sandy. The next speaker is PJ Pfeffer, and you are unmuted now. Hi, Senator McGuire, uh, PJ Pfeffer here. I, uh, I really appreciated the comments you had. I share your belief that vegetation management is not a sustainable option for pg e going forward. Um, and, you know, I, I would strongly uh, support any push to uh, underground all the lines as opposed to doing vegetation management. Uh, you mentioned that the bill to break up uh, pg and &E somewhat uh, failed to pass. Um, are there any efforts, you know, I uh, understand this isn't a Q&A, uh, are there any efforts to continue pushing that or similar legislation? And is there um, any discussion of, of what can be done by the public to support that measure? Uh, and finally, just wanted to um, uh, suggest uh, options for requiring PG&E not just to compensate owners for removing uh, uh, vegetation that they've cut back, but also uh, something that is unique to Fairfax uh, concern wise, replacing all the trees, because eventually we're going to need those built back once the lines are undergrounded. Um, you know, having tree cover is, is very important for our environment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to um, remind Madam Mayor, that uh, Senator McGuire has to uh, log off at seven o'clock. So um, that's oh, all. Oh, so we are really limited on time. Okay, so uh, let's end it after. It's okay, Madam Mayor, I, I just I texted Summer. We're good. We're good. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is Tony Gardner, and you're unmuted now. Hi, uh, my name is Tony Gardner, a Fairfax resident, and I just wanted to. Thank you for your efforts to end veteran homelessness in California and the funding that you've brought to the issue. And in particular, to thank you for funding for Homeward Bound of Marin's veteran housing project that's well underway. And um, with that project, we're going to be in a position to end veteran homelessness in Marin County. So thank you, Mike McGuire. You've helped out a lot. I'm so happy with what you've done on that. Thank you, Tony. That's all. Thank you. The next speaker is Larry Bragman, and you're unmuted now. Hi, Mike. This is Larry Bragman. Hey, Larry. Good to see you. Good to see um, you. Yeah, I really, really appreciate what you said on so many of these items. Um, would certainly like to talk to you about underground, undergrounding PG&E's lines in the uh, watershed here in Marin. We have a very, very vulnerable uh, wooey community in Mill Valley all the way up here to Fairfax in the Valley. So that would be a huge uh, risk reduction for Marin County if we could get that done. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is I read that the legislature was considering uh, using some of the surplus to buy some water rights in the Valley um, <clears throat> so that we could maybe start reforming um, how we are using water resources um, in a sustainable way. So uh, any comments or updates you have about that? And you know, the last thing is the increased funding for wildfire has been a huge benefit 
for uh, Marin Water, and I really appreciate it. So we've gotten some good grant support from through your office, and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Larry. Sure. Thank you. The next speaker is Mark Bell. And Mark, you're unmuted now. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, my comment goes back to PGE. What other avenues can citizens of this town or the town itself do to get PGE to stop illegally cutting down trees, trespassing? And, you know, we have flood situations. Uh, another issue that like the gentleman said before, he was talking about uh, shade from the trees. We also need the trees to hold the hillsides uh, together in the rains. So, I mean, I've talked to the CPUC on various issues, never a particularly pleasant thing. You have to go through them hanging up on you about 10 times before you get to somebody who will actually do something uh, so do you have any course of action that we can do to press forward on getting the utilities uh, grounded, uh, making PGE replace the trees with like? If you cut down a 300-year-old tree, they should be cutting back a 300-year-old tree. They do it in Japan. There's no reason we can't do it here, and they should pay for it. And this should all come out of... Uh, the totally bloated bureaucracy that they have. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Richard A. And you're unmuted now. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Senator, for your presentation. I uh, just have really one question. Um, excited to hear about all the increased budget for fire. And I hear the word prevention, and that's absolutely fantastic and necessary. I'm just wondering whether there's anything in those budgets that allow a small town like ours or several small towns together uh, locally around here to um, perhaps garner new equipment like uh, helicopters or airplanes or things that have fire retardant. So often what happens is these things spread so fast and you know, somebody notices something, the smoke's there, all the neighbors are, everybody's going crazy on all the texts and all the various channels. And I just wonder if we get a situation where something like escalates because we didn't have some dedicated um, equipment, for lack of a better, I don't know all the lingo, but um, that, that might have been able to just knock something out and keep it from going into a, a crazy spread. Is that part of, uh, is that appropriate or part of these budgets? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Madam Mayor, I don't see any more comments. Okay, yeah. I'll close the public comment. Thank you so much. Um, want to be respectful of your time, Mike, if you want to just, do you want to respond to some of that? And then I think a few of us might have a couple of follow-up questions, but we don't, we, we, we want to respect your time this evening. No, 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 you're, you're good. You're good. And I uh, want to take as much time as we need um, and have the conversation, but I also know you have an incredibly long agenda. And again, Madam Mayor, thank you. And thank you for all the comments and the questions and really grateful. And because of the Brown Act, as you know, we're not just staring at you, we're, uh, we just can't respond at that time. So uh, we apologize for that. So let's go to Richard first in regards to equipment. Um, so the majority of the state dollars are gonna go towards fire prevention grants. That said, the increase in base funding going from eight to 13 million for Marin County Fire, that's a game changer. Um, that's $5 million ongoing. So that could actually be used for enhanced equipment needs um, and personnel. If there are specific equipment needs that Fairfax, San Anselmo, you name it, has, we should start talking about that. So for example, we're bringing together all of the volunteer fire companies and fire districts in Northern Mendocino and Southern Humboldt to be able to pool resources, they're going to put dollars in. We're, the state's going to put dollars in to be able to do some one-time equipment purchases. Chippers, um, quick attack uh, trucks that can get up small roads, et cetera. So yes, those type of dollars though, Richard, will most likely come from like a member request. We would need to be able to put that in to secure from the general fund. So we'll be willing to work with you on that. On the issue of um, 
state resources, we are beefing up state aerial resources significantly. So the closest aerial resources to Marin uh, is at the Sonoma County Airport. So you you have multiple bombers, uh, uh, planes at the airport, Cal Fire planes. We just put a, a, a tower helicopter uh, in, which is a massive helicopter that has a large hose that just dips right into a pond or a river and can take out. It, it, it's one of the largest helicopters that we have in the state, uh, now based in Sonoma County. It could be in Fairfax in 15 minutes. So um, it, they move quickly. The closest Blackhawk, brand new Blackhawk that we have is at Boggs up in Lake County. That could be in Fairfax in about 20, 25 minutes. So there's a lot of resources around Marin County on that. I'm going to go to Mark. Um, hear you, Mark, in regards to stopping cutting down trees. I agree with you that we need to look at a program that would replace trees. This is something that the mayor has to also talked with us about along with Supervisor Rice, know that's really important. And I think that's really critical as we move forward. Mr. Bragman talked about undergrounding uh, and um, the sensitive watersheds. Mr. Bragman, I'd, I'd be happy to get together and talk more about that. Uh, my phone number is 916-651-4002. If uh, a council member or two would like to join that conversation, we obviously mayor will work with you on that be more than willing to be able to bring the council in on that. There is, uh, Mr. Bragman, there is money to potentially, we're still working through the final details. The second question that Mr. Bragman had is, what about the valley and buying out water rights? So right now, for example, a lot of agriculture has senior water rights. That's the most superior water rights in the state. There's a proposal to look at $1.5 billion to buy out senior water rights. Those water rights would then go towards uh, environmental uses um, and be able to provide replenishment for aquifers or wetlands, et cetera. That program is still uh, being worked and we have to wait for the final budget on the natural resource side to be adopted during the coming few weeks. I'm not trying to be coy, Larry. I'm just being honest. We're still working through that, but there is about a, million, a billion and a half on the table uh, for that. Um, I think I hit it, PJ, thank you so much uh, for, um, PJ asked about breaking up pg &E. Is there any additional legislation? There isn't at this moment. It's simply holding them, legislation that's holding them accountable. Um, and PJ also mentioned about replacing the trees. I agree with you on that. And Tony, thank you for uh, mentioning veterans homelessness. We will end veterans homelessness in Marin once we get the, um, uh, the village built uh, at Hamilton in Nevada and we'll break ground in 2023 on that for veterans homelessness. Madam Mayor, I'm gonna turn it over to you and the council. I'm, again, I apologize that I've gone on so long. Oh no, this has been really valuable, thank you. Okay, colleagues, let's keep it quick, but this is a really rare opportunity, so I know we wanna make the most of it. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for being with us, Senator. Um, Vice Mayor. Yeah, uh, sort of circling back onto your initial comments about how hard it might be for folks to find employees, but also uh, Tony's comments about veteran homelessness and things like that. Obviously, we're going through a housing element process right now, and folks want to make sure that um, we hold true to our, our uh, process and have as much affordable housing as possible and, and not only end you know, veteran homelessness, but just chronic homelessness writ large here in Marin County. Um, what can we look to in terms of resources, both for um, ensuring we can have uh, as much affordable housing, truly affordable housing for low income, very low income folks, working families, uh, as well as um, for uh, housing insecure folks that might currently be unsheltered or uh, living in a vehicle and in need of uh, some more permanent stationary shelter. 14 billion. There's 14 billion right now that the state has that the vast majority of that will go towards permanent supportive housing. Here's how it works. Uh, it's through uh, Project Home Key. Typically it's about 150, 170,000 a door that the, the state will kick in. Uh, it could go towards purchase of property. We then will guarantee you three years of funding of wraparound services per unit. So that's mental health and addiction. Uh, counseling on each unit. I'd love to be able to walk through that with you. I know we won't do it tonight. Um, 
uh, Marine has been incredibly successful uh, to be able to secure. So Nevada is secured, the county is secured, as you know, uh, San Rafael is secured, Corona Madera. Um, Corona Madera worked with the county on that. I know that was a bit contentious in regards to the, um, the end there. Long story short, we'd love to work with you, Vice Mayor and Mayor and Council on this. We will never have more money to help solve this homelessness crisis than right now. And if a budget is a value statement, then we got to move, right? It is a value statement and we have to move on this. So Mr. Vice Mayor, a lot of funding for small communities as well. And I think we'd love to work with you on that. Last thing I'll just say, there's another 6 billion available for affordable housing. So that's just straight affordable, very low, low and moderate. Um, and we can work with you on, on how that would work. Uh, to be able to apply. The last thing I'm just going to say, Mr. Vice Mayor, if you have a specific project, let's drive it together. If the council has a specific project that they want to see funded, let's work together on this. Um, that's how we found success um, on, on funding projects is identifying, then we bring in housing and community development uh, to be able to work with them to be able to get the funding uh, secured. Thank you so much, Senator. And I'd love to follow up. So please let me know, Mr. Vice Mayor, Mayor, how, we can, how we can assist. Any other questions for Senator? No, okay. Um, I would love to follow up to you on the, the drought funding, Senator. Yeah. And um, I heard you speak at an event recently, back to the constitutional amendment. Thank you for including that in your uh, presentation this evening. If, are there, um, I recall you um, included uh, before when I heard you speak, there are expanded protections for providers. Is that still the case or has that been? No, it's doctors and nurses. Is that still the case? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So um, long story short, it permanently uh, prohibits uh, the state from uh, revoking medical licenses of physicians or nurse practitioners who perform an abortion. So what we're seeing in a lot of other states, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Texas, is that they're going after uh, medical license uh, medical professionals uh, if they perform an abortion or even uh, some forms of reproductive health care. Uh, so a bill recently passed that would uh, stop the state. We would never do that anyway, but it would stop the state from revoking a medical license of a medical professional. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank you for your support with regard to uh, PG&E. Um, it's, it's, there's, there's a lot ahead of us. We're just, <laughs> we're just beginning uh, to feel the effects of enhanced vegetation management. And as I said earlier, we have a, this we uh, webinar that they're hosting uh, next week. So we'll, we'll keep you posted as, as things progress. And, and Madam Mayor, I, I got to thank you. You're the one that's been uh, leading this. So uh, you and Supervisor Rice and the council. So I just want to say thank you for including us and anything that we can do to, to assist, please let us know. And again, Madam Mayor, thank you for your leadership on this really critical issue. You have been outspoken. You've been bringing us in. And I just want to say how grateful we are. Thank you. And thank you again for being here. No, thank you so much. Madam Mayor, council, thank you. Good to see you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, I would like to make a motion that we move the library project presentation by Margaret Miles, um, who is with us this evening, uh, prior to number two, the presentation on homelessness. Could I get a second on that? Yeah, I'm happy to second that. I'm sorry okay. I didn't catch that earlier. That's okay. Um, I can take a roll call vote. Thank you, Michelle. Council Member Kohler? Yes. Councilmember Goddard? Yes. Councilmember Ackerman? Yes. Vice Mayor Cutrano? Yes. And Mayor Hellman? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Um, I can. Um, Let's see. I see Margaret. She yeah. is with us. Just appeared. To, uh, I think a strange thing happened is, um, Madam Mayor, you can see she's the top person just had a weird glitch on my screen. Let me try to. Let's see. Our... I see her square now. Okay. Uh, can you? Uh, 
There we go. Good evening, Margaret. Thank you. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation. If I'm allowed to share my screen. Indeed you are. Okay, great. Um, I'm the branch manager of the Fairfax Library. I've been there. Um, it'll be 11 years on uh, August 8th. So uh, let's see here. Can you see that? And yeah, I think you see that button on the top right where it says present. I think that might um, make it a full screen for you. Or unless um, you click from to, the beginning to. To the, to the right. There oh, there you go. There you go. There it goes. All right. So this project, the Fairfax Library Garden Project has been in the works for about four years. We started dreaming about this as a staff and um, I'm glad to say it's finally taken wing. It's um, in progress now. The drawing you see here was the conceptual plan that we had come up with around April of 2019. And you can see it included a labyrinth, it included raised beds and an orchard and a butterfly garden. And none of those things are included in the final plan. The two items that you can see in this drawing that are still part of the plan is the path and the story circle. Although the story circle has changed too. But the vision of our project has not changed. What we wanted to accomplish is going to happen. What we wanted to do with this project was expand the library space beyond our library's walls. And that has never become a more timely um, topic than after the last couple of years where we need to give everybody space and, and people are looking for outdoor spaces to gather um, and just to be. So this uh, library garden project is going to provide outdoor programming areas. It's going to provide a place for people to gather. It's going to provide free Wi-Fi outside the library. We have that now, but it's gonna expand that. We wanted any landscaping we did to be sustainable, to be drought tolerant. And we wanted to offer an opportunity for the community to become part of this project. So this is the plan pretty close. We've already had to make changes to this plan, but this is pretty close to the final plan. And I can walk you through this. Um, on the left, you, can you see my arrow as well? Yes. Okay, so this is the library over here and here's the front doors of the library. This is the main parking lot up here. And this is the lower, parking lot that's in front of the library. We've already received ADA funding and repaved this part of the parking lot and it'll be striped once the project is complete, once there actually is ADA access from this spot up to the library. Right now it's just a great big pile of dirt if you've been by recently. Uh, but once it's all finished, people who park here in the ADA parking spot will be able to travel this path, which is ADA accessible. And the reason it's so windy is because this whole area is a hillside and we had to make the path a grade um, under 5% so that a wheelchair could traverse it easily. On the path, um, anyone in a wheelchair, anybody walking this direction, will come upon our story circle, which is gonna be made out of uh, large boulders. There's going to be additional trees added and they'll arrive at the top of the grade to a patio made out of stone pavers. Another feature of this design is an arbor here, which is gonna have vines growing over it. And for people who want a shortcut who can take stairs, they'll be able to walk under the arbor and up a short flight of stairs. There is still ADA parking up at the top lot for people who wanna just go straight on into the library. 
we've got um, ADA parking up here also. The outdoor furniture that will be included in the project is going to reflect the woodsy character of our library. We've got a wooden picnic tables that'll be right outside the front doors. There'll be three of those. There'll be some benches as part of the garden. And on the patio, there will be several of these tables with chairs. And there will be umbrellas on each of these tables to provide shade. They're made out of perforated metal. So they'll be up year round and we're hoping they'll be uh, weather resistant. Each one of these furniture features will be ADA accessible as well. For the picnic tables, one of each of the benches will have a shortened, it'll be a shorter bench so that a wheelchair can roll right on up and become part of the conversation. Next to each of the benches, there will be a space for a wheelchair to sit. So they can sit right next to somebody who's on a bench. And with each of these tables, one of the chairs will actually be missing so that a wheelchair can roll right up and become part of the conversation at a table. The way the community becomes part of this project has been one of the most exciting parts of this project. We are going to have uh, the patio um, is made out of stone pavers and the community has had the opportunity to donate a paver. This is all, this whole part of the project has been run through Fairfax Friends of the Library. So they've been accepting the donations and people have an opportunity to choose a six by 12 paver or a 12 by 12 paver. And if anybody's interested, they should get their orders in really quick because we have, as of I think yesterday, delivered the pavers to the engraver and he's going to start engraving. And once he's done, they're going to go into the patio and we are not gonna be able to offer on-site engraving. So this is a one time only deal. Um, but I, I think it's just gonna be beautiful. We have, we have received donations for almost 300 pavers and it's just gonna be a, a picture of the community once it's done. There's people who've put in quotes and people who've put their dogs' names and their children's names. This project um, protects the trees that we have on the property. We have a number of heritage oaks on the property and there's a large fir, uh, pine tree that's been there since Bon Gusto Villa was the restaurant on the property. In addition, we're adding over a dozen other trees that are going to provide shade and roots uh, on the property. These are some of the trees that'll be included. And the landscaping, a lot of it is native plants and grasses. Uh, the pink Muhlenbergia grass is gonna be a big feature. There's gonna be sort of a waving ocean of these pink grasses. You can also see in the upper uh, right-hand corner here, we're incorporating a rain garden as part of the project. And that's going to channel water from the roof into this area of the garden project. And then any overflow water will go into a swale that runs alongside the property that's protecting our neighbors. Um, there's a berm and then a swale on our side. And so any overflow water will go to the creek. I know we don't have a lot of rainfall right now, but when we do get rain, we get an awful lot all at once. And so this part of the project will absorb more of the rainfall and keep it there to make the whole garden more drought tolerant and it'll prevent runoff from just running across the property. The story circle, uh, because we are protecting the roots of our pine tree, which turned out to be a little more shallow than we originally thought, the story circle is now going to be a story crescent, but uh, this is, you get a general idea of what that's going to look like. And this will be an area for classes to gather and hear about the garden project and hear stories. It's an area where adults can gather and talk about books. We've had a chair yoga class in the past and they could meet out here, uh, but it provides an opportunity for, for groups to meet formally or informally. 
we broke ground on this project. Well, we had our groundbreaking ceremony on June 27th and work started the very next week. Our estimated completion is October of this year. And you can see in the right hand uh, photo, that's the area that's cleared for the patio. It's all flattened out and graded and they're ready for that. I think right now they're putting in irrigation I wanted to share just a little bit about future innovations that are also coming. Because we've dug up this whole giant area, our project manager was able to secure funding for infrastructure for the wiring and the Christie boxes for EV chargers. That is a future project for the library. We want eventually to have two EV chargers, charging stations for electric cars. Um, and that lower front parking lot. And we don't have the funding yet, but we're hoping we can secure it fairly soon and get a couple of chargers in. We're also applying for a grant and I'm working with um, Jody Timms from, she was with Age Friendly Fairfax. She's on the Climate Action Committee. I've just reached out to her about this. We're applying for a resilient libraries grant that if we get it, we hope to put solar panels on the roof and have backup power. As you know, we've had multiple power outages lately and it would be great to have a place where people can come in the community and charge their devices, um, get Wi-Fi and uh, have light and air conditioning if it's summer. So we've just been planting seeds like crazy of all these great ideas and we're just coming up rainbows all over. <laughs> the rainbow over our building, you can see uh, the rainbow of our staff. That picture was taken for Pride Week uh, a month ago, a year ago. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Margaret. It's so exciting. Um, I'm going to open public comment, and then we'll take it back to the council for questions. Okay, if anyone has a comment on, on Margaret Miles' presentation, this is the time to raise your hand and you have two minutes to speak. Okay, I see Mallory, you're unmuted now. Oh, am I still unmuted? I just yes. pressed. Okay, I just have a question because this will go right into, I'm, uh, it's a beautiful project. I'm, I'm really glad we're doing this. And um, going, this is going to go right right into the next part but what how are we going to deal with um if this becomes another homeless situation where people are going to hang out all all day and do everything that they do in other situations that um is there any is there any pr provision for people who um might just make this a place where they want to live well that's a good question um this area, you know, when the libraries open, our bathrooms are open and people are welcome to come into our library and stay all day the way it is now. And people can stay outside at the picnic table that's outside now. So people will be welcome to spend extensive periods of time outside. I think if people start camping, we would mm -hmm. look into the legality of whether that's Permitted. I don't think camping is permitted within the town of Fairfax. Maybe somebody on the council can answer that. I think, Margaret, you've answered sufficiently. And actually, during public comment is really supposed to be one way. So it's, oh, oh, it's challenging sorry. when you hear a question and you want to be helpful. But I think you're I'm good. a librarian. I answer questions. Yeah, but I know. Yes. I okay. know. Understood. Understood. Yeah. Thanks, Mallory. You're welcome. Thank you. Next speaker is Richard A. And you're unmuted now. Thank you. Um, fabulous project. Really great. G glad to see all the plans. I'm just, uh, you can answer my question whenever is appropriate, but I'm just curious whether some of those things in that original design with the labyrinth and all the other uh, gardens, and is that is that going to come eventually or is it been, is it just never going to happen or is it is it just about money or um, is it like we can start now and add more later? I'm, I'm just curious because all of that looked really fantastic. Okay, <laughs> I guess you have to go to the library to get the answer. Um, 
The next speaker is Jody Timms, and you're unmuted now, Jody. Good evening, Margaret and council members. Um, I just wanted to say hello, Margaret. I was going to mention a few things during my public comment coming up later for under general comment. So you've saved me some time and I just wanted to thank you. We met um, for council members, so you know as well in the community, Margaret and I met in at least 2019, if not before, to have a conversation about EV chargers and um, you know, beginning to to bring the uh, library up to speed um, on some of the climate action initiatives we wanted. So I'm just really grateful for your persistence and you're not forgetting and getting that in while the <laughs> while the ground was torn up. And I'm really excited about the Resiliency Hub application, the grant, and I hope that comes together and that I can stay involved. I'm still very much part of Age Friendly Fairfax, but also the Climate Action Committee. So um, looking forward to continued. Uh, future innovations, as you said. Thank you. I don't see any more public comments. Do you want to close? Thank you. I'll close co public comment. Go ahead, Council Member Kohler. Uh, um, Margaret, thank you so much. And I can't wait till October where we get to see all this. Um, just one thing I noticed uh, I'm part of Age Friendly Fairfax, too. And I noticed in your presentation, the picture of the benches, just not the picnic benches, but the regular benches did not have arms. And one of the things that we do for the benches that we put out in town is we make sure they have arms on them. It's very helpful for older adults who have some mobility problems to be able to get off that bench, including myself. So maybe that just wasn't in the picture, but um, right. just something to think about and hopefully add. Thank you. They are, they actually all have arms. Excellent. Because the photo on their website doesn't have arms. Excellent. Thank you so much. Great work. And thanks to the friends of the library. Vice Mayor Catrano. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Margaret, just please extend our congratulations to your whole team. I mean, this project is marvelous. And uh, when you, you said that the first slide, uh, the original schematic of it had changed and some of that stuff wasn't there. Uh, I didn't realize that the next slide was going to be like, it's still absolutely incredible and beautiful. And it's going to be so amazing for, for residents in the Ross Valley and in Fairfax. And I just um, wanted to extend my assistance. I'm uh, the rep to the Transportation Authority of Marin, and I would love to to help uh, however I can with getting those EV chargers in there uh, when you folks are ready, whether that's funding or, or whatever is needed there. So I just, congratulations again. This is going to be a total model of how the landscape could look uh, all throughout the, the Ross Valley and here in Fairfax. So thank you so much. Um, Council Member Goddard. Um, yes, Margaret, thank you. Um, I echo and magnify all of my colleagues' comments, but I also wanted to just call out and um, express my gratitude for your perseverance. And you talked about seeds and you talked about the gardens and you really painted this beautiful picture. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, you know, acknowledge that you really were the seed planter and that you adopted the Sustainable Fairfax Seed Library and really gave it a home and a prominent home right in the front. Um, so seeds have been germinated and planted and blossomed all over Fairfax because of what you took on and how you embraced that vision. So I'm so thrilled to see how it's grown into something that um, that I just can't wait to um, to enjoy. And uh, And thank you so much. Thank you, Renee. That means a lot. Aww. Yeah, you, we can really see your passion and your love for the project is, comes comes through. Um, did you want to answer? I have a, a, another comment, but did you? What is is there an intention for this to be multi phase with the possibility for funding downstream for some of those other um, concepts in this? Well, in the, some of the some of the concepts um, we determined would be really high maintenance over time. We mm -hmm. needed to create a, a space that we'd be able to maintain. And mm -hmm. so some of the dreaming, we said, well, that's a great idea, but who's gonna keep it going mm -hmm. over time? Um, 
So I'm not sure, but we yeah. have a lot of property on our, uh, we have tons of property where the library is. We've been doing an outdoor story time since we came back mm -hmm. um, open to the public. We, we do an outdoor story time behind the library. Right. And that story crescent isn't actually going to hold the story time population that we usually have. We get upwards of 60 people some weeks. Um, babies and toddlers and three-year-olds and mommies and strollers and they all meet under the heritage oaks behind the library so we've talked about wow what could we do back here I hope mm -hmm. it wouldn't take another four or five years to accomplish something but first we're just going to finish this project and then see yeah see what happens great well I just um a couple of years ago, Margaret, I was in a program that required a, a lot of study and I was, used to spend about three hours a day in the library and I just want to compliment you and the, it is such a warm and welcoming place and as you said, everyone, I, I believe, feels safe and welcome and um, that's a testament to you and the staff and um, just really well done and thank you for being here. Thank you. I will pass on your words to my staff too. They are all fantastic. And I want to do a special call out to Cindy Swift, who's the um, leader of our Friends of the Library. Susan Brandborg is our president. Cindy has done so much with this whole uh, PAVER project. It's been tons of work, and she's just made it all happen. It's been great. Great. Thank you for mentioning that. Anything else? OK, well, thank you again. Have a nice evening. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, moving right along, we have a presentation on homelessness this evening um, from the County Health and Human Services Department. We have Ashley Hart McIntyre joining us this evening. Um, and I believe, is there someone from Marin County wide stormwater pollution and prevention with us as well? Yes, Madam Mayor. Um, Howard Bunce is here with us as well. And if you don't mind, I'll just start out with a few slides. Yes, thank you. Great. And oh my. <laughs> I'm having trouble with the same thing. Put a slideshow on the top and then it should work. There. From beginning. From beginning. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm Heather Abrams, I'm your town manager. I just wanted to introduce our partners here today um, and acknowledge that um, uh, the town of Fairfax has been working uh, for many years with the County of Marin and other local jurisdictions um, to provide services for um, homeless population and address this issue. And we have tonight with us um, Ashley Hart McIntyre, who will um, talk about county services that are provided right here in Fairfax. Um, we also have Howard Bunce, um, who is from the Marin County Stormwater um, Police prevention program to talk about the creek and um, and the issues that have been raised there and then I just also wanted to um, make sure and acknowledge our two um, council people vice mayor Catrano and um, council member Goddard who've been uh, working on the council subcommittee um, regarding homelessness issues uh, for years and we do have um, specific services here, including a 24 hour, um, seven day a week bathroom availability at town hall, which is quite close to um, where people are living now. And then a weekly shower program that um, the, um, the town actually contributes funds to as well. And then I just wanna um, also remind everyone that um, we do our best to really communicate about um, this and, and the, a lot of other Fairfax issues and some of these points, I don't, um, I'm not gonna read through them, but these were all in our newsletter. And we also have a um, website page about um, homelessness in Fairfax. So just wanna point out those resources to folks who are concerned and then turn it over to 
Ashley, who will turn it over to Howard and then turn it over to um, Vice Mayor Catrano and um, Council Member Goddard. So with that, I'm gonna um, stop sharing and turn it over to Ashley. Thank you so much. Um... Uh, city manager and uh, council really appreciate the opportunity to come speak with you tonight. I do have a presentation, a slideshow to go through. Uh, we did come and speak with you in November and we gave you a lot of background information back then. So I don't want to go over too much of the same ground, but uh, I think a little bit of a common baseline of what we're doing and why we're doing it might be helpful. Uh, so I'll sort of zoom through those slides and happy to answer um, any questions you might have. Let me share my screen. All right, can you all see that? Not yet, but it's loading, I think. Okay, yeah, my computer appears to be a little bit angry at me. Hmm. hmm. I see a message that says we're viewing your screen, but it's black. Not showing anything. Okay. I wonder, Heather, um, I sent you the presentation. Would you be willing to share your screen with the presentation? And I'll ask you to click through to the next slide. Yeah, Michelle, can you pull that up? I can do that. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. One Apologies. Here we go. And then Ashley, maybe you should select stop share. I'm trying. Okay. <laughs> A Zoom appears very angry. Um, we've never had this problem before. Um, I will probably uh, leave and come right back. Um, it looks like I'm going to have to close Zoom. Oh, no wait, maybe not. Maybe not. There. You stopped oh, screen sharing. So excellent. If you'd like me okay. To share. I can do that. Thank you very much. Okay. The um, angry computer problem appears to have stopped. Um, hello. But I just lost your, <laughs> very strange. Okay. Um, I had your, your uh, presentation all queued up and it has disappeared. Uh, it's haunted. On. One second, I'm really fast. I will go back. Get it. Um, here we go. Okay. Ashley, just one thing to note. I think mm -hmm. you mentioned you spoke to folks in town a month or so ago, but that wasn't the public and it wasn't all of us. So I don't want you to repeat everything, but um, this is the first time the general public is hearing from you, I believe other than your time at the farmer's market. Thank you. I think I think there was a presentation last fall that, or maybe it was earlier this year, that, yeah. Yeah. All right, we'll go ahead and start. Um, so, okay. Uh, so um, the, I think the most uh, important thing to know is that uh, though folks think that homelessness is an unsolvable problem, it really isn't. Homelessness as it exists today has really only been around since the 1980s. Um, and we know exactly uh, what to do to address it. Next slide. Okay, uh, there are communities across the country that have ended chronic and veteran homelessness. Go ahead and hit next. Uh, Connecticut has ended chronic homelessness uh, and veteran homelessness. Next, hit next. There are three states and 83 communities that have actually ended veteran homelessness, and we're so close. I'll get to that in just a minute. Um, really hoping to be able to end veteran homelessness in the next uh, couple of years. Um, and these uh, stars indicate uh, communities that have ended. The blue ones are veteran homelessness. The red are chronic homelessness. Next slide. So homelessness is here in Marin. Who's homeless here? Uh, next slide. We do have some local data. Um, we are anticipating the release of our full 2022 point in time count in the next 
few weeks, fingers crossed, we had a little bit of a delay in the HUD review of our numbers. Um, so that's an, a census that we do every two years of everybody who's experiencing homelessness uh, in our community, both sheltered and unsheltered. Um, and usually it's, it's odd years. We went from 2019 to 2022 due to this pandemic. We saw um, a slight increase in total people experiencing homelessness, about an 8%, a little more than 8% increase. Um, overall, which is um, sort of middling um, in terms of uh, Bay Area increases. A lot of Bay Area communities saw very significant double digit increases. Next slide. And chronic homelessness, uh, which is um, uh, folks who have, who have a disability and uh, long histories of homelessness, a year or more of homelessness. Um, uh, that and we'll talk a little bit more about chronic homelessness in just a moment. Uh, we had a major decrease in chronic homelessness between 2017 and 2019. We dropped 28%. We did see it creep back up a little bit, um, which you can see here in that uh, little blue part of our caterpillar here, um, the light blue part. But it's a small increase, um, it's up a little bit from 2019, but we're still about 20% down from um, our baseline at 2017. Next slide. Um, we are also tracking, of course, family homelessness and veteran homelessness. We have about um, 75 roughly homeless families known to us remaining in Marin, but we have 116. Um, we also work with the County Office of Education that has a different number for definitional reasons, which I won't go into now. Next slide. A veteran homelessness, um, we are, we're about 31 people away from ending veteran homelessness in Marin. We're so close. Uh, we have housed uh, 74, permanently housed 74 homeless vets. Next slide. But we're gonna talk a little bit uh, more about chronic homelessness and why we're focused here and what we're doing and what success we've had and how that impacts uh, Fairfax and uh, its relationship to encampments. So we focus on chronic homelessness because most people who experience homelessness will self-resolve in the first couple of weeks. And folks who are chronically homeless have a life expectancy about 25 years less than that of their housed peers. These folks are super vulnerable. By definition, if you're chronically homeless, you have a disability uh, that prevents you from maintaining uh, housing. It's also cost-effective. Folks who are experiencing chronic homelessness, next slide. As you can see here at the bottom, you use a lot more services than people who are not chronically homeless, homeless but not chronically so. Uh, they also uh, have a wide variety of conditions that would count as disabling, um, which you can see here at the top, everywhere from um, psychiatric or emotional conditions to traumatic brain injuries and chronic health problems. Next slide. Uh okay, uh, one more. All right. <laughs> um, I think you're talking faster than the slides. Oh, so, okay. Sorry. Um, you went because your slides kind of scroll through. Yes, um, I am. And I, so I'm not using the scrolling on my side. A little bit. Thanks. Sure. Sure. So, okay. So you can see here um, the uh, psychiatric and emotional conditions all the way through you know, chronic health problems. It's a whole range of different. Uh, disabilities. Um, the dark blue lines are folks who are experiencing chronic homelessness. The light blue lines are respondents who are homeless but not chronically homeless. The same color coding goes for below. You can see that folks who are experiencing chronic homelessness use far more resources um, than folks who are uh, shorter term homeless. Next slide. I'm trying. It's not going anywhere. <laughs> oh, there. I'm telling you, it's, it's haunted. <laughs> okay, uh, go ahead. Uh, so um, uh, we'll we'll sort of skim through this. You can you can hit the next button a couple of times. It's mostly white folks um, who are homeless, uh, who are chronically homeless, but there's disproportionate numbers of people of color. Um, so there's a higher representation of folks of color in the chronically homeless population than in our general population. Uh, they're mostly male. A little bit youth, mostly sort of between 25 and 55 or so. Um, and this is a big one. 73% of, of them have been, were living in Marin when they became homeless. We'll talk a little more about that in a moment. Uh, and that's true um, right here, actually. <laughs> that's true across uh, 
across communities, all different kinds of places, uh, everywhere I've ever worked. Um, lots of people are concerned that people experiencing homelessness in their community have um, come there from somewhere else. And that is um, uh, very much not true, but 65 to 80% of folks experiencing homelessness um, lost their, their housing in the community in which they are currently homeless. That's particularly true among folks who are chronically homeless, um, folks with disabilities. Um, typically we find that uh, when people are experiencing a housing crisis, they don't want to venture into a new place. Folks are more likely to stick close to home in places where they're comfortable, where they have, may have some support networks. Next slide. We also hear a lot about um, people don't want housing as a lifestyle choice or they're not interested in housing. And so we wanna talk a little bit about that. Uh, go ahead. Um, people, uh, we have found that um, with, you know, there's always an exception that proves the rule, but um, with very few exceptions, folks who are experiencing chronic homelessness want housing. What they may not want is what we have to offer them. Um, and uh, we also, we have, we call this the cycle of chronic homelessness here. So folks who um, are difficult to serve for, you know, a variety of reasons, trauma related, um, mental health related, whatever it might be, um, go into programs that might be a little bit too high barrier for them. Um, maybe they're in a communal setting in a shelter or, um, or in an apartment complex with lots of other folks. They fail out of that program because they can't meet the expectations. Uh, because of that failure, they don't trust the system anymore, and then they're not willing to seek help, and then their condition deteriorates, and it gets harder and harder and harder to serve them. So folks get stuck in this cycle, um, and uh, when, they're say, when they're asked, would you like to go to shelter, or were you interested in housing, the answer is no, not because they're not interested in housing, but because they're not interested in perpetuating the cycle, which they see as inevitable. Uh, but we have a way around that. A lot of folks are concerned that um, you can't just put someone in a house and expect them to succeed. That's partly true. We don't just house folks. We provide them lots and lots of services, but we don't require that people clear particular hurdles before we place them in housing. And that is called housing first. The traditional model required that uh, folks who are experiencing homelessness would have to go through a series of programs, shelter, transitional housing, and then finally be deemed ready for permanent housing. They'd have to meet certain goals like achieving sobriety or employment or whatever it might be. Um, as you might imagine, it's really hard to do those things when you don't have stable permanent housing, um, particularly when you're unsheltered, but also still in shelter and transitional housing. What Housing First says, you can go to the next slide. We take folks who are homeless and put them straight in permanent housing and then work with them to identify what their goals are um, and provide them the support they need to get there. It's been extremely successful. Uh, just one second, go back one second. Uh, super successful, we see um, significant decreases in substance use, um, including you know, in the city of Toronto, they reported about a 49% decrease in alcohol use among folks who are housed this way, 74% um, uh, decrease in drug use. Um, we've, we see a lot of improvement in people's conditions, uh, even when it's not required as part of program participation. And we see really, really good um, housing retention with this model. Okay, next slide. And it's not applicable just to permanent supportive housing, which is the primary intervention we use for folks who are chronically homeless. Permanent supportive housing uh, is, you know, permanent housing, a, a voucher or a placement in a, in a unit um, that people it's not time limited and then with intensive services but that's a particular program model we can use the housing first philosophy across program models so everything we do from shelter through even outreach um, rapid rehousing all of our different program models are really focused on housing um, what how do we get you into housing what's your housing goal and what do you need to stabilize when you're there uh, go ahead next slide um, COVID interrupted our success a little bit, as you might imagine. Um, next slide. I think the biggest thing um, that is definitely relevant for you all is the increase in visibility of homelessness. Uh, there, has been, there have been changes in federal law that limit the uh, authority of jurisdictions to clear encampments, um, which makes things a lot more visible when you can't ask people to move along um, or risk being cited. Uh, then they're more likely to stay in place. It's just more comfortable um, and people feel a little safer doing that. 
Uh, folks definitely over the last few years have learned a lot more about their rights under the changes in federal law. Um, and so our uh, folks who might have been more inclined to hide um, from public view uh, previously are um, now less inclined, because they were afraid of getting in trouble, are now less inclined to do so. Uh, we do have um, a really good handle on exactly who is in all of our encampments across Marin. For our largest encampments, we meet weekly uh, to case conference, which means we've got uh, service providers and um, uh, other partners uh, actually talking through people person by person by person, identifying what the barriers are to getting them housed. We have found that uh, the encampment activity in Marin, though it's super visible, does not um, equal an increase in homelessness. Um, we did see, we saw an increase, a small increase in homelessness, about 8%. Um, I think visibility is up a lot more than 8%. Uh, and more than 90% of the people who are living in the encampments have been chronically homeless in Marin for a very, very, very long time. Typically people who um, uh, are newly homeless are less um, comfortable in an encampment setting. So those folks might be more likely to um, live in our cars, for example, which is less visible. Uh, we did see a few changes in services. Uh, we had to reduce the number of beds in our congregate shelters because of COVID social distancing um, protocols and some of our community spaces, uh, like the Vinnie's Dining Hall, the Ritter Campus, the libraries, those closed for congregating. Those are all spaces where folks who are experiencing homelessness typically would go uh, during the day to socialize, to meet with case managers, whatever it might be. Um, and for a long time, those were not available to them uh, and people congregated in encampment settings um, for social supports instead. Um, those spaces have recently reopened, um, some more recently than others, uh, but people are still concerned about gathering indoors and the Vinnie's Dining Hall particularly is not the same sort of community space uh, any longer. Okay, next slide. And I promise we're coming down the home stretch. Um, so what are we actually doing? Uh, a lot, including next slide. Um, Okay, go ahead and hit next. There we go, countywide outreach. We are in uh, Fairfax with our outreach teams at least three to four times monthly. Um, we're working on increasing the amount of outreach on the streets, uh, which will um, therefore increase our ability to be in Fairfax uh, with our outreach teams. We coordinate with law enforcement, including Fairfax PD, at least biweekly, if not more often than that. Um, we have some strict data sharing protocols, so we don't share, um, we can't share information uh, with law enforcement officers, but they can share with us and they have a lot of really great information. They've been really valuable partners because they're the ones out there on the ground actually talking to people day in and day out more often than we can get out there without reach. Go ahead and hit next arrow. I am hitting it. Mm. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> There. there we go. Uh, we have emergency shelter beds. Um, we, we do focus on getting people into permanent housing, but we recognize that emergency shelter is an essential part of a functional system of care. We have a variety of uh, emergency shelter beds targeting different populations. Next. Go ahead and hit next. We have... Um, we have nearly doubled our supply. I'm gonna talk while we wait for it to load. Yeah, I'm sorry, um, I'm trying. <laughs> no, I don't know, this PowerPoint presentation, I've never seen this before. It's angry. Um, there we go. Uh, we've nearly doubled um, our supply of permanent supportive housing in the last uh, six-ish years. Um, and we are expecting to add an additional 119 within the next year. Um, it actually may be more than that. Um, but those are the, the new um, project based in a particular facility beds that we're expecting to add. We have a coordinated entry system that helps us assess people for vulnerabilities and pair the most vulnerable folks with housing uh, first. Um, and we are the most coordinated system of care I've ever seen. Um, we like we do all of that case conferencing, but um, that's that's only sort of scraping the, the top. Um, we, are, we have a robust uh, data sharing agreement so we can really coordinate client care and reduce duplication. Okay, next slide. Go, go ahead. Um, we have placed uh, 
504 people in permanent supportive housing since we started our coordinated entry program in 20, October 2017. 95% of those folks are still housed, um, which is uh, actually an extraordinary success. Uh, federal funding um, considers 85% uh, housing retention to be top notch, um, and we're way above that. And um, we can really um, uh, put a lot of the credit to that for our. Um, our coordination of services uh, and our commitment to housing first. And we saw that big decrease in chronic homelessness for 2019. Go ahead. Uh, and then finally, a lot of folks are asked, um, we, we know people care deeply about the, um, the fate of folks who are homeless and really wanna know how they can help. Um, go ahead. So we have, um, uh, you can just click through a bunch of these things here. Uh, we have um, a page on our website about how to help if you're interested. I'm happy to share that with anybody. A uh, list of our partner organizations. Um, there's lots of ways to participate that don't uh, necessarily involve giving money, including getting involved, um, learning about local housing projects, uh, and um, uh, sharing that information with your neighbors. That's a great way to be involved. Um, volunteering. If you have special skills working as a volunteer training people in those skills. Uh, if you have a small business, hiring folks um, who have uh, experience of homelessness, we have some great nonprofits we can connect you to who can help you find uh, good fits for you. And if you're a landlord, uh, working with our housing authority to um, house folks experiencing homelessness with a voucher, we have special supports in place for those, those landlords. We'd love to work with you. That's it. Thank you. Are we, I, I don't wanna, I, I know I have questions and we have to do public comment, but I wasn't sure. Um, Howard, are you gonna present as well? Or are you here on hand for? Uh, I, I also have a presentation. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to stop in between each one or. Um, probably makes sense to just do them all mm -hmm. and then we can open public comment and then we can have a discussion as a council. All right. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> that means I get to figure out um, how, to, <laughs> <laughs> how to share this. Uh, let's see. If you go to slideshow, you see that at the top. Okay. Did yeah. that work? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So, good evening. My name is Howard Bunce. I'm an engineering assistant with the Marin Countywide Stormwater Pollution Prevention Program, or MixDOP for short. I've been a part of the Big Stop team for the last 15 years and work closely with all our member agencies. Big Stop's goals are to prevent stormwater pollution, protect and enhance water quality in creeks and wetlands, preserve beneficial uses of local waterways, and help Marin's 11 cities and towns and the county comply with state and federal stormwater regulations. Our countywide mixed op staff implement permit compliance tasks and track stormwater regulations on behalf of the member agencies that otherwise wouldn't have dedicated and specialized stormwater staff to do them. As part of this, we provide technical expertise to member agencies and the public, which includes developing and implementing a wide variety of water quality monitoring programs and partnering in creek restoration projects. So let me see. Um, it's almost without exception that the water quality in urban creeks deteriorates the further down through the watersheds it runs. Uh, that's because creeks in urban areas face pressures from every direction. Um, development of impervious surfaces in the watershed speeds runoff and concentrates pollutants. The more roofs, streets, driveways, and sidewalks we add, the faster runoff the, hits the creeks and at the same time, causing higher peak flows, channel incising, bank erosion, and downstream flooding. Uh, to try and 
counter these undesired effects, we moved on to confinement of the creeks by putting in walls, concrete channels, culverts, and road crossings, all of which restrict or completely remove the natural processes of slowing the flow even more. Uh, along with this, the increased flow um, is washing off all the pollutants from everyday human activities right into our creeks and bays. That's why if you do water quality monitoring, you'll find that pollutants such as bacteria, pesticides, nutrients, sediments, and trash uh, are the ones primarily present in most urban streams, regardless really of, of presence of, of unhoused uh, individuals. Now, a lot of people won't <clears throat> think of sediment as being a big pollutant issue since, you know, it's just dirt, but sediment is one of the biggest pollutant issues in Marin, and that's for two reasons. One, excess fine sediment washed into our creeks can suffocate aquatic life and also covers up um, essential bedding gravels for spawning salmon and steelhead. But also uh, the more relevant for, <laughs> relevant for this discussion is many of these types of pollutants are, um, that are often found in urban creeks like bacteria, metals, nutrients, and pesticides bind rather well to sediment particles and then get trapped in the creek bed. Um, sadly, while doing monitoring in several of our watersheds, we still find pesticides that were banned 20 to 30 years ago and sometimes more. Um, the reason for that is not that people are still using them or legally dumping them. It's that they're trapped in the bedded sediment and occasionally just get stirred up again. So the main purpose for doing purposes for doing um, water quality monitoring are to characterize the the health of the stream and the watershed. Um, really, that's how is the creek doing and isn't getting better or worse over time. This is a long-term monitoring, typically spanning years, if not decades. And then there's attempting to identify unknown pollutants and point sources. Uh, the creek suddenly isn't doing well or there's a fish kill and we don't know why. Uh, a point source, maybe something like a discharge pipe from a factory, a sewage treatment plant overflow, or often uh, that we find in Marin, someone rinsing out paintbrushes and extra paint and rollers uh, into the storm drain in their yard, uh, which runs right down the hill and into the creek and turns it all white. Uh, many sources are unidentifiable or what we call non-point sources because they enter the creek from literally everywhere. Uh, these would be things like fertilizers, pesticides, oil and grease from cars, sediment, metals, trash, and of course, pathogens. So regardless of the purpose, uh, the main goal of monitoring is really to inform management actions um, so that we, know these behaviors, pollutants, or sources are the problem, you know, what actions can we implement to reduce them? As a practice, monitoring must be designed to answer a specific question. Is the watershed health getting better or worse? Or is the factory discharging the pollutant that we found? Um, it must be implemented by standardized and repeatable methods. It requires strict protocols and procedures to avoid contamination and false positives. Uh, so work done by field teams with knowledge and experience, uh, working with a certified lab to provide the results. And lastly, it must be managed to provide actual useful data to inform uh, management actions. So what this all comes down to is what is the unknown that we would be looking for with monitoring and what could be done to resolve the problem? And this really is my main point for tonight is if you already understand the solutions to the problem and you already know that the pollutant is there, monitoring data won't help the creek. 
Um, what we would strongly recommend is to act now to implement uh, effective management actions. So if the you know town actually wanted to you know move forward with uh, any kind of creek monitoring uh, because a uh, pollutant um, you know wasn't identified and they were looking for something in this case um, we know that the pathogens are in the creek they're they're in every creek um, <laughs> when doing water quality monitoring especially for for uh, pathogens, um, we have an expression that everything poops. So um, <laughs> you, you have sources coming from from literally all over, and there is no urban creek that doesn't have pathogens in it. Um, but it, to move forward with a, a monitoring program, um, that the cheapest and easiest way to do testing after developing a monitoring plan and protocols would be to use the you know the indicator bacteria method uh, it's not testing for pathogens instead it measures proxy species associated with sources um, so we're looking at fecal coliform bacteria like e coli and uh, enterococcus um, while this is way cheaper it's not source specific um, all the tests will tell you is that they're present and they will be and the total count for any and all sources. Um, option two is using bacteroids or other microbial source tracking methods, which can identify likely source species, you know, human, cow, dog, bird, horse, et cetera. Um, it's very specific in which it will most of the time give you sources, uh, but also very expensive. Uh, each species marker costs uh, approximately $500 plus, and it doesn't do a lot of good to only test for one marker because it won't identify all of your sources. Add to the difficulty that all of this testing is highly variable, both spatially and temporally. Um, it requires regular testing. You need a minimum of five consecutive weeks to even begin to calculate a geometric mean, and that's for both wet and dry weather. Um, taking into account this, that this sampling site is uh, impacted by upstream sources, all upstream sources, and, and also heavily trafficked by the public. Um, <laughs> or you're going to get spikes and weird readings that are going to be really hard to analyze. Um, the, these results are also heavily influenced by rainfall um, and runoff. And as mentioned earlier, anything walking through upstream of your sample site and stirring up you know, sediments is going to um, add to the, the complexity of the variation of your sampling. Uh, and trying to find sources requires implying conclusions from both upstream and downstream bracketing. So that means sampling upstream and downstream of where you want to test for to get a relative comparison of concentrations. Um, all this saying is if you actually wanted to test for bacteria, it would be a very complex um, monitoring program and it would go on for quite some time to get any kind of statistical data that would be anywhere near useful um, and there's not really a big point to it in that you already know it's there so um, there's not a lot of point in testing for it um, unintended consequences of of having monitoring data and programs is really uh, it may not provide definitive information that you're hoping to get, uh, which would help target management actions. Uh, you're diverting resources that could just be used to implement management actions uh, to improve water quality. The may also trigger additional regulatory requirements uh, from outside agencies, and it may create uh, MPDES or stormwater uh, uh, permit compliance liabilities uh, by monitoring things and getting results that are unintended. 
So really what we're looking at is, you know, want to run through common sources of bacteria and associated management actions. Uh, in this watershed, there is livestock upstream. So, you know, you have perhaps not cattle, I can't remember, but I know there are horses, probably chickens. Um, you want to provide animal waste management best practices for, for the property owners upstream. Um, try and get them to maintain vegetative buffers around waterways, keep the livestock away from the waterways. Uh, pet waste, dogs and cats, um, they're often a big contributor to pathogens in the creeks, uh, especially this time of year when it's low flow. Um, not only do they go in the creeks and stir everything up, but they don't typically care where they go to the bathroom. So uh, you have pet waste, not only in the creeks, but you have pet waste uh, bacteria running off from people's yards, streets, um, parks, wherever, that all eventually makes its way to the creek. So, you know, really up educating the public, providing pet waste bags and cans wherever there's trails or, you know, known to, to be a lot of, uh, you know, pet walking traffic. And then, of course, there's a whole plethora of sewage issues. Um, you know, sanitary sewer laterals uh, and transmission networks have leaks. This doesn't mean just necessarily, you know, a sewer line breaks and there's an overland flow that everybody sees. Uh, there can be, you know, multiple sewer laterals that are leaking upstream and getting into the groundwater. That groundwater is making its, uh, making its way to the creek and the, the tracking of that is, you know, obviously impossible. Uh, you also have, once you get out of the, the sanitary sewer network, septic systems that leak or wind up becoming hydrologically connected. And then, of course, uncontrolled human waste from, you know, recreational users or unhoused individuals. But there are management practices already in place uh, that we know work and would be far better to spend the resources on, uh, such as, you know, a sewer lateral program and septic system inspection, especially at time of sale uh, and offering replacement assistance on that. Um, outreach and services to provide public bathrooms and or porta potties. Um, keeping your pets out of the, you know, creek, restricting access to creeks and, you know, educating about potential incidental exposure. Um, it, it is not going to just be the unhoused that are going to um, cause pathogens to be in the creek. Uh, it's not uncommon for kids to wind up getting sick after playing in urban creeks because there are always pathogens in them. And especially this time of year, um, when the, the flows start getting really low, as kids go in, they start stirring up the sediment, the pathogen levels spike, they touch their face, they you know splash around, it possibly gets in their eyes or mouth, and they they get sick with E. coli. Um, so so really, it's it's a lot of educating the public that it is not really safe for your kids to play in in urban creeks, especially especially this time of year when the water is hardly flowing. Um, and then of course, <laughs> yeah, the whole plethora of wildlife. Um, also when the, when the streams start flowing low or you have, you know, the intermittent streams that dry up this time of year, all of the wildlife is coming down to the mainstream channel uh, for water, which means you also get all the wildlife poop that winds up being all along the stream. So you're going to get positive hits for pathogens just based on wildlife alone. Um, so conclusions, bacteria monitoring can be used as a tool, um, almost never for this kind of incidence because one, you already know it's there. Uh, typically it's, it's very highly variable. Uh, you get data that's all over the place. So, it's kind of limited information for management, managing, you know, kind of what you're going to do next. Um, requires a lot of investment of time and resources uh, to generate any form of meaningful data. Uh, and really the, the main point is we do not recommend it in this situation. Um, the, the management actions to control sources that are already known, which these are, are have 
are outlined and we're we are happy to you know assist the town with with trying to get some of those things implemented if if you want to uh, boost your your outreach and programs um but we would not recommend spending a lot of time and money uh hiring consultants to do monitoring that's going to tell you that pathogens are in the creek and <laughs> you you already know that so um Oh, sorry, that was not what I wanted to do. <laughs> I skipped myself right out of my presentation. Ah, did it again. <laughs> ah, sorry. Let me let me do it this way. <laughs> so lastly, I will not touch my keyboard. Recommended actions uh, to protect the creeks and people. Um, limit recreational access by all people and pets to to creeks. Um, and important habitat. Um, really, the best thing if you're worried about water quality is keeping everybody and pets out of the creek. Uh, it protects the spawning habitat and threatened species that are in the creek. Um, especially in low flows like now, when you turn it all up, uh, you're you're kicking up all the sediment and everything else, it makes it really hard for them to breathe and, and live. Uh, and really, if you know you want a, a healthy watershed, the, the, the real key would be to install split rail fencing and actually block off people from going into the park, uh, into the creek, uh, and replanting vegetation along the creek and actually making it a natural creek bank again. Uh, this will reduce erosion. It will re reduce fine sediment downstream. Uh, the the uh, native plants along the creek bank will will help cut down on the erosion a lot, and they will also uptake pollutants um, naturally. So uh, it also slows the flow. So all reasons to, to to keep everybody out of the creek, and we would greatly prefer that through Perry Park. Um, restoring the whole creek bank and, and really trying to keep the, the public out of the, the creek. Um, and then just making sure as uh, that you're providing programs and facilities and services that uh, to limit the contamination uh, as was outlined in the presentation that we just saw. And with that, thank you. Thank you, Howard. So so Vice Mayor and Catrano and Council Member Goddard, are you sharing us something with us this evening or? Um, yes, I was prepared to, uh, to share something if this is the time. Yes. Okie dokie. Um, thank you so much, Howard and Ashley. Um, we're getting the well-rounded sort of um, uh, picture painted for us. Um, I'm here to actually talk a little bit about the history of what Fairfax has been doing and engaging with the county um, around homelessness as a countywide um, as a countywide issue. Um, I am currently the co-chair of the Marin County Council of Mayors and Council Members um, Homeless Committee. So that's made up of a representative or two in our case with um, Vice Mayor and myself um, as representatives um, to this committee. Um, during a planning session for um, a countywide homelessness forum, um, one of the team reminded us of something that I haven't um, been able to get out of my head, and that is that we cause more harm to those who are most harmed by seeing these human beings as a problem for us. Um, and remembering that and keeping that as my um, as my backdrop to um, all of the um, the outreach from the public, um, the emails and the petition, um, I feel really compelled uh, to preface my comments and I won't go on too long, I promise. Um, but I wanted to state that personally, it is disturbing to me to be talking about um, two individuals behind their backs. For a community that prides ourselves on being inclusive, um, I don't feel like many of our underserved residents feel welcome, and unless these individuals are watching, and I'm not quite sure that they could be, uh, Wi-Fi uh, is not readily accessible to folks 
um, especially after dark. Um, and certainly not to those who are living in their cars or living in the open space, which we know they are. Um, so with that said, I want to give you a brief history of um, what uh, Fairfax has been doing to engage going back to 2014. Um, really, the extent um, of our involvement at the time was to support the Marin Organizing Committee's REST program. That was the Rotating Emergency Shelter Program. Um, prior to that time, the smaller cities and towns um, in Marin were really peripheral to the county's work um, and the county's approach to county to um, working with the unhoused uh, population. Um, the REST program um, provided a structure uh, for member civic and faith-based organizations um, and community volunteers to house and provide meals and befriend our homeless community members throughout the winter on a rotating basis. It was a win-win and a very feel-good and effective way of sheltering folks who had nowhere to find shelter during the winter months. Um, the REST program did sunset um, after 10 years of active service and the, uh, the county began moving in the direction of permanent supportive housing and a housing first approach to homelessness in Marin County. And Ashley has covered that absolutely beautifully. Um, but what took place in 2014 is that from a values-based foundation as was um, uh, at the heart of the REST program, um, now Mayor Kate, uh, uh, Colin and San Rafael initiate the MCCMC um, Homeless Committee. Um, it was with the understanding that the unhoused population of Marin is made up of individuals and families from each of our cities and towns. Um, and there was a unanimous decision made to start the Community Homeless Fund. Um, the Community Homeless Fund was built of contributions from every Marin city and town. Um, and that uh, was uh, decided that the Community Homeless Fund would fund the Downtown Streets Team uh, mobile showers in three-year increments. Um, the Downtown Streets Team showers um, actually uh, ended contract. Ashley, correct me if I'm wrong, but at the end of June, correct? We have managed in Fairfax to continue the shower program, but there are new shower providers bring, being brought on board. Um, some of the drivers and considerations of the Community Homeless Fund were that they be locally driven and supported, based in care, compassion, and dignity, person-to-person uh, -person relationship building. Um, it was an action with urgency and a direct pathway to system navigation, um, employment, case management, and ultimately to permanent housing. Um, as I said, Fairfax has had weekly showers since the onset of the pandemic in 2020, and they continue weekly um, to this day up at the community church. Um, uh, the process moves at the speed of trust. And um, I don't think there's ever been a time that that's more apropos. Um, I think that the county services um, uh, have been excellent um, and they're doing an ongoing great job um, at the connection building and trust, um, trust building. Uh, this groundwork is in place and the relationships have been forged, county services have been deployed and our emergency services and public safety folks have a close and careful eye on our unhoused population. Several of our two residers are now making use of the system of care and are signed on to a pathway to permanent housing. Um, I just wanna quote um, our police chief, um, Tabaranza from the Marin IJ article in closing. Um, chief Rico Tabaranza said, these are people who are part of the Fairfax community. Tabaranza said, these are people who we know and have a relationship with and we are working to get help. Um, the officials, he states, um, have asked that the Marin County Department of Health and Human Services step in. This took place last year and beginning in March, the county assigned the Community Action 
Marin Homelessness Team and the Downtown Streets Team to regularly meet and visit the homeless community in Fairfax to create those relationships with the campers and offer them services. I would say that we are on an excellent path forward. I appreciate all of the assistance from the multiple agencies and partners in the community. And I really um, believe strongly that we're on the right track. Um, so thank you um, very much. Thank you, Renee. Vice Mayor, were you, did you have anything or should we? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I. You know, I, I met with Renee prior to this, and and I share a lot of the sentiments that she shared, and I think she has a, a much better grasp of the the long term history of that work with the Marin County Council of Mayors and Council Members. I kind of got dropped into it in the last couple of years as um, we've experienced, you know, some um, changes in in the service provisions and the budgets for that. Uh, I would just add, you know, for for folks that are interested in understanding recently what we've been trying to do. I think folks on the council, folks across the county have recognized the need for increased case management. You know, there, there are people who are checking in and uh, meeting with unhoused folks around the county. And yet, uh, you know, a good ratio might look like something one case manager to like 17 people or something like that. Um, and Ashley could correct me too, but uh, we, as soon as we got our American Rescue Plan dollars, it was a priority of this council to immediately budget uh, some of those dollars for a coordinated project with, with our partners at the county to increase that case management. And I think uh, Council Member Goddard just alluded to the, the, the fruits of, of these efforts in, in terms of, you know, we're talking mostly about two folks. One of these folks is, is you know, on, on a path now, um, at, at least one of them. Um, the other thing I would just add is uh, there, I, there are some folks that are on Zoom here that I have met throughout the county, um, visiting folks in encampments, working with um, residents around the county that are living in encampments. Um, some of these folks now have vouchers. Some of these folks are my friends on Facebook. Some of these folks uh, have run for public office. So like, uh, what I mean to say is, uh, oftentimes we really do um, break things down to numbers and we break things down to the immediate concern uh, that we, we have because something is, is different or something's not happening quick enough. And um, we're talking about like real, not only real people, but like our, our friends and, and community members and residents. Um, and I, 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 uh, I just wanna hold that as we enter the next portion of this discussion. And I really am glad that this is happening and that members of the community can come and ask questions and get questions answered from the specialists that are with us. So just wanted to say thank you all. Yeah. Yes, thank you both. And thank you, Ashley and Howard. I'm gonna... Um break with protocol a little bit and just ask you a few questions. I All of us have been engaging with the community on this. And I, obviously the whole purpose of this session this evening was to offer more information and transparency about how we're supporting um, the unsheltered community. And uh, because, you know, we have been doing a lot and I've learned a lot through this the last several months and, and understanding this all better. Um, so first, I just want to thank you for, again, your presentation and learning more about um, the housing first model. When you referred to the changes in federal law, were you referring to Boise versus Martin? Yes, primarily. It's not just Martin versus Boise. A lot of the okay. federal courts more uh, locally um, have made, you know, sort of pandemic specific decisions that mm -hmm. prohibit, like even if you could offer shelter beds, clearing encampments is more complicated because of spreading contagion and the TDC guidance. That appears to be beginning to shift. Uh, Martin versus Boise still applies, um, but there may be a little bit more flexibility going forward. Okay. Um, and then as far as the coordinated system, um, I would love to know a little bit more detail about 
what's in that system. I think all like mm -hmm. you, Renee, and Chance are probably a lot closer to it than the rest of us. So if you could just illustrate that a little bit. And what I'm particularly interested in is kind of understanding just hypothetically, if I'm an unsheltered member of whatever community, what is the caseworker engagement look like? And when I get on a list, when I've built, when I've built that trust or what have you, what does that process look like? Is there a different, obviously it's not a one size fits all solution, it depends on the needs of the individual, but can you just help us understand what the process looks like and what the average timeline is and, and so forth? Absolutely, that sounds like a lot of fun. Um, and I'm gonna start by saying, if there are folks listening or watching later uh, who are in need of housing, you're, if you're currently homeless, you can call 415-473-HOME to get connected to our coordinated entry system. Um, and also, you can also talk to any homeless service provider, any outreach worker, we're all coordinated. Um, so our coordinated entry system uh, functions like a hospital emergency department or a uh, organ donor um, waiting list. It's based on vulnerability. It's not first come, first serve. Um, and we try to make it as low barrier for the folks who need housing as possible. That's not always, I mean, it's government. Our funding is government funding. It's a lot of federal funding. There's always going to be paperwork and hurdles, but we try to make it as easy as possible for folks. So if somebody is experiencing homelessness and they connect with an outreach worker or they call 473 home, um, the first thing we do is find out, you know, have you been homeless for more than two weeks? If not, we might connect you with um, some lower, we would connect you with lower intensity services like the St. Vincent de Paul Housing Help Desk to try and get you right back into housing without even entering the homeless system of care. Um, if you've been homeless for a while, then we'll do what uh, a coordinated entry assessment, which some of you may have heard of as the VI spit at. We're actually moving away from that as our assessment over the next couple of years uh, towards something a little more equitable. Um, but for now, that's what we use. It looks at a whole bunch of different domains, um, everything from uh, housing history to engagement with um, law enforcement, uh, financial history, mental health history, ability to meet your daily needs like food and cleanliness, stuff like that. Um, and that helps us determine what level of housing support folks need, whether they need that permanent supportive housing we talked about, or whether they might be more successful um, with short-term assistance uh, while they increase their income and stabilize. Um, we then we would route them to the appropriate service based on what the assessment tells us. Uh, then we look at a couple of other factors to um, for folks who are uh, who qualify for permanent supportive housing. That's the bulk of the work that we do in coordinated entry. Um, those folks, we look at uh, a few different factors to um, uh, take our, basically our, our big bucket of folks who qualify and determine who's the most vulnerable and who should go first. Um, it's a little bit science, a little bit art, um, and um, we do our best uh, to make sure that um, we have the most accurate and up-to-date information um, for everybody that we're reviewing. Uh, once somebody comes to the top of the list, uh, then they would be identified for um, consideration for the next available housing opportunity. We assign housing opportunities in committee um, with uh, the housing providers and anybody who uh, has experience working with the person who is um, being assigned. So it's not that we would skip over people like they're not ready for housing or they're not they're not appropriate for housing, but we do our best to um, appropriately match the folks that we're serving with the housing opportunities. So if what's available happens to be um, a room in a shared unit, and this is the person who has a history of not getting along with roommates, we'll wait on that person um, for a more appropriate opportunity to come up. Um, that process, so once, that, once they've been assigned a housing opportunity, um, then either, depending on the program, either outreach or a case manager um, will be assigned to them and they'll start working with them um, on getting their paperwork, on making sure they have um, the necessary identification cards and 
um, you know, whatever else they might need, uh, the, filling out all the paperwork for a voucher. Um, and once they've been issued a voucher, then they'll also help support that person with finding a unit. That process um, can take a really long time. Um, there are uh, 500 plus folks who qualify for permanent supportive housing here in Marin, and we do not have 500 available permanent supportive housing placements. Um, so, and those are, those are all vulnerable folks, disabilities, long histories of homelessness, who absolutely need and deserve the appropriate intervention. We just don't have enough. So um, when folks see somebody on the street who um, is clearly super vulnerable, ill, disabled, really needs the assistance, yes, absolutely they need the assistance. And the reason, the only reason they haven't gotten it is because there are people that you might not be seeing who are even sicker. Um, we use housing as a, a medical intervention for a lot of folks, and you'd be amazed at the, the sort of folks that we find in house. So depending on how vulnerable somebody is, um, that process can be, you know, a matter, I would say probably the fastest would be like a couple of months if we're really, really booking it, um, and others might wait for years. For somebody who's at the top of, once somebody comes to the top of the list, um, it might be anywhere from maybe three to eight months before we find them, before they, they wind up actually in housing. That was thank you. a detailed answer. <laughs> no, it was good. Thank you. I appreciate it. Council Member Kohler. Yeah, first of all, thank you to Ashley Howard and uh, Chance and Renee, and I want to especially thank Renee for things that I've had in my heart, and thank you for all your hard work over these years. Uh, just a quick question about one of your slides that went by too fast for me, and I think it was slide 18 or 19. Mm -hmm. You talked about permanent supportive housing. There were there were two, three other bullets, and one of them said diversion. And I'm not yeah. sure what that meant, and maybe it's just my ignorance. Happy to talk about that. When I mentioned the folks um, who haven't been homeless for very long, maybe in the first couple weeks of homelessness, those are the folks who might go to diversion. Um, we okay. call it diversion because they're actually homeless, but we are, so it's not prevention, but we're trying to keep them out of the homeless system of care. We don't want them to end up in the homelessness system cycle. We want to divert them and get them back into whatever, shared housing, back with mom, like whatever it is, get them inside and get them stable fast. And so that's Excellent. what diversion does. No, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, let's open the public comment. Okay. So people, if you would like to speak on this um, presentation, this series of presentations, please raise your hand. I will. Turn on the timer. Okay, the first um, hand is uh, initials SO, and you are unmuted now. Oops. And you disappear. The next, oh, I'm sorry, Madam Mayor, are you? Um, I'm not doing anything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was strange. Yes. Oh, hi. Can yes, you hear me? Jason. Jason. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Different person. Uh, you jumped to the top suddenly. Okay, great. I just wanted to start it out by uh, saying I too read the uh, article on the IJ about the police chief uh, recognizing the uh, homeless there, the, all, all the two people that uh, were um, were part of the community and they and he knew them by name. And I think that's a great start. And uh, it seems like the, the council is very, very compassionate towards homelessness, which I, I really enjoy hearing. And I just want to say that, that, you know, the best way for, for homeless to get services or, or to be service, you know, not service resistant is to be stable, to be in a safe environment. And, uh, you know, and it gives them a chance to regroup and set their feet for a second and, and maybe look to services that they wouldn't want before because they're always getting pushed aside by law enforcement or or concerned residents and i just want want to let let the council know that 
you know, I, I hope going forward that, you know, um, you know, concerted resonance won't be a, a, an issue for you and you, you won't make decisions based on what they're, what they're thinking because, uh, you know, um, you know, keeping people safe and giving them a chance to, to accept these services, I think is the best route. And I think you're doing a good job and it looks like one person's already, uh, going into a, a pathway to housing, you know, um, I just got in housing myself after 12 years on the streets. I have been the lead founder at the camp in Novato camp compassion where we now have a sanctioned camp and people are, are starting to get services and starting to get housed. You know, you're at two people right now, which, you know, doesn't, you know, I, I don't, I don't really want to see another camp, you know, per se, if, if, if people are going to be able to get the services and be safe. And, uh, you know, I just, I just hope you are cognizant of, uh, of not, not really give it into what, some of the concerned residents think because uh you know there is a better way and and i think uh homelessness has changed the last couple of years in in marin and i think it's on a uh pointed in a better direction and thank uh you. thank you Jason. I to say. thank you very much the next speaker is stephen tejero and um you're unmuted now hi can you hear me Yes. All right. Um, I guess all I wanted to say for my comment is I've learned a lot from these presentations. I'm very thankful for the abundance of information that I've received. Um, concerning the encampment, I felt a lot of anger um, that I recognize in myself, but after listening to everyone's presentation and after sitting with how I was feeling, um, I recognize that it will take compassion and care to help our community members move forward. And that, um, yeah, it's just people in need and we're all people in need um and i'm just i'm happy now i feel relieved um knowing what's being done um i have a lot of care for you know the kids at the park i helped get the skate park made i've had some negative interactions with some of the people who kind of wander into that space that I, I think they i don't regularly see them I think they just you know come from out of town and then wind up there and you know I've had some bad interactions but that doesn't speak to you know just the good progress being made so I just want to say thank you to everybody and um, I really do hope the best for all of our community members and I'm feeling better and that's it so thank you thank you Thank you. The next speaker is Deborah Benson, and you're unmuted now. Hi, Michelle. Hello, Council members. Uh, Ashley and Howard, thank you for hearing me. Um, I wish for a safe place for all of us because we were all somebody's baby once. Um, I believe I met one of the one of the uh, residents, the unhoused residents at the Fairfax Festival based upon his interaction with the police. And he seemed to be um, uh, uh, in the dire straits of, of um, being un heavily under the influence of, of alcohol. Uh, many people were that day actually um, because it was Fairfax Festival, but I wonder, um, I know that some people, if they're offered a shelter in, you know, a dormitory style shelter, if they're not allowed to use whatever, you know, drug or, or uh, substance that they intend to use, refuse the, or maybe if they have a pet and they can't take the pet, are not, uh, they refuse to um, take advantage of that. And I wonder what kind of facilities are 
available for that part of the population. I know that people cannot be required to take uh, treatment. They can't be uh, they can't be required to to take advantage of an offer. But I wonder what's available to them. And then technical question: If someone in that situation is offered a place, how does that? What effect does that have on the Martin versus Boise uh, situation? Curious. Anyway, thank you for hearing me, and I have hopes that everyone lands in a in a safe, sheltered environment. Thank you for all your work. Um, Mayor, may I just interrupt for one quick second? I'm just wondering, Ashley, I see you taking notes. Um, if you would jot down some of the questions that really would be, um, you would be able to answer at some point, and it may have to go out in an FAQ or something because of time, sure. it would be really helpful because these are great questions and I really want to make sure people get to the sort of level of understanding that they're asking for. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Deborah. The next speaker is S.O. And now you're unmuted. You may have to unmute. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry, I, I was unable to do that earlier. Um, Ashley, really quickly, I just wanted to say that earlier you began your presentation that had a lot of great data uh, with the comparison of success rates in Connecticut to success rates in Northern California. And I feel like those are, um, they were great, they were inspiring, but also there's a climate issue and sort of a geographical issue there that doesn't apply or doesn't quite transcribe. So I would love, thank you for writing it down. I would love some more information on like how that is applicable. Um, also Renee, I wanna shout out to you for that great quote. I may misquote it here, but it was something along the lines of we cause most harm to those who are most harm by us keeping them at arm's length or something like that. Um, because uh, these individuals that we're talking about aren't on the Zoom call that I that I know of tonight. Um, and I I wish they were um, because uh, we went on, you went on to cite a lot of progress uh, that various programs have done dating back to the early 2010s. I would love to hear a little more backstory on these individuals. So as a town, we could actually help them and help their placement. Um, and lastly, I just have a, a little note here for Howard. Uh, awesome presentation. I love the idea of replanting the creek bed um, to help with um, erosion and, and uh, environmental mitigation and such. And thank you. I learned a lot from your presentation. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Mallory, and you're unmuted now. Um, all right, first, uh, Michelle, can you give us a three person heads up? Um, as a general I can try. thing, <laughs> I'm doing okay. like 15 things back here. <laughs> okay, but in general, um, all right, yeah, so I try. we're dealing with symptoms. And the problem is that the, the problem is really affordable housing, which is in Marin, completely an oxymoron. It's not even people who are in affordable housing, for most people, it's not reachable. The other part of it is that there really is no very good emotional support, especially for vets. The other thing is that we're talking about homelessness in one big lump, but there are three, at least three kinds of homelessness. There are people who are living in cars who had to, you know, who are usually seniors and they had to get out of their place. Then there are families who have, they can't afford the rents here and many of them do work here. And then there are vets and then there are vets who are addicts. And you can't lump, I don't think, everybody into one place and they have to be addressed separately. Um, so I, I don't, you know, if you want to deal with the the little the little letters, um, we need more porta potties. Um, Renee, you said something about we are the problem. They are also the problem for us. I have been harassed by the new bunch of people behind the um, pavilion. When it was just Tom, it was fine. Now the music is louder. I don't know if it, they have electricity, but it's. I was in a in the park in Perry Park, and there was. 
really beautiful music and and I had to block out the the, the guitars from up on the homeless thing. So um, and I have some questions for Ashley. It, it was very general what you said and it was it was important, but I would like to know how long does it take to get a, uh, available housing? Um, the outreach of three to four times a month is that with one person? And is it a whole day or is it five people three or four times a month? Because it's very little for the situation we have. Um, I don't know what co coordinating with law enforcement is because when I asked, um, they said they couldn't do anything, that their hands were tied when one guy was going crazy behind the pavilion and I can't walk there anymore with my dog. Um, and I don't know how many shelters besides the church there are here. And Mallory, then you your time said, is up. Can you wrap it up, please? Thank you. Yes, I'm going to wrap it up. Then the decrease between 2017 and 2019, but that's three years later. So what is the amount now? It's, it's still decreased. Thank you. And that's it. Thank you. Hey, um, thank you. The next speaker is Robbie Powelson, and you are unmuted now. And excuse me, pardon me, um, Michelle, if you could give people a, you know, 15, 10, 15 second warning, that would be great. Uh, sure. Thank you. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. So I, I just, um, you know, given my feedback that I've heard some very problematic behavior uh, from Fairfax police officers um, uh, relating to people who are unhoused in the community. And um, apparently now there, there is some, something going on with the Fairfax Police Department where they are targeting people. Um, you know, I would just advise the city that you have legal obligations that you need to abide by. Um, you know, I, and I would, I would put on the record, I find it problematic how When, when we have a community like Marin, which this is the most, the most inequitable county in the state, the most profane and just, I mean, our county is built on segregation. We're, we're not a, a morally based county. And there's all this finger pointing as though people that don't have property, don't have shelter, are need to be fixed when all these people that are doing the finger pointing are the ones who are doing the real harm and people need to be looking at themselves instead of trying to condemn people who are living outside who are trying to survive and going through a difficult phase in life and so you know i strongly advise the city that to uphold uh, uphold your legal obligations, um, not to destroy people's property, not to unjustly arrest people, maliciously prosecute people, um, uh, do unlawful ordinances to um, criminalize people surviving. That is all. Thank you. Sorry, thank you. The next speaker is Michael Mason, followed by Megan F. Uh, Michael, you're unmuted now. Good evening, members of the town council, uh, Mayor Hellman and uh, administrators with the County of Marin. I very much appreciate your time and attention uh, to this important issue. Um, I recognize that homelessness is a housing issue at its root cause. Um, it, there's a reason that one out of every four homeless individuals in the United States is in the state of California, and it's because of our extremely high housing costs. I would ask ourselves and other members in Fairfax, um, if we see several homeless individuals uh, in our park, how many housing units we've created here over the past several years in your memory. Uh, we cannot police or criminalize our way out of homelessness, um, and, and I accept that as true. I also accept as true that encampments um, are unhealthy 
for both our housed and unhoused community members alike, as we've seen in other areas of Marin, encampments, especially growing in large growing encampments are extremely problematic um, for health reasons for everybody. I would like to request the county secure emergency shelter for our currently unhoused community members and that outreach workers definitively offer the shelter to these individuals. It is up to us as a community to decide how we act. If shelter is available, but we do not request individuals accept it, there will be no end to this encampment. We do have the power to enforce through 647E, the illegal lodging ordinance to request individuals uh, accept shelter or leave the area if it is available. It is up to us as a community to decide how we approach these folks, uh, our housed and unhoused community members alike. I believe that compassionate and pragmatic care includes securing emergency shelter and compelling folks to the best of our ability to accept it. If we do not do that, we will see unhoused individuals remaining in this park for the future to come. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker is uh, Megan F, followed by Michael McIntosh. And you're unmuted now, Megan. Hi, um, I just wanted to thank you guys for the great presentation tonight. Um, I think it was really helpful and um, I was really happy to hear that the progressive values of Fairfax are upheld. Um, my question is really just about the the creek, I know you guys are jotting down some questions to maybe come back with answers for. I think the presentation about the creek was really informative and would be really eye-opening for a lot of community members. Um, I know it was eye-opening for me. Um, so I was just wondering if one of the questions you guys could come back with answers for could be specifically about what the definition of an urban creek is. Um, like obviously it, it is the creek uh, near Perry Park, but um, does it include like, the Cascade Creek and other places where like tons of families have their kids play and <laughs> might be equally problematic. Um, so I don't know if that would be possible, but that's might be <laughs> interesting for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Michael McIntosh followed by Mark Bell. Michael, you're unmuted now. Hi, Michelle, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, first, I want to offer to Howard that I thought your presentation was a really well-measured presentation explaining what really can and can't be done and whether the expenditure okay. was efficient to the needs. So I really want to compliment you on that because that's just so lacking in many of our governmental discussions these days. So thank you. As for the homelessness, um, I really listened to what Ashley said, and she said that most of our homeless people are from this area, and not just our area, <clears throat> but the area that they find themselves homeless. I don't think it would be unreasonable if each community took ownership of those people that in the past paid into the taxes, participated in our communities, and if they've already paid into that pre-existing tax basis, maybe that's where we should use our resources and help these people. I can speak firsthand to this. So I have a sister-in-law who is still homeless by choice. I had a brother who was homeless except for some couch surfing until he lost his life due to alcoholism last year. So I have seen this very much upfront. And I do think it'd be very nice if we as a community used our resources and said, hey, these were active members, they did pay into our tax system. So maybe that's where we should take some of the surplus money to help those individuals. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Mark Bell, followed by Diane R. And Mark, you're unmuted now. Thanks, Michelle. I mean, the homeless problem started when Reagan threw all these people on the street and it hasn't gotten any better. I mean, this is a decades old problem. Uh, some of the um, comments um, 
seem contradictory if you're saying that there's almost no homelessness that but there aren't places for people to stay which is what came up in the uh, presentation maybe you're just trying to make your presentation concise but a lot of this just contradicted itself and the other uh, fallacy that was presented is that uh, when people saw the homelessness of their area people who uh, municipalities who were not being su successful buy bus tickets to send people to those places because you can look at salt lake city as an example who had solved their homeless problem and then they had a huge influx of people who came because where they were homeless those municipalities were buying them bus tickets to salt lake city so that they could deal with them that being said uh, i'm glad to see that you're working on this problem and on this issue it's hard you can't force people to do something they don't want and it, to make it attractive to stop uh, being homeless for some people is really hard so i'm glad that you're working on it it is a complicated thing but i think a little clarity uh, in the presentation would have been helpful and also not bundling them all together thank you thank you Okay, thanks. The next uh, speaker is Diane R, followed by Wendy. And Diane, you're unmuted now. Yes, need to unmute. Thank you, everybody, for the presentations. And it's you know it's good to see compassion. It's good to see plans. My problem. I grew up in Fairfax. I was a little kid in that park. And it really means a lot to me. And I think the thing that we're not even addressing is that this is the children's park that these people are living in. I mean, I don't think that they should be allowed in a children's park. It's it's they're not able. The children are not able to play in that park the way that I played when I was a little kid. You know, I, I think that that's very upsetting. And I know looking at homelessness in general is something different than, you know, our that park. Isn't there other places really that these people can wait for services and get better helped with, uh, without infringing on the rights of the children and the parents of children to use that park as it was intended? That's all. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Wendy, followed by Mimi Newton. And Wendy, you're unmuted now. Hi, um, my name is Wendy, and I am a former resident of Fairfax. And I just wanted to say I find this um, heartening that um, this discussion is being had um, publicly when it's often a silent issue. And I find it ironic that it's happening on the same day that um, People's Park um, history is being made there in Berkeley today. And I also just wanted to say that any situation could um, could turn in your life, in any in anybody's life, and any one of us could end up becoming houseless. And I very much came close to that when I lost my home in Fairfax. So um, thanks for doing this. Thank you. Next speaker is Mimi Newton, followed by Kathy Flores. And Mimi, you're unmuted now. Uh, thanks, Michelle. Uh, good evening, council members. Uh, I hadn't really planned on talking until I heard some of my uh, neighbors urging uh, less than what I would consider compassionate response to the situation of the homeless in Fairfax. And uh, I, I spent some time in San Francisco uh, in my youth, uh, living on the streets. And uh, I am particularly sensitive to the idea that most of us are just a paycheck or two away from the streets ourselves. And, and I just really wanna urge everybody uh, who's listening to this to uh, 
you know, put yourself in the shoes of someone who uh, doesn't have a place to call home. Thanks, council members. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is Kathy Flores, and you're unmuted now. Can you hear me, Michelle? Yes. Yes. I really don't have anything written. However, um, um, what Howard, I, I'm talking about what Howard was saying about the creek. It's, it sounds like to me, there's always bacteria in there. It sounds like that to me. So if that's the case, I really think that the town needs to put a sign up above by the creek, down below by the creek, on either side of the creek, so that parents, mainly I'm talking about children, parents know that there's a risk there if you let your children play in this creek. You know, three or four years ago, a child, a three-year-old, everybody knows this, was got a kidney infection and it was in, he, was a, he or she was in the hospital for a few days. And I don't wanna see that happen again. So warning the parents that um, this is not safe and you're, you're letting your child do this knowing that this something could happen. Um, I'd like to back what, there was a few people, Diane, Mallory, and one other person that, oh, Michael Mason. They all said good things that I agreed with. Um, and I won't get into all of that, but my main point was, I think that there needs to be a sign, a pie down low. I'm not sure where you want to put it, but on both sides of the Creek where Perry park is to say, you know, please, you know, enter at your own risk, or I don't know how you want to say it, but that's, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is, or are, uh, Jewel and Ken. And you're unmuted now. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I've, uh, my name is Kenneth Kennedy. Um, I've been a resident of Marin County since 1971. Uh, I've raised four kids in this county. I've had two careers, successful careers, and I'm homeless. Uh, Sunday, I was harassed by the police department in Fairfax. I was pulled over uh, with a ticket already written for expired tags. When I told the police officer, no, nope, here's the paperwork, my registration's good, and I did the smog, he went back to the cop car for about 10 minutes, and they hit us with about $3,000 worth of other tickets. Um, the experience I've had in the last year, I've lived in Sausalito probably seven years. I raised my kids in Mill Valley. I went to San Rafael High School, graduated. Um, but the experience I've had down here, I've seen a lot of city council meetings. I've heard about the programs and everything. But if you're not a woman or a Sir, are you, we lost you. Are you still speaking? Oh, you're coming back in the I think corner. I heard all the six round things, but I've also seen horrifying things this year from the police department, from the government. People saying, hey, we're going to get $3 million to help the hospital. They don't sit on the side from October through February. Uh, but it sounds wonderful in these meetings. It sounds great in the newspapers. But Sausalito took my tent down when we went to go help my father-in-law, Daniel. And when we got back, they had beat us to the bunch, so to say. They had taken us that very morning and made us home. Mr. Kennedy, what I've we've, seen, we've only heard maybe a minute of your comment. Um, you've had some reception issues. You're coming in really, really spotty. I'm sorry, we weren't, we weren't able to hear most of your comment. And the police department. The harassment they did. 
I think I've, I've lost you guys. Can you see and hear me still? Mr. Kennedy, we didn't hear most of what you shared. I'm sorry. Um, oh, we just lost him. I think we've had some connectivity problems with him. Maybe his Wi-Fi is not good. Yeah. Uh, if you can hear us, I, I would ask that you write to the council so we can understand your what you, we can hear what you plan to share because we only heard the first bit of it. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is Joe McGarry. Joe, you're unmuted now. Thank you, Michelle. Um, yeah, I just some backdrop. So, so Ken's at the the the, the library uh, using the Wi-Fi there that was mentioned, and his his phone was dying. Um, you know, as the length of the presentations went on, and and the item got bumped from two to three, and just you know, I understand it happens, but just want to point out like. Marginalized people are marginalized in a lot of ways. And so if we want to talk with unhoused people rather than talk about unhoused people, we need to take some of these things into consideration that when at the end of a day, as, as Council Member Goddard said, that if we've got an item at a certain time that you know people are dependent on that who are unhoused. And um, but anyway, I can. I, I spoke a lot with Ken and I, I witnessed what happened to him on Sunday. Um, and there just seems to be a disconnect between, you know, um, Chief Tabaranza's statement in the paper, and maybe it was specific to the, to the folks by the creek, but the approach of his officers to some of the unhoused folks. Ken's been in a, in a van, in a truck, um, moving around town, being respectful when the sun comes up, moving it out of parking spaces that he knows are gonna be needed. And he was, he was watched on Sunday and they waited till he moved. And then officer Morales pulled him over, approached him with a filled out ticket and, and actually called for backup from officer Gekal, who then came on the right flank and you know, approached on the passenger's side and it was a really intimidating moment to witness. And, and so there just seems to be a disconnect from some of the statements around how the law enforcement is gonna engage with the unhoused and what's happening with officers. So I think it's really important that as this issue, as the, the situation moves forward and we start working with folks that we close that gap because the words were beautiful, you know, and if that can be, how we engage with the unhoused in Fairfax, how law enforcement engages with it. If that's really possible, that would be great. But what thank I witnessed you, Sunday you, says Joe. not thank possible. Thank you, your time is up. Thank you. Madam Mayor, I see no more speakers. Okay. All right. Does anybody have an, oh, Barbara, go ahead. Um, just a quick comment. Uh, Ashley, I think when you and Chief Tabaranzo were in at the farmer's market, you passed out some uh, flyers, brochures, and we had the opportunity to see those. And I think they were really helpful. So I would like us to be able to post that on our website. I also think probably posting these presentations would be good. And I just want to just add something. First of all, thank you, Mayor, for making sure that this presentation happened. And also to say, I know we all have our little stories, but many years ago, I couch surfed and slept in my car when I was much younger for a few months. And, um, clearly not at the level that a lot of folks have, and I had other options. But I want to say, just echoing some of what Council Member Goddard said and, and Vice Mayor Catrano, these folks are part of our community. And um, as such, they need to be treated as members of our community, 
we've had encampments out where I live for several years and in the open space. And these folks have been fine community members. Um, and I also want to say our police department has had sort of in the past one of their officers who had a relationship with folks that were unhoused in the area, uh, a good relationship. And I'm not sure if we're still doing that, but I also want to commend Chief Tavaranza on bringing in resources um, and working with the county to help folks. So I'm really glad that we have this this information tonight. And I think it puts a new picture on what some have portrayed differently. And I have to just echo what Mimi Newton said is, it's really not the level of compassion that I would expect from, from what we consider ourselves a very progressive liberal community in some. Thank you. Councilmember Goddard. Yes, if I may, I wanted to reread that initial opening quote um, because uh, a couple of people referred to it and um, I found it very um, empowering in this situation. So the quote is that we cause more harm to those who are most harmed by seeing these human beings as a problem for us. So. I just, yeah, wanted to restate. Thank you. I have a couple of questions and uh, discussion items. And Fennec, does anyone have anything else? No, okay. Um, I, I would like to, uh, I don't know what happened three or four years ago as far as the, um, the signage, I understand there was signage put up at the creek and I don't know what happened to it. I don't have the backstory on that, but I do think we should um, think about putting some signs up for the creek. And I, I would like to have a discussion um, about restoring the creek bed. To me, that makes a world of sense. Um, so I wanted to get feedback from the council on that. I personally think it's a good idea. I'm hoping that um, there might be funding that would help. And I think one of the issues, because there is so many folks and animals walking in and out of the creek, it would probably be difficult to do some plantings um, without having some kind of fencing to keep folks out. Um, but uh, I think it's a good idea that we could look at more long-term. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm definitely um, not opposed to good signage. I think we do have a duty if we have a a sense of what's in these creeks to let folks know, at least warn folks. I've seen plenty of people in those creeks. I've been in those creeks with some of you doing creek walks and picking up trash. So we, we we've all exposed ourselves. I, I think my other concern is there are. Uh, and actually, somebody did speak on this and with the public comment. There are other places that are urban creeks um, that are spots where families do like to go in the water. And I, I think there should be a comprehensive look at, you know, where are the the likely access points and how do we make sure that people understand um, the risks inherent in um, coming into contact, recreational contact with some of these water bodies. Um, and then with regard to restoration, I think similarly, uh, we probably have a lot of restoration work to do, uh, throughout, throughout the, um, the greater Fairfax area, um, as far as Creek restoration and Perry parks are a great place to start, but, um, yeah, uh, I, I think we definitely should pursue that in the future. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I heard. How I'd say three times, I think it was in your presentation. We know it's, we know it's in there. So, uh, I think we we absolutely need to <clears throat> communicate um, more proactively to stay out of the creek. Um, just 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 for reference, there were 
I talked to uh, Environmental Health Services and they got back to me this morning. There were, <clears throat> were cases both in 2016 and 2018 that they, um, uh, I believe that they tracked back to the creek that, you know, kids had just gotten it from splashing around the creek. It happens, it gets, you know, it splashes up, it gets in their mouth or they, they touch their mouth, not thinking and, and you know, it just, it happens. <laughs> Uh, it is it is pretty prevalent in in almost all urban creeks that there's going to be pathogens, um, and and I mean, even in open space there's there's going to be some pathogens because there's wildlife that all use the creeks. But as you get down into the <clears throat> the urban areas, you do get more uh, opportunities for there to be you know uh, broken laterals from people's. Uh, um, sanitary sewer system connections and also you know on the peripheral where you don't have that you have septic systems and and as they get older they don't work as well and and sometimes they will just get hydraulic connections um that for groundwater that, that will take it straight down into the creek so um hey, howard would you mind explaining your use of the word urban because i think our community is probably not used to uh hearing you know, their community be described as ur urban? Um, for, for simple purposes, you, you have open space and you have urban. Okay. Uh, pretty much once you get down out of open space and you start getting down into houses, um, you're, you're basically in urban, uh, what they consider an urban environment, um, where, where you have regular housing. Um, typically, the, the water quality, uh, in fact, not typically, almost always, from top of watershed, the bottom of watershed will get progressively worse. So the lower down the watershed you go, the, the higher the pollutants will be. Um, there, there is a pathogen TMDL for both Tomales Bay and Richardson Bay because the, the counts are so high. And that is largely due in part to all the, you know, the sub watersheds draining down into those bays. And and Howard, for folks that might not know that acronym, it's total maximum daily load for both yes. point, point source stationary pollution from like a factory or whatever, but also non-point source wildlife, livestock, et cetera. So yes, so sanitary sewer overflows, what have you. Uh, it just means that the that the counts they get um, are above the, the 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 water quality uses that are defined for that water body. Uh, so for the bays, there is recreational contact and there's also uh, shellfish uh, limits. Um, so the when they're testing, they'll go by those limits. If they consistently exceed those limits, then the the state water board or regional water boards will wind up writing a, 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 a what they call a total maximum daily load uh, requirement. And it will take into account all the various sources and and have the sources work on reducing them. So uh, a big one for municipalities that are uh, like for the county for Tomales Bay and for the, the municipalities around Richardson Bay, that means that you know that they have to monitor uh, you know where dogs are normally walked. Uh, so pet waste is the big one. Uh, so you know uh, do they have uh, adequate uh, pet waste stations, um, how many pet waste bags are they putting out? Are they doing outreach for it? Uh, those types of things. What are they doing to reduce those loads coming from the urban areas? Thank you. And um, can someone on staff or vice mayor or Ashley, who's um, had engagement with um, the folks at the encampment are they have they been fully made aware that we have a 24 7 uh, public restroom available i just want to make sure they know that that's very nearby and accessible around the clock that's not something i can answer perhaps heather or chief tabaranza be happy to answer. Um, I, I have seen um, our unhoused residents using those facilities, so um, I believe them to be aware of that. And um, that walk um, around the pavilion and um, into town, you know, in around to the front of town hall is largely paved and pretty accessible. Okay, thank you. you. Know, I just wonder if it makes sense 
because you're not there 24 7 so it just it would be i would like to make sure that they know that it's open 24 hours so i don't go ahead renee you know i was going to say also um i i feel as though we can do a better job in making sure that everyone knows that those showers are available mm -hmm. to be had um because when we talk about coordinated entry that's one of the main pieces that really makes this shower um, program so important is that people are entering a system of care um, when they have that point, that first point of contact at the shower. So we do need to make sure through our newsletter that we really are promoting that those showers are going to continue to be there. And I think it makes sense to let everyone know that those bathrooms and restrooms are open at Town Hall 24-7. You know, it's uh, it's our only public restroom, <laughs> really, and so um, I think we can make um, make that a lot better known. Mayor, can I add one more thing, real quick, just just to piggyback on Councilmember Goddard's point? I know we're trying to wrap on this item, but um, the the relationships that can be built with folks that are um, housing insecure, or, you know, unsheltered in our community, just by checking in, if you if you encounter them and um, just asking them if they need anything. In my experience, it's just been a way to move into that conversation of not simply like, hey, do you need a meal or a coffee or you know, a nice pair of warm socks or a tarp if it's gonna rain, but moving into those discussions of um, whether or not they're able to make it to the shower or whether or not they're uh, able to contact the folks. And it's just, it feels like that's part of that that um that pipeline as well or that pathway is just checking in with like people in our community and, and seeing how we can help them and care for them so just wanted to you know call people into that uh because i think that that's been promising for me that's really helpful thank you vice mayor um actually was there anything that you captured that we you wanted to circle back on in terms of answering questions that were raised yeah, um, a few. I won't answer all of them here in the interest of getting everybody to bed at yeah. a reasonable hour. Um, and we can send things out by email. Um, I really, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all. And I really appreciate um, that the town, this, the town of Fairfax has been so collaborative um, and proactive working on this. We have found that the more um, uh, welcoming and um, collaborative uh, a, a city or a town is, the easier it is for us to engage with the folks who are experiencing homelessness in that jurisdiction. So um, it's both compassionate and it's also more effective. Thank you. Um, so just a few things. Um, Mark Bell mentioned um, some contradictions in the presentation. And um, frankly, I kind of loved that comment because my uh, tendency is to give so much detail, you would all be bored and we would <laughs> still be here at midnight. Um, so if uh, th there absolutely was a lot of condensing. <laughs> um, so if folks have questions or if something didn't make sense from the presentation, please do reach out. You can get us at, at hhshomelessness at marincounty.org. That'll get me and um, a couple other members of my team, all of whom can answer your questions faster than just going to me. Um, would love that. And I'd love the opportunity to geek out about this stuff. Um, we do have um, local examples of success in addressing homelessness. Um, it's not just limited to uh, Connecticut. Um, I can, we can put in an, an email or on the website or, or something, um, a link to a map of all the communities that have ended chronic or veteran homelessness. It's compiled by um, the US Interagency Council on Homelessness. Um, here in California, uh, Riverside County has ended uh, veteran homelessness and Kern County is like, I think like that close to ending um, veteran homelessness. Uh, the biggest challenge, the biggest, I think, difference um, in California, as somebody mentioned, is the cost of housing. Um, and I uh, would draw folks' attention to um, the, the New York Times, um, the morning newsletter from, I think it was July 15th, and I'm also happy to share a link to that, um, was a really excellent summary of the relationship between the availability of affordable housing and the occurrence of homelessness. Um, it's the, 
availability of affordable housing is the most correlative factor uh, when you look at rates of homelessness across the country, including poverty. There are places with high poverty with low rates of homelessness. Um, and here in California, uh, we have such high rates because we have no affordable housing. Um, the, let's see here. Um, just a quick answer on you know, three to four times a month with outreach. It's two different teams, um, two or three different teams, um, and it, it rotates. It's a variety of persons, but um, on a semi-regular basis, we're working on um, making it a more predictable schedule for folks so that um, they know they know when they can check in with an outreach worker. Uh, but it's not just like one person coming in a couple times um, a, a month. It's, it's a, a team of folks. Um, uh, there was a uh, concern about um, people sending or cities sending folks to places that have robust services. Um, and that's not, you know, entirely without um, precedent. Um, folks may remember the city of Las Vegas was sued by the city of San Francisco um, for doing just that. Uh, San Francisco won. Um, so it's not really a thing that we see very often at all. Um, the, it, when it happens, it's much more of an outlier situation. Um, and there are communities in, um, that are very similar to Marin, particularly Montgomery County, Maryland, which is right outside DC, and Bergen County, New Jersey, uh, which is right outside New York City, uh, both of which are affluent suburban counties, really similar to Marin County, um, have made tremendous progress in addressing homelessness and have not seen um, a corresponding influx of folks from elsewhere. Um, and there was one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, Let's see. Oh, here. Um, the uh, uh, yes, we do use different interventions for different populations. Somebody mentioned, you know, there's folks who struggle with mental illness or substance use. We've got youth. We've got veterans. Um, the the population of folks experiencing homelessness is just as diverse as the population that's housed. Literally, the only difference is that they don't have a place to live that's indoors. Um, and just like the rest of us, what works for Jack doesn't necessarily work for Jill. Um, and so we have a variety of different interventions, a variety of different program types that are really tailored to meet um, a variety of different needs. Um, happy to geek out about that more with anybody who wants to. Um, speaking of which, we uh, a couple weeks ago, um, a colleague and I came to the Fairfax Farmers Market just to talk with folks. Um, we wanted to uh, I mean, how many people are going to sit around until 9.30 p.m. at a town council meeting? Um, lots more people go to the farmer's market. So uh, we're going to try and do that again. We'll let you know um, at advance notice and come and talk to us. Ask us your questions. Um, I, this, is, this is my passion. So I love being able to actually talk about it with folks who are interested. So appreciated. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you very much. And thank you, Howard, for both of you for your time and your energy this evening. Okay, we are now, what time is it? How are we doing? Okay, uh, open time for public expression. So Mayor, could we have like three minutes? We've been going for four hours. Sure. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Okay, we'll reconvene um, in three minutes. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to open the open time for public expression, which will be up to 30 minutes. And this is the time to address the council on matters that are not on the agenda. Individuals will be limited to two minutes. The council is not permitted to take action and state law strictly limits the right of the council to discuss any unagendized item unless it can be demonstrated to be of an emergency nature. If there are still raised hands after 30 minutes, open time will be continued to the end of the agenda. If you would like to speak on items not under the agenda, please raise your hand now. Okay. Uh, the first speaker is Jody Timms, followed by Lucy Mardikin. 
And Jody, you're unmuted now. Okay, good evening, Mayor, Council members, and community members, if there's still folks on. Uh, I'm Jody Timms, 30 year resident um, on Cascade Drive and chair of the Fairfax Climate Action Committee. First, I just wanted to invite everyone to drop by Good Earth this Saturday between 10 and 2 as the Fairfax Climate Action Committee and the San Anselmo Climate Action Commission will be tabling together out front. We'll have information and flyers, the climate spinning wheel, so come try your luck on a tough climate question. We'll have the portable induction burner on display and some other goodies. So um, we are, as you know, eager to both educate our community about the Fairfax 2030 Climate Action Plan and all that we individually and collectively can do to address the climate merge emergency that we're all, I'm sure, fully aware of. And also, we'd love to talk to anyone wanting to get involved in serious climate action, including those who may be interested in um, joining our committee. Our next Fairfax meeting is scheduled for August 16th, so check the town's website. Um, and just come check us out on Zoom if you're interested. I got an email on July 18th from two Westchester County, New York high school students Caitlin and Jenna, who were both members of the local climate justice Sunrise Hub, and they said, quote, we are interested in passing bans on natural gas and future buildings, and we saw that the town of Fairfax passed a similar bill last year. So our accomplishments are really inspiring activists and youth all the way to the other side of the country. I had a great conversation with these young women. Um, speaking of youth and young activists, our two summer college interns um, might be making brief, well, Lucy will be, I'm not sure um, if both of our interns are still on the call, but as you know, they've been funded by the nonprofit 350 Marin, and I would love the town to consider funding another college intern or two this next school year or possibly next summer. Um, it's been really fabulous to work with Lucy and Elise and to benefit from their perspective and their enthusiasm out about addressing the climate crisis. So I, again, just wanna thank you for your attention, uh, your consistent support and your leadership as a council and as a community. As the head of the United Nations said recently, it's either collective action or collective suicide. And uh, I suggest we go for the former. Um, the future and the present really needs all of us. One last comment because Joseph's not here for um, aging and the Commission on Aging, just to mention age-friendly Fairfax breakfast with friends is coming up at the Barefoot Cafe on August 17th at 9.30. And I wanna um, thank you, Mayor Hellman, for coming and joining us last month. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you, Jody, for everything. The next speaker is Lucy Martikin, followed by Elise and Lucy, you're unmuted now. Good evening. Uh, thanks, Jody, for that great introduction. Uh, my name is Lucy Martikin. I'm a San Anselmo resident and a college intern with 350 Marin. Firstly, I do want to thank the council members and the town for all the great work you've done to take action against the climate crisis, particularly the ordinances for all electric new construction and against gas powered landscape equipment. Working closely with San Anselmo and Fairfax's climate action committees over the past few months has opened my eyes to the importance of clean energy in our towns and the timeliness of electrification and phasing out natural gas, making a difference in the sectors that matter the most. Natural gas in our built environment accounted for 35% of Fairfax emissions as of 2020, which will continue to increase unless we stop adding to natural gas infrastructure. This means our gas stoves, our ovens, our water heaters, our grills. Our gas appliances are directly creating a health hazard by polluting the air inside of our homes. And of course, they sustain the demand for fossil gas. Transportation is even higher, 54% as of 2020. This will also continue to rise if we keep relying on gas powered cars as our primary form of transportation. I encourage everyone with the means to explore Fairfax's most recent greenhouse gas emissions report and examine how you or your home contributes to the most impactful sectors. Our state, county and town offer a wide range of resources and rebates to support our transition to all electric. Many of these can be found on the Fairfax Town website and the Fairfax Climate Action Committee's website. 
We all hear all the time that young people are the future of climate action, which is true, but people of all ages can make changes in their lives and their homes that will make a difference. I urge the town council to continue to push away from natural gas and keep prioritizing ordinances that lower our emissions and keep our air and earth clean. And I support the public to research your options, follow and get involved with your community's government actions by joining the Climate Action Committee or supporting state legislation to make electrification affordable. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Elise Jonas Delson and you're unmuted now. Um, good evening, my name is Elise Jonas Delson and I'm also a climate action planning assistant intern working with Fairfax and San Anselmo this summer. I grew up in Marin and been entering my third year at UC San Diego where I'm studying public policy and also deeply involved in organizing for a fossil free UC system. This summer, I have supported climate action in Fairfax through projects including drafting a building electrification survey, beginning an inventory of electrical vehicle charges, and creating literature for community outreach. As a young person, the climate crisis is terrifying. Even more alarming than the crisis itself is humanity's continued reliance on fossil fuels. Yet, I am also hopeful at that. By acting at the local level, we can keep our community safe and resilient while achieving a post-carbon community as outlined in the Fairfax Climate Action Plan. I'm inspired by Fairfax's leadership in climate action, particularly its landscape ordinance banning gas-powered equipment beginning next year. I'm also pleased to hear that Fairfax has replaced the gas water heaters in its building with heat pump water heaters. I urge residents to do the same. I would like to see this leadership extend to issues such as enhancing public transportation systems and adopting Marin County's green building reach codes. Beyond town council measures, it is our responsibility as community members to be climate aware in our daily lives with the understanding that we must act like our planet is on fire, because it is. I look forward to continuing to work with Fairfax and its Climate Action Committee in the next couple of months. I urge the town council and Fairfax residents to continue to treat the climate crisis as the emergency it is. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Larry Bragman, followed by Sarah E. And Larry, you're unmuted now. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Thanks a lot, Michelle. And um, <clears throat> I've been hanging on the meeting to update you guys on um, the Fairfax San Anselmo Children's Center. Um, <clears throat> so not, the meeting, by the way, has been really actually very interesting. So congratulations on putting that agenda together. So uh, we tested the hydrant uh, with Marin Fire, Marin Water District, and the school district, uh, Ross Valley, uh, probably about six to eight weeks ago. There's a a hydrant that was installed on Myrna, right, right on the edge of the driveway. And we tested the flow and we tested the water pressure. The flow uh, when it was opened up was 1500 gallons a minute with about 26 pounds per square inch of pressure, which is very good. Um, and Chief Weber was there and was very happy with that. And so that's good news for the school and the neighborhood because that's kind of a <clears throat> far end of our system. So um, we did some fire flow improvements in that neighborhood a few years ago and it tested out really well. But yeah, um, I just want to make sure I'm ca I captured that right. 1500 gallons per minute with 26 pounds of pressure. Per square inch, yeah. So it's it's it is a very robust um, connection, and you know, well within our expectations, and also confirmed by Jason Weber to be adequate to fight a fire effectively at the school and in the neighborhoods. So it's good news for the school, and it's good news for the neighborhood, especially. But <clears throat> after we did that. We also tested, excuse me, the hydrants on school property, which were less robust. So um, 
those are private hydrants. Um, they tested out at about 300 gallons a minute with adequate pressure. But um, Chief Weber explained that what they would do is they would, they, if they needed that water, they would bring in a pump um, truck and up the pressure, they would connect to those hydrants and then boost the pressure. But after we did all that, um, I asked uh, one of our engineers, a young engineer who was there, Alicia Irish, who, who lives out in the valley. Um, you know, what, Alicia, what would you do to improve the situation? And what she came up with and what um, we're working on is adding a second full hydrant at the end of the driveway to the school. So it's kind of a belt and suspenders approach because Chief Weber thinks we have adequate flow. The flow meters that we uh, used indicate we do have adequate flow. But I think for everybody's peace of mind, having that second hydrant out there really reassures folks that these kids are going to be taken care of if there's an emergency. And I just emailed uh, Jason Weber tonight and asked him if he could give me an update. And he, he got back to me right away and said, you know, there's a special fund, uh, uh, the chief's special fund, um, and they have approved funding for this second hydrant. So I think it's going to be moving forward pretty, you know, pretty quickly. It's going to take a while to get all the equipment together. And, um, you know, it may take two or three months, actually. But we are we are funded and that's moving forward. And, um, you know, you sh we should see it done, you know, this fall. Um, so it's it's all looking really good. And I just wanted to let you know, let the community know that, you know, we're taking care of the Fairfax San Anselmo Children's Center. And, you know, like I said, it's belt and suspenders, but, you know, redundancy is good and can be, you know, can be very um, helpful for uh, public safety. So that's my report. I'm staying, sticking in my lane. If anybody's got any questions, um, if not. Appreciate, appreciate that very much. Okay, Thank you, Larry. I think and appreciate your support. Thanks a lot. The next speaker is Sarah E, followed by Deborah Benson. And Sarah, you're unmuted now. Hi, my name is Kariana Edrington. We have Sasha, a Ukrainian refugee, coming to live with us. She's coming this Friday. And I was wondering if we can set up a Ukrainian flag in the center of Fairfax to welcome her. I forgot what I was gonna say. <laughs> if anybody else wants to host a Ukrainian refugee, you can go to the website Uniting for Ukraine, or you can reach out to us. Um, I want to thank the council, and I also want to thank the community for being so supportive. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is Deborah Benson, followed by Mallory. Oops. And Deborah, you're unmuted now. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Council, for hearing me. Deborah Benson, Fairfax. Um, this is part of this is going to kind of segue on to Howard's presentation. Um, about a year ago, some of the other tree committee members and I met with Vice Mayor Catrano and Perry Park and our town arborist happened by who said um, it would be a great idea to cut curbs across from the hillside there at Vreden where the water just gushes down to uh, water the redwoods and also to divert floodwaters from the creek. And so I was then in touch with the acting public works director while he was here who said he thought that would qualify for a stormwater runoff project. And um, I asked that that be, he suggested it could be put on the list of capital improvements. I asked that it be so, and I don't know what happened to it. So I'd like to know how to revive that and get that in the works because it would also cut the pollution in the creek, you know, letting the redwood grove absorb a lot instead of sending it down the street and then directly into the creek. 
Um, so if someone can guide me at some point on how to get that done, I would be really appreciative. The other thing is the lights, the LED lights. They're too equidistant from my house that light up my house like I use car lot at night. And uh, with the former town manager, I asked several times to have shades or lower bulbs put in and nothing has happened. So I would really like to know how to affect that change to get either shade so that the light is directed downward rather than outward. It affects the migratory bird patterns. It's it's really unhealthy for the planet as well as for me and anybody sitting in my living room or trying to sleep at night, I guess. So um, if I can give the numbers of the light poles, would I contact the new public works director? Again, I would like some guidance on how to achieve that. So thank you all for your work. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, the next speaker is Mallory. And you're unmuted now. Hi, uh, I'm on? Okay. Yes. So you're not gonna believe this, but for all you guys and especially Renee, I have a compliment, <laughs> not a criticism. Um, I, I love the music at Perry Park. And I just wanted to put my voice there. I came, I, I came, I guess, last Saturday at 4 p.m. It was just beautiful. And the music there has been great. And I just hope it continues. So thank you all. And the next speaker is Michael McIntosh. Oops. Thank you, yeah. Council. Um, I'm co commenting on actually an earlier comment that we heard. And what I've noticed, and I'll start with the word inculcation. And I might take um, an extra minute, I'm representing 65 people on my property. I believe that I can very clearly state that I've interacted with the police on both sides of the law more times over the last 20 years than all five of you put together. So we've had people in the creek, people that are disorientated, problems with substance abuse. Um, Mayor, if we could please pay attention, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. And all these things have come up where the police, I feel, are routinely, especially by Joe McGarry, really spoken poorly of. And the reason I use the word inculcation, when you hear it enough times, you believe it. I can tell you the compassion that I've seen at all times, and most recently was Friday. On Friday, a paramedic truck had to come out to our property and a couple of police were there to compassionately help the person to a better place. I can tell you that being around the creek, which um, I certainly look out for, that we see these issues. And so I just think it's very unfair when we continue to hear about Chief Tabaranza or Chief Morin not being compassionate, because I'll tell you that's just an incorrect statement. And I will even be forthright in saying, I did see one time that was not very compassionate, but that was back in about 2004. So, I mean, I really see this firsthand and I hope everybody that's listening and on a council realize what a great police department we have and more than anything else, how compassionate these people are even on a day-to-day -day basis. So please incorporate that in your thinking. Thank you. And the next speaker is Mark Bell. You're unmuted now. Oh, quite a long meeting. Well, let's go to social justice since you continue to read this absurd land acknowledgement thing. So let's talk about social uh, justice. So I'm trying to remember when somebody, a regular citizen, goes to the town and says, well, you know, I really need some money to do this project that I want to do. And if we keep it below this amount, I can just take that money and then we can, I can just do it, right? I don't think that's what occurs. But let's look at the cascade striping, unstriping, restriping project. It was a pretty shocking uh, development to th at least three of the council members when that occurred. And it was actually illegal. Even uh, the traffic uh, consulting firm Parisi said that you can't 
change striping patterns or traffic patterns without a detailed study, which never happened. The police were never consulted. And so what we had is, I don't know how much money, I keep asking how much money was spent on the unstriping, destriping, restriping uh, fiasco. I'm guessing it was around 65, maybe $70,000. I mean, the former town manager hired an old buddy of his to drive down here from the other side of Sacramento to do nothing, to look at the project and then drive home. So what, $65,000? What could we do with $65,000? Well, we have these homeless people who are living in our town. Do you think maybe the $65,000 could go and help them? So I think council member Goddard should repay the town the 65,000 or whatever the actual cost was for this illegal project that she carried the banner for. And I don't think people should forget that. Thank you. I see no more speakers, Madam okay. Mayor. I'm closing the open time. Madam Mayor, can I, can I make a comment really quick? Sure. I just wanted to acknowledge um, just for the public, um, you know, we're all here listening and some of us are taking notes. And so I just want to call back to our standards of conduct and just remind folks to be respectful. And um, I just experienced the, um, you know, request to look at, at the speaker through our Zoom screen as a sort of disrespectful comment. So I just wanted to just note that and remind people to, to hold this space in a in a productive and respectful uh, manner. Thanks. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Appreciate that. Okay, moving on. Um, we are on to consent and clerk. I think I need some guidance on the two separate consents. Can we do those together? I think yes. Yes, you might want to review the ten o'clock rule first, and then you could um, open. Yeah, you could hear both consent calendars together, although um, I'd appreciate a separate motion on each at the end of it all. But you could do all the public comment together and the council questions together. So, um, Mayor, I'd make, you need motion, both consents. Um, I'd make a motion that we try to continue. Yes. Second. Long one. Did you get a second on that? Um, I just seconded, but if yeah. we need it. Okay. I can do a roll call. That was motion caller second, Cutrano. Council member Ackerman. Yes. Council member Goddard. Yes. Council member Kohler. Yes. Vice Mayor Cutrano. Yes. And Mayor Hellman. Yes. Press on. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to do both consent calendars and together and comment for those together as well. And I just wanted to, before we open it up for um, the public, I just wanted to, uh, there's the consent item related to the flag of waving the, the Ukrainian flag, which we just heard from one of our younger members of the public. And this is really to, that item is to welcome the young woman of, who's 21 years old named Alexandra, who's um, arriving this Friday from Kharkiv, uh, which is the second biggest city in Ukraine and has been one of the hardest hit in the war. Um, so I just wanted to give a little bit more insight on that because the details were still coming in as we were developing the, um, the staff report. So mm -hmm. thank you for, um, listening to me on that. Um, does anyone have anything, um, before we up, open it up? Go ahead, Barbara. Um, I just have comments on a few items. I'm not interested in pulling anything. I can wait till after public comment if that makes more sense, which I think it does. Okay. Yeah, I have, I have a couple of comments as well. 
Anyone else before we open it up? Okay, let's do that, please, Michelle. Okay, uh, let me start the timer. And we have, so if you'd like to make a, a comment on either the special meeting consent calendar, which is two items, or the regular meeting consent calendar, um, which is many more items, now is the time to raise your hand. I see two hands raised. David Muller is first, followed by Michael McIntosh. And David, you're unmuted now. Great, thank you so much. Uh, good evening, Mayor Hellman, council members and staff. This is David Mahler speaking on behalf of the 50 members of the Marin Sonoma Building Electrification Squad, several of whom are residents of Fairfax. And uh, I want to comment on consent calendar item 18 on the regular calendar. Uh, and I'd like to commend staff, uh, Fairfax's Climate Action Committee and the council on its proposed response to the civil grand jury report on building electrification. Uh, Fairfax is the third jurisdiction to come forward with its draft response to that report. And I can tell you it's the strongest by far of the three of being supportive. Uh, it seems very consistent with Fax Fairfax's leadership on greenhouse gas reduction and building electrification. And we'd like to commend you and uh, encourage you to keep up the great work on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Fairfax is an inspiration to the other jurisdictions in the county and uh, great work. Carry on. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. And the next speaker is Michael McIntosh and you're unmuted now. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I'm requesting that the council pull off of the consent calendar number four, which is the discussion about the hybrid meetings and how we're doing that. I think that that set a good precedent since some are in public and some are not. And I think there's great value public meetings as well as number 13. So if you could please, I'm sorry, yeah, 13. If you would please pull those off so we have an opportunity to discuss those, I would appreciate it. So again, number four and number 13, thank you. And the next speaker is uh, Joe McGarry, followed by Mark Bell. Joe, you're unmuted now. Thank you, Michelle. Um, yeah, I, I would like to, to speak about the, um, the Ukrainian flag and um, not, I think it's, it's a wonderful gesture and I really enjoyed the, the previous call and um, welcoming, um, you know, someone who's, who's coming from what's happening in Ukraine is, is such an incredible gesture. And I, but I think he, seeing it here on the agenda, my first reaction and, and some of the, you know, what's gone on um, in, in reading about Ukraine and, and looking at other horrible situations across the globe, um, you know, and, and it just, here we are, we're, I think we're at our, our two, two year anniversary almost of the year of Fair, uh, in Fairfax um, committing to be a more anti-racist town. And you know, the, the, the genocide in Tigray has been going on for 20 months now and um, half a million people have died. Um, and, and not to like compare losses of lives or um, anything like, but it's been largely ignored, you know, by, by the news media, um, you know, in aid, we've sent $313 million to Tigray um, over 20 months, 1.3 billion to the Ukraine. And that's not even speaking of 8 billion in, in military aid that's gone. And so just wanna like, and, and the outpour of white Americans like who, who, have you know really identified with you know Ukrainians and, and it's really triggered an empathy that just doesn't seem to be possible um, for Tigranians. So I just just want to call it out and acknowledge it, you know, and as we we commit to be more anti-racist, that that it is happening. And uh, and I hope um, we we maybe make some space. We've got a Haitian community here in town. We've got folks from Nicaragua, 
um, and El Salvador and Mexico who all plead horrible situations. So maybe we can go back and hold space for Alexandra, but maybe also hold space for some of those stories of those folks who fleed violence to come here. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Mark Bell and you're unmuted now. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, I'd like to see number 13 fold, uh, not necessarily because I have an issue with it, but as I've mentioned before, we keep seeing you have one shot to talk about an item uh, and then it, for the second reading, it ends up on the consent calendar, and that's the end of discussion. A lot of times when you, you make your comments after public comment, because before you used to give some idea of what you were thinking, listen to public comment, and then make your final decisions. Now if public comment comes, you make your, your comments Sometimes your comments are incredibly off the wall. And if you're gonna to continue to put things onto the consent calendar that should be brought forth before the community, then how is that transparent government working? People don't get a second shot to discuss something. Maybe they researched it more. Maybe uh, ideas that you have that you've stated after public comment are totally incorrect and someone has the, the information to correct you. But you don't have, you don't, you're not giving the community the opportunity to do that. You have 17 items, 18 items on this consent calendar. I don't even see the other consent calendar. So what's that, five seconds an item? If someone wanted to comment on everything? I don't understand how that's representative government. Who are you representing? You're definitely not representing the people of this town. You refuse to pull anything that you don't feel like you want to pull when people in the public want to make some comment about it. That's all I have to say. Thank you. I see no more public speakers, Madam Mayor. All right, thank you. you want to close right, Robert, did you want to go ahead with your comments? Sure. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I have a comment on, uh, on four items. Number six is the minutes, and I'd already provided a few um, edits to our clerk prior, and she has made some changes to the minutes that are not substantive. And then on um, item 15, which is the response to the grand jury report. Again, I provided these prior to Sean and our town manager. Um, one of the things I would like to point out, and normally we just prepare responses to what we're asked, the findings and the responses, but there's actually kind of a glaring error in the report. Um, which is they made some comment about PG&E being 85% GHG free and made some sort of offhand comment about MCE having 100% uh, renewable programs. And what I provided, Sean, and I asked that we provide a clarification to the report is that um, the utilities are measured on um, renewable content, GHG renewable content. And just to be clear, um, the reason why PG&E is about 85% GHG free is because quite a bit of theirs is in uh, Diablo Canyon nuclear. And MCE does not participate in that. MCE is about 95% GHG free. But basically what I'm saying is let's send the power content label. Uh, the base plan for um, renewables for PG&E is about 31%. The base plan, which is uh, light green in MCE is 61% uh, renewable and is growing higher. And we have two programs for 100% renewable deep green, which is just a little bit more expensive. Um, 
PG&E has a couple of programs, one that is 50% and one that is 100%, quite a bit more expensive. But I think we should provide that clarification because I think the grand jury does excellent work, but I don't think they did their homework in this part that well. And the other part I'd like to say, in our response to R2, um, we talk about the schedule for bringing the um, the model reach code to the council. And it looks like the model reach code based on the response will be done about the end of August. And then there's some outreach to some groups, not necessarily the community as a whole. And I think it's a little, I think we ought to add a month to that just to be realistic. We need to do a little more outreach. And I know the group is doing excellent work, but you can't do outreach in a week and a half and then expect us to take that up. So I think it's all good. And I would just say that we add a, a month to that just to make it more realistic. Uh, my other comments is on items 16 and 17. And the comment for both of those is, I believe uh, the county and Fairfax declared a state of emergency uh, back in 2019. And I've asked our town manager if we think there's FEMA reimbursement for some or all of that storm damage work. And she thought there was. So I think in the future going forward on these kinds of things, if there is any potential reimbursement, that should be in the fiscal impact um, for both, because I think that helps us. And the other piece I wanted to add, but somehow I've lost my papers, is for item, uh, oh, item 17 on uh, Reedon Road. On the resolution, it does not have the dollar amount in the whereas is, which is done for 378 Scenic. I think if we're adopting this, we should have the dollar amounts in the whereas. And then um, if we do have a CIP project number, there should be a whereas as well. So to make it clear what we're doing, but definitely the dollar amount, which I have my notes, but I'm not sure I know what that is. I think it was 200,000 so, or 240, I'm not sure. Those are my comments. And I wanna thank Sean Yura for all his work on um, all his uh, items. There were three items, so great work. Thank you. All really valuable. Thank you, Barbara. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, um, and, and great comments, Councilmember Kohler. Uh, I had uh, three quick comments on consent. Um, the first is to just acknowledge um, the Open Space Committee and uh, specifically Jack Judkins and Susan Pascal Baran, the, the vice chair and the chair of that committee, as well as our town attorney and her firm for helping us really get through this process for these Upper Ridgeway parcels um, through the tax default sale process. Um, I'm glad that we're finally at this, this moment here. I know it's been something that's been discussed on the Open Space Committee since I joined it. Um, so thank you uh, to everyone involved in that. And also uh, just wanted to give a huge kudos to our town manager, Heather Abrams, for uh, helping us locate uh, uh, director of Public Works, um, and this is sort of a really exciting moment that we're continuing to to build the team here. And I think uh, we've seen the benefits of two interims, uh, and now a, a third consulting firm that's helping us out with Pat Eccles. And uh, yeah, I think we we ain't seen nothing yet. I think it's about to get a whole lot better uh, having a, a full time director of Public Works. So thank you so much, Heather, for your hard work trying to recruit. Folks, we know the market is is not um, forgiving. It's pretty difficult out there right now. So thank you for that. And then shout out to all the staff for all the, it's so cool to see all these different staff reports. And I think I was really happy to take a look at Michael's financials always, but for the members of the public, like this, this financial, the June financials, it's month 12 of 12. So you get to see what we budgeted for and what actually came through and, and how, uh, 
how accurate we were with certain things and where we overshot in certain parts of the budget in the last fiscal year. And it's just a good way to orient ourselves um, to what's going on in the town. So I just encourage people to take a look at item five, but thank you. Very good, thank you, Chance. Go ahead, Renee. Yeah, thank you. Just a couple thank yous. Um, lots of thank yous all around tonight, but uh, just wanted to acknowledge um, and thank Mallory uh, for stepping back up onto the Affordable Housing Committee. Um, much appreciate your service. Um, and I also acknowledge um, that we received the quarterly um, financial report on the Department of Recreation's um, uh, activities uh, from April through June. Um, I urge folks to take a look at all that the uh, rec department is doing. This is submitted by Ann Manis, um, and they're doing an extraordinary number of things um, for a small staff um, and providing great service to the community. Um, and last thank you goes to, um, last but not least, um, Sean, it's a, such a pleasure to see an actual climate action report and see all the things that are going on. I was kind of blown away and I've known them all one by one, piece by piece, but wow, this is, uh, this is huge growth and great news for the town. So um, yeah, just thanks, comments of thanks. Thank you. Go ahead, Bruce. Uh, I'll make it very brief because everything has already been said, but I just wanted to <laughs> add my thanks for all of those things and for all of the staff's great work, but in particular, congratulations to, to the whole town for acquiring that open space finally, and, uh, and also uh, the, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but thank you. Good job, and and yeah, the uh, the hiring of the potential hiring of the new public works director is really a big thing. So good, thank you. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I just want to echo a lot of what has already been shared. I appreciate everybody's um, comments. My my notes are to thank you, Sean. I am so excited to see the details and all the all the, that you did to stand up this rebate program, um, and just let us know how we can support that from a communication standpoint and from the climate action committee standpoint. And I just thank you for that, as well as the robust update. I I too was totally impressed with that. And then my note for the open space item 18 says, yay, thank you everyone involved. <laughs> I'm really, really grateful. Um, I know that was a long, a long uh, effort. And, and Vice Mayor, since I am out of town, we don't wanna hold that one up at all. If you could uh, do the honor of signing that, which I feel is very appropriate anyway, given um, all your time with that committee. Um, I would I would greatly appreciate it. Absolutely. Go ahead, Renee. Can I, one final thing, um, and this is something that um, member of the public asked. Um, in terms of number four and um, our hybrid or in person meetings and how we're deciding on those, I think it would be really useful. And actually, a member of the community. Um, asked me, how do we know and how are we deciding whether we're in person, there's been changes back and forth. And I just think for the public, I don't know if Heather or Janet, you might explain, we do this resolution every month, which gives us flexibility, but how can the public know um, or depend on whether we are gonna come back in person and what are those factors um, in making that decision? Do you think we could just get a quick rundown on that? Or maybe we are able to let the public know we will be in person the month prior, or is this all COVID ups and downs um, dependent? Yeah, it's based on COVID. Um, it's a health risk assessment. And so um, we have been experiencing, you know, significant spikes in um, COVID and we, we do have COVID, you know, within our organization. So we want to be careful and protect the public as well as our um, uh, staff and council members. 
So that decision is, is basically being made in-house and we pass this resolution at each meeting, giving us the flexibility to make either decision based on what's happening in the moment COVID-wise. Is that accurate? Yes, yeah. okay. that's right. Okay, thank can you. I, can I just add that these are public meetings and even though people, we'd all like to be one-on-one -on -one and see each other and so, but they still are very public meetings and we have a great turnout. So it may feel unsatisfactory, but I think we all know, I know at least 10 people with COVID right now. <laughs> and um, so we're trying to be safe. That's right. And we can't always make the decisions, you know, a month in advance because things change. Right. I just thought clarity and then I by no means meant to imply that this wasn't a public meeting. I just wanted to help the public understand how we're making the decisions. Yeah, I, I know four more people with COVID now than I knew with COVID all the way through the rest of the pandemic. So it's yeah. just roaring through. It's not killing people, but it's still a serious thing and it's just really contagious in every way. So, yeah, you just got to be careful. Okay, can I have a go ahead? <laughs> I, I, that, Madam Mayor, I was going to make a motion to uh, move the consent calendar both for the regular meeting and the special meeting that we're holding concurrently. I could second that, but with a friendly amendment for item 17, that the resolution be amended to at minimum include the dollar figure, which is $240,000. And if possible, if we have a, a CIP number to add a whereas for that. Will you accept that friendly amendment? I guess, yeah, of course, of course, thank you. Can I have a second? Second. I, Barbara second. I did the second. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> it's almost 2 a.m. here. <laughs> and, uh -oh. Um, here's the clerk. Did you want to include yes. the, the supplement that was added? Yes. Yeah, that was in the motion. Oh, it was. I didn't yeah. hear that. And I seconded that, town mm -hmm. clerk. Okay. And okay, this is the, um, the regular consent calendar and? Uh, yes. Can we do one for the special? Okay. I, I well, did say both, can, the ones that were taken concurrently. Yes. Okay. I guess... Janet, are you good with one motion for both meetings? If you are, I'm fine. I think you requested uh, to have two separate motions, but yeah. it's all unanimous, so. Okay, well, let's see. I'll do a roll call vote. Okay. <laughs> well, I didn't hear any opposition, so. Okay, all right. Uh, Council Member Goddard. Yes. Council Member Ackerman. Yes, to both consent calendars. Council Member Kohler? Yes. Vice Mayor Cutrano? Yes. And Mayor Hellman? Yes. Thank motion you. passes unanimously for both meeting consent calendars. Thank you. Thank you. Public hearing item number 19 is continued to September 7th. Moving on to the regular agenda, item 20. Introduce an ordinance of the town of Fairfax adding chapter 5.58 entitled Parklets to Title V of the Fairfax Town Code. Introduce an ordinance of the town of Fairfax amending town code chapter 12.32 to include separate processes for granting encroachment permits for residential structures for commercial parklet structures amending section 12.32.020 to regulate only residential structures and adding section 12.32.025 to regulate commercial structures and amending chapter 17.096. Section 17.096.040 and chapter 17.0. 100, section 17.100040 to allow parklets as permitted 
use in parklet enclosures with an encroachment permit issued by the Public Works Department for commercially developed properties in the CH and CC zone districts and adopt a resolution of the town of Fairfax adopting parklet standards and find it exempt from CEQA pursuant to sections 15060C2 and 15060C3 of title 14 of the California Code of Regulations. And with that, Heather, do you wanna take it away? Well, first of all, Mayor, I want to congratulate you on reading what might be the <laughs> longest title in history. Um, I, if you don't mind, I do have three slides if you'd like to see them. Sure. Of course you do. I think I have three slides here. I'm not seeing them now on my list. Neither are we. Would you like me to show them? Please. Yes, manager. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, coming right up. Let's see. Hmm. I'll, I'll start talking while, while Michelle is kindly helping me out there. Thank you. Um, so as you know, um, uh, the Parklet program was started in, there you go, um, was started during the pandemic in Fairfax and um, at the June 15th meeting, um, you discussed this and that brings us up to date now. Um, uh, I had been calling them outdoor dining and I'm now call back to calling them um, parklets because um, at that June 15th meeting, um, the council um, made clear their intention to expand that program to include um, both um, public and private parklets, if you will. Um, so those that would be used for, you know, food service um, and would be sort of the exclusive use of um, the business and those that would be public. And, you know, you could bring your coffee from anywhere or um, lunch from home or whatnot and use at any time, even if the business was not open. Um, and then also to include um, merchandise, so retail there. Um, so we took the um, ordinance back and updated it. Um, we also um, gained an interim planning director in, in that time, and he's been very helpful in um, making sure that the um, ordinances and resolution um, are uh, all consistent and up to date and um, also added some um, language and specificity to the standards, which um, you saw as a supplement that came out. Um, so that's where we are today. And then um, the council also um, updated the um, extension for the current um, uh, parklets that are out there. Um, so the next milestones in terms of time frame um, for them are a check-in at the um, September 30th, and then um, the current extension allows them to um, continue until um, December 15th, and at that time they would need to be rebuilt to the to the standards that are part of this packet. And the next, uh, if, next slide, please. Um, so the next, um, thank you. So the next thing to do is um, to, uh, um, you know, if you're comfortable to approve um, these ordinances tonight, and then we would come back for a second reading. And in that second reading meeting, we would also then um, propose the um, fees for permits and for rental costs of using that space for those private um, uh, parklets. And so you'll see this is the list um, of um, summary of direction that um, we got from council about what these new standards should have. And um, they do now include um, roofs, so fixed coverings um, that could provide shade or um, rain cover, as long as they were not, you know, um, hiding other businesses. Um, they maintain um, only electric heaters um, would be allowed, and, um, and then the fee structure will um, recognize that there are both public and private um, 
types of parklets. And there's also now retail allowed. Um, next slide, please, Michelle. That's just continuation of this list. And you've seen this before, but this just shows you the, um, the updates that we did. Um, and so um, I'd like to open it up to questions and um, we, we can also call on David um, if we have specific questions because he's definitely brought a new level of um, expertise to this. Uh, I sorry, I can't see who has their hand up and who. Oh, um, Michelle, can we? I'll take that. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> okay. And I don't know who had their hand up first, so I'll just start with Councilmember Gardner. Um, okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, th this is sort of a question. It was going to be a comment, but David has this expertise. And so I really wanted to ask you um, I'm struggling with the definitions and the naming. And as you um, referred to Heather, that we were calling them outdoor dining and then you went back to parklets because we have this public private sort of component, which uh, I appreciate you all fleshing out and bringing back to us. Um, but I am feeling like um, we might be best served by creating a more, uh, more definition and differentiation and so my hope was that we might call the outdoor dining streeteries, the outdoor retail shoplets, and then save and reserve parklets for what we're talking about in terms of this public space, publicly accessible. And that's based on some definitions that I looked up um, that are more common definitions for parklet. Um, I got it from the National Association of City Transportation. Um, so do you have thoughts on pros, cons to doing that. I just don't want this all to become a big mess and everybody calls everything parklets and really, so is there, is it worth further defining? Councilmember Goddard, if I could, my sense is that parklet is pretty well defined in many communities. And I think the idea really is to Look at the parklet as an extension of the sidewalk uh, into and further into the public realm and that it could be used for dining. It could be used for other commercial activities as well. So I think the, the word parklet really fits what I think you're trying to achieve here. And in the, in the ordinances that are before you, you're looking not only at outdoor dining, but also looking at potentially outdoor retail and other commercial activities. So I think kind of grouping those commercial activities into the parklet definition, which is really an extension of the sidewalk into the public realm, I think works well. And, and I think it's a very, very common term that most people coming into the community wanting to do business in the community uh, or people in the community would recognize. So I would, I would suggest staying with parklet. Okay, I, I can I, and I appreciate that. And um, I'm tending to agree, but I, I was struck by the definition that states that parklets are public seating platforms that convert curbside parking spaces into vibrant community spaces, also known as street seats or curbside seating. And so in the foundation of the parklet program and then where it was, uh, originated from in parking day in San Francisco, it really had to do, and the focus was really primarily on um, public space. Right. Whereas what we're doing with outdoor dining is not public space. It's use of the public space for a, with a permit for a fee. So I just was wanting to nip this one in the bud before we went forward with you know parklet all over the titles of the ordinances and things. But I will defer if you really believe that that's you know the best definition. I, I would suggest it's it's the best definition for what you're you're trying to achieve, and I think it's you know it's a recognized term. So I would I would suggest staying with parklet. Clear. Thank you. 
I don't know. I think Vice Mayor, I think you were next. Yeah, and that actually helped with my comment too, I guess for me. And David, maybe you could tell me if this is a fair characterization, but like sticking with Parklet instead of breaking it into all of these other catchphrases, um, what we're really at the end of the day differentiating, especially with the two real material changes from our the last time we gave direction on this, which is now there could be retail and then also that there might be a tiered fee structure depending on you know if you're sponsoring something that might be more public or whether it's for private outdoor dining um but there's the real differentiation is that there there could be a public parklet mm -hmm. and there might and then there are private parklets that might be used solely for the purpose of you know service for a particular shop uh and the parklets right in front of their shop is that a fair characterization of the the distinction and the and why we stay with the word parklet they're just two different types of parklets that we're talking about with different types of uses yes i, I would agree with that and and in terms of just community building the the idea of parklets really is to create that or help create that vibrant community space and and so um well, you know, Councilmember Goddard, you were talking about community space, but the whole concept of parklets is really to try to create that vibrancy uh, in your public realm and, and that spirit. So I, I think it does that. I think the, the parklet term would work. And, and I understand the distinction between private and public. I think that it's something that we'll need to talk about a little bit more internally in terms of developing that fee structure and defining it uh, more clearly as we would come back to, to council with that fee structure. So that is something I think we need to do. Great, thank you. And I, I completely agree that there are positive externalities for even the private dining, you know, even if it's not publicly accessible all the time. So yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Council member Kohler. You're on mute. Sorry, right, I thought I unmuted. Um, I want to add to that, but then I do have one question. Um, you know, way back when we started this, uh, we had John Bella, who's an expert in all this stuff. And I think Renee's referring to some of the, the expert terms. But as things have evolved, I am very much in agreement with David that. Um, for the more generic term, which most people relate to, um, I think we are good staying with this generic term and, and um, people will understand that. Even though people that are really embedded in the field, they say, wait a minute, that's a little different. So I think for purposes of clarity, it makes sense. And I like what David said about, it's really an extension of, the sidewalk, and that's what it is. Um, just one question for you, David. Um, I have some comments later, but um, I believe we talked about, and maybe this is for Heather, we talked about not having music, outdoor music on the parklets, and I didn't see that in the list. Is that something that we missed or? Um, Wait, when did we talk about music? I um, I believe we talked, well, how many times have we talked about this? I have no idea. And it's been a lot, but I remember talking about not having music on the parklets and outdoor music. And I thought that was something that we gave us direction. I could be totally wrong. No, I, I personally would remember that. I. Music hasn't been in the scope of our discussions to my recollection. And yes, like, it was like, yeah. Except the the parking lot next to Gestalt, that was. Yeah, the planning commission actually sent that in their resolution to us, um, but we haven't um, talked about it specifically as a council. Okay, I think Heather was going to say one thing. Um, I my recollection is that it came up at the planning commission and that the council didn't make a decision about that. Okay, maybe we can talk about that later. Thank you. 
if I could, through the mayor, ask a question. In, in terms of the, the code in Fairfax, and this may be uh, a question for the town attorney, is it required to obtain a permit for music outdoors? So say for downtown uh, in the commercial districts, if somebody wanted to perform, is, is it required that they first obtain a permit in order to do that? I mean, the casual guitar player, not so, but if it's more formal, is there a requirement for a permit uh, for music like that? And I don't believe there is, but I'd have to double check to make sure. I know that we have music at the farmer's market, mm -hmm. uh, outdoor music at the farmer's market. I don't believe they're required to have a permit for that, but I would have to double check to make sure. Okay, thank you. Council Member Ackerman. Yeah, um, just a, as far as the, the discussion about the public versus private uses, uh, I, I'll throw in my agreement. I think we're all pretty unanimously in favor of supporting, if we can, more public parklets. But, uh, but I, what it sounds like, and this also kind of applies to the music, it seems to me that what we're looking at tonight is more the architectural level of what these physically would have to look like in order to be safe, in order to not impede traffic, and that sort of thing and not necessarily the uses of them, uh, that's, that's kind of a separate issue. So I've, I'm comfortable with not resolving all of those questions tonight. Um, the, there were just two things. One of them is hardly worth mentioning, but uh, what I'm seeing is that the, uh, the staff report goes into actually a fair amount of detail and then the the supplement that we received later that uh, I understand you, David, did a significant amount of work on uh, is, yeah, I really like it because it's very nice and clean and simple. So uh, the two questions that had come up to me as I was reading the staff report kind of went away when I read the supplement. One of those was a, a mention about portable electric heaters uh, in the staff report, I would strike the word portable, but that that is not uh, not referred to in the in the actual um, in the actual rules that we're looking at tonight. So that that question goes away. The other one was that, um, and I'm not sure exactly where it is right now, but in the staff report, I, I recall something about the uh, the roofs that we've decided to allow, there was a lot of public comment that it was it was uh, would not work to not have roofs because in the winter it might rain and in the summer it gets hot. So we decided to allow them, but there was something about the roofs being transparent. And maybe I got that wrong, but that's something I recall reading and it, it kind of triggered in my mind that you a transparent roof is gonna, not gonna do anything to block the sun, it might even concentrate it. So in the actual, uh, the actual rules that we're looking at um, in the supplement, it says it a little more generically that, that they are permitted, roofs or overhead shade structures are permitted only if they permit visibility to and from the street. Um, so that seems like a more generic way to say it. Um, so that's, it's always kind of unclear to me whether I'm, whether to ask a question at this point or whether to wait till after public comment, but I thought I'd just try to get that clarified about the roof that um, we're not saying that it would have to be like a transparent plastic roof. It could be a roof that was some somehow did block the sun or could block the sun, but with attention to not having a roof that's going to block the view, which is what people have, have expressed uh, concern about. Do, do you have any clarification on that? I do. And I really appreciate the fact that you brought that up because in, in looking at <clears throat> direction and then uh, working with the town manager and developing the design standards, you know, I had a question really, uh, your question and concern maybe is that in terms of a purely translucent roof material, um, you know, the sun would penetrate 
And as I look at, say, a flat, slightly tilted corrugated metal, let's say, roof material that is reflective, but wouldn't necessarily block a building or visibility to a building, but provide protection, it, it seemed to me that the intent was really to make sure that the roof, in terms of its design and material, wasn't blocking the adjacent building or visibility to a business. Mm -hmm. But the idea of a translucent, flat or slightly tilted pitched roof, um, I guess I personally had concerns with translucent uh, for the same reasons that I'm thinking you're mentioning as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilmember Ackerman. So in, in terms of the design standards, the idea really would be to have a roof structure that would provide protection as I think desired, and at the same time, not block visibility to a building. Um, I can fully understand that, but it, it wouldn't necessarily need to be translucent unless council directs that it should be translucent. If you're directing that it should be translucent, we can certainly add that in, but um, it doesn't say that right now. And I think um, it's very good that you brought that up. Uh, you know, we would appreciate clarification on that. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Well, that, this is a point for questions, so I'll leave it at okay. that. And we, if we wanna discuss it further, thank we you. can do so after we've heard from the public. Thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you all. Uh, let's open the public comment, please. Okay. Members of the public wishing to comment on this item, please raise your hand now and turn on the timer. So the first speaker is Deborah Benson, followed by Mallory. And Deborah, you're unmuted now. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, council members, for hearing me. Deborah Benson, Fairfax, Cascade Drive. Um, I appreciate these parklets, this this uh, private use of public space during the you know the hard days of the pandemic, but I think it's time for them to be over. I think they make our downtown look really kind of junky. Um, I think they're they're uh, compromising our safety uh, in terms of roofs. Uh, San Francisco does not allow roofs. Novato does not allow roofs. San Anselmo does not allow roofs. And in San Francisco, it's the fire department says that they can't get their ladders up against the building if they need to, because the roofs project over, over the space that they need. Um, the, the, uh, the, the structures that are at the corners and going back from the intersections are in violation of, of the uh, vehicle code. They're also in violation of the um, evacuation route design guidance published December 23rd, 2020. Bolinas Road is uh, our primary evacuation route for 2,500 people. When I come down, I, uh, I, that is my evacuation route um, to the intersection of Bolinas and uh, Broadway. If there is even a box truck turning from Broadway onto Bolinas, I have to get over as close as I can to a parked car. If there's a fire truck, I have to stop in, you know, before the intersection. So I think by allowing these, especially, you're compromising our safety, putting us in danger. And I am totally against continuing this. Um, that's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Mallory followed by PJ Pfeffer. Mallory, you're unmuted now. Okay, um, I agree with everything that Deborah just said. Um, the the sake place, um, Village Saki, the roastery, they're too wide, they're too closed in. You can't see it completely makes the the makes the um, street be constricted uh, visually. I think it's pretty dangerous. There's usually a line outside of the sake place and it's too, it's just not enough room, especially I think for somebody with, in a wheelchair to get by. I just think it's dangerous. I think Frads is doing the right thing. I think Fairfax is doing the right thing. Um, these are not, when they're roofs, I don't, 
I don't think that's part of the parklet definition. These are little huts, they're closed in. I don't think it's doing very, very good with the COVID to have people sitting inside um, three walls and just keeping one open that's facing the, the uh, restaurant. So I'm, I'm against the, 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 the roastery doesn't need to be as wide as it is. And um, I, I'm also against the roofs. So um, the, the ones next to the, the uh, grab house, whatever, whatever it's called this, this year, um, the sausage place is fine, you know, up, up in that alley, but the rest of them, um, no, I'm not in favor of it. Um, across, across the Francis Drake, they, they just have tables outside. That's great also. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm with Deborah on this one. Thank you. Thank you. And the next speaker is PJ Pfeffer. You are unmuted now. Hey, thank you. Uh, I don't want to comment on uh, all of the aspects of the, the parklet debate. I uh, just wanted to focus on um, one issue in reading through the draft ordinance that was part of the resolution and all the design standards. Um, I didn't see anything specifically about um, signage designating what is a public versus private parklet. Um, you know, my, my main focus on this whole uh, issue has just been giving up public space for private use. And my concern would be that uh, somebody applies for a public parklet so that there are no uh, related fees and then just sort of you know, puts down their table settings on every table there or something, or, or, you know, does something to stop any sort of public use and, and nobody questions it otherwise. Um, uh, I also think it, you know, having some sort of designation of what is and isn't a public versus private parklet would help to uh, avoid any potential conflicts that may arise from people arguing over who's allowed to be where. Uh, that's it, thanks. Thank you. I see no other hands. Oh, nope. I see one. Okay. Mark Bell, you are unmuted now. As far as the music goes, yeah, the discussion and the recommendation from the Planning Commission was no music amplified outside. I totally agree with that, and that should be put in there. We on Dominga are consistently bombarded by everything. I guess you have to be on the town council to get, you know, noise bothers you. That's how you get something done, like John Reed and generators. Um, the other thing is, as far as the farmer's market goes, that was brought up. They are allowed to have someone perform music. There are no drums or no percussion allowed. Uh, they don't do a particularly good job of monitoring their volume. However, they had to have that written into their permit. Uh, and as far as um, Village Saki, they took off or they at least semi unenclosed their space. Still hard to see what's going on. It's still like a giant box car. And I saw that the height was what, 42 inches for a wall. Is that taken into account? Somebody in a wheelchair going on mono onto Bolinas? who wants to go across because it is a legal place to cross. Is that going to give them enough visibility? I don't think so. I mean, it has to be clear. You have to be able to see clearly what's going on. And with the way they have the bottom part, you can't. It's like a giant block. And as I said before, someone's going to get killed, and then maybe you'll do something about it. But I really don't think that for such a progressive town, we need to wait for someone to get killed. Village Saki, too big, too boxy, is a safety hazard and definitely needs to be changed. And as far as music, I want it written in, no music. And I'd like to have a fee schedule because I'd like to see what we're charging. Retail space right now is about $25 a square foot. A parklet's about 200 square feet.
Thank you. you. Oh, sorry. I see no further hands. Madam Mayor, if you want to close the public yes, comment. Yes, let's close the public comment. Open comment. Okay. Barbara has her hand raised. Go ahead. Okay. So I have a few comments on item 20 on the first piece, not the supplement. And I have a couple comments on the supplement. So, um, and I provided these prior to staff. Um, so looking at the ordinance attachment A, uh, the fourth whereas is completely incorrect. It has uh, the prior resolution, but it has the wrong date. Instead, um, we should use the correct whereas, which says, whereas on July 6, 2022, the town council adopted resolution number 22-53, extending the expiration date for all outdoor dining TEPs and TUPs to December 15, 2022. And um, so that whereas is something old that actually had the wrong information in it as well. Okay, moving on to attachment A, page three. Um, this may not be popular. I know that staff were trying to react to what was requested about public parklets. My concern about including this definition is I would delete it. Um, I think this would be abused so that people do not have to pay for the encroachment permit and would not have to store their tables or chairs or their other thing. Um, I think that a lot of people will say it's for public use and it really won't be. I mean, the scoop did a parklet several years ago, way before Renee and I were on the council, and that's a true parklet. And I don't believe they would be caught up in this. But the other thing about um, parklets potentially with stuff in them, uh, they could be a refuge area for drug dealing or other crime. So I would prefer that we delete the public parklet idea um, and Potentially, if someone comes to us with that, there might be a way to put in some language that allows a case-by-case -case basis. But I do think it will be terribly abused. Okay, moving on to page three of attachment five. Not sure where I am. Uh, I think it's attachment. I think it's still an attachment. A, I think I wrote something wrong. Uh, page three, where, oh, okay, I'm sorry. It's, it's attachment A, uh, section 5.58050. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've got myself mixed up. Um, there is a section that talks about, and I can't find it right now. The licensing, it's 5.58.030, and it says under E, only licensed establishments may serve alcoholic beverages in the parklet area. I think we should be clear that that licensed establishments by um, alcohol beverage ABC. And the other thing, um, right now ABCs allows uh, alcohol in something outside the establishment, they may change that. So I think we should have some language as long as it's still allowed by the ABC. And then on um, Oh, I'm done with that part. Um, and even though I think at some point we should probably discuss outdoor music. I agree with council member Ackerman that right now we're talking about design issues. And so I don't think it's a good idea for us to go into that discussion at this point. 
um, moving on to the supplement, which is the uh, resolution, I just have a couple of things for the design. Um, on page seven of this kind of booklet type thing, um, the diagram still says outdoor dining structure and we should change that to parklet. You know, we, we go back and forth. And then on page five and six of that um, document, it talks about parklet design and maintenance. And I had provided this earlier and I'm providing it again. Uh, there's something from the San Anselmo uh, parklet guidance that talks about flood safety. And I'll just quote it here. I did provide this to staff so they can look into it later. Flood safety, platforms must be designed and anchored. Well, I wouldn't say anchoring because I know we don't want that. To prevent flotation, collapse, or lateral movement due to water action, including hydrodynamic and hydrostatic loads and buoyancy. If located in a flood zone, platforms must be designed to allow water to flow through the area utilizing materials such as hog wire or other materials that may be removed during high flood risk rain events. And then it goes on to say the platform and associated improvements must comply with FEMA flood regulations and allow for the free flow of water in the roadway. It's probably a shorter way to write that, but remember in 2005, 2006, we had a flood that went down Linus Avenue that um, that could happen again. And so we need to make sure that those platforms allow water flow through. And I, I know there was an attempt to do something like that, but I'd like us to flash that out a little bit. And then on page 13, where it talks about heaters, um, the electric heaters, what I would like to see is a little bit more on the safety, such as um, it just says electric heaters are allowed and must comply with all safety requirements. I'm not sure if that covers the idea of making sure that any cords are out of the way or taped down. So I think we should flesh that out some and those are all my comments. So thank you very much for your patience and listening. Thank you, Barbara. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I thought those comments were great. I don't have a lot of um, comments myself. Um, I, I really appreciate the work that's been done to date on this. Um, it's been a long process here, but pretty exciting. Uh, I. Just in response um, to Councilmember Kohler's comments, I I agree with the ABC. I don't know if we need to have like qualifiers or if you know ABC licenses would only be given to a business if they're um, in compliance with ABC's protocols. So I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm open to either way, but I don't know if if it's necessary to add qualifiers um, with regard to the definition of the public parklet and whether or not to just outright delete that. Um, I, I'm opposed to that. Uh, and I think um, what, what I do wonder is whether or not we waive all costs associated or if it's discounted. Um, I think uh, what I've seen in San Francisco is the, the approaches to discount uh, that, but to still, a sponsor would still pay something because um, it's still sort of like those structures are still magnets uh, to the community, you know, within the community. Um, so it does support business. So there's a, a reason or an incentive to actually sponsor one. And simultaneously, it is the use of um, a, a public space so that the discounted version is like the sort of public private partnership, like you're removing this this parking space that could otherwise potentially generate revenue in some other capacity, but simultaneously, like there's a public good. So we're trying to find a middle ground there as opposed to a fully private parklet where there's, where there's outdoor dining or something where it's like, there's a, a higher rate. 
Um, just a suggestion there. I, I, that is a kind of a can of worms because it's like, how do you determine what the the discount rate is or the, but um, yeah, I, I am supportive of the keeping the public parklet thing in there. I think that's what we had talked about at the last meeting. And there are a couple of folks that are eager to try that out. And I think some of those structures are already well suited to that format and are kind of open in, in the evenings and open throughout the day. And um, there, haven't, there haven't been any issues there. So I uh, just wanted to add that to the discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Councilmember Goddard. Yeah, actually, just to add to that is um, I think the way we might be able to um, keep the public parklet concept alive here is to really talk about, and David, you mentioned that we would need to sit down and talk about what kind of fee schedule based on the public private. Um, yeah, and that will take some fleshing out, but we could also talk about what features would then be um, would would accompany a public private partnership here because let's say um, Barbara I hear your point about we don't want furniture left out all over the place but if you did something like a built-in bench on one side of the of the parklet um, and a place where public could convene. And then the other side was a few tables that were set up for that particular business or that particular retail. Um, you could, you would have that furniture affixed so it wouldn't be willy nilly all over the place. And then the chairs and the table would have to be stowed um, neatly as if it were in a private dining. So I think there's, there's ways to do it. It would be really a shame to, to take away this um, public parklet concept, which I think is critical to community building and to the use of um, you know, public space downtown. So um, I would appeal to the council to um, let that be developed a little bit more so that we can see how to avoid some of what I think your concerns are, Barbara. Thank you. Councilmember Ackerman. Um, yeah, so I I agree uh, with what Renee and, and Chance just said about the continuing to keep the public uh, the public option alive. And I said, as I said earlier, I think tonight's discussion is more about the the physical aspect, the architecture, and and the positioning of these. Um, so we don't have to address it tonight. The um, the comment, numerous comments that we've heard, including tonight uh, from the public about, and I would agree about the sort of boxiness of the of the uh, the structure that's in front of Village Saki. Um, I I think that's probably where we started in in council thinking we should not allow roofs, but we've gone back on that and I can see why. I think it's good to, to allow roofs, but um, I'm noting that all of the photos that are in the, the supplement, the, uh, the parklet standards, uh, all of the photos look very open and they, they look very attractive and they look like the ones we have in town that the public is finding attractive. They're just open. They look like seats out. Uh, people are visible when they're when they're using them. When someone walks by and someone is there, they can talk with the people who are walking by. It's an open uh, structure. Uh, but I'm just wondering where we make that clear. Like we say that the the walls on the side of the or the railings on the side. We, we specify the height of the railings, but we don't necessarily specify that they should be railings and be open underneath as opposed to being walls, which is kind of like the one at the Village Saki looks like is, is walls that are up to waist high. And then most of the year there's a uh, transparent material above the walls, so it's really boxed in. But even without the transparent material, is it is it clear in here that the way the all these example photographs are 
is what we're looking for, which is something that's a more open architecture. Because um, I think that is what we what we would be looking for. And there's always a there's always a question with that because um, <laughs> thinking a lot about climate and energy, I, I'm not interested in trying to heat the outdoors. And that's something that I see with with these uh, with outdoor dining a lot that we that we have currently we have typically propane heaters uh, and when the when the thing is completely open and it's cold in the winter then you're just blasting the propane trying to keep a little bit warm while you're sitting outside and. I know that merchants don't like, or the, the, the proprietors of restaurants don't like that because people are cold and uh, and it costs a lot of propane. But so there's sort of two sides to that. You know, you would want to close it in to some extent uh, in the winter, but you, but for visibility, you really don't want it closed in. But I'm leaning toward and I think what we're trying to do here is that we do allow roofs. And as we discussed, they don't necessarily have to be transparent roofs. I don't see anything in there that says that they have to be transparent or translucent roofs. So that allows it to be closed in to keep the heat from, from going up off the top. Um, it doesn't necessarily say that you couldn't cover them with some kind of transparent covering around the around the the, uh, the at least the lower part of the railings in the winter. Correct me if I'm wrong. I didn't see anything that that prohibited that. But in terms of just the visibility, I I think what we're looking for and what we're envisioning is like what the photographs look like, which is open railings of open decks, maybe even not with railings everywhere. Um. Um, Bruce, that's, since you're to get, make sure that's clear. Yeah, yeah. since you, you keep talking about railings, I'm, I have it open to where it says railings should be visually appropriate and may not consist of lattice, wood, or plastic, or plastic or vinyl. So, okay. um, yeah, all right, yeah, yeah, I remembered the lattice. I hadn't, I hadn't noticed that. Okay, so that's kind of specifying that we're looking at open, open railings then. Okay, so if we're all comfortable with that, I guess it's clear in there, the way it's written. I'm sorry that I uh, didn't catch that. I think okay. that's all my comments. I think it looks Thank pretty you. good overall. Thank you, everyone. So <clears throat> where does that leave us? I believe we have to talk about the timing and the deadlines. And Barbara had suggested a, a uh, uh, what you read from the San Anselmo thing. I don't know how we can, I'd love to proceed tonight. I think I'm feeling like it's, we're ready to, to take this step. And then the next step would be getting into the fee structure and so forth. But I'd, I'd hate to derail that because we have to wordsmith another paragraph, but well, um, that's why I provided my comments early that unfortunately um, um, I only got feedback on one thing that I provided. So I had hoped that we could have worked this out, but I know. Um, I, I, Barbara, I think it's, uh, I think we could just replace and or add that language from the San Anselmo piece. I well, why don't we do this? Um, okay, so let's sort of, let's see if we can finish this because our next step would be to hear about the fees in the future. And so if we can finish this, David, I'm just gonna, or I, this is a, the first, whereas in uh, ordinance, I, in the attachment A, was incorrect, this is not for David, this is for Heather and Janet. We need to replace that with the correct whereas, which I read. Um, I will defer to my colleagues on the council about not deleting public parklet. Um, and then when we talked about the licensing on page three, um, I think we should add ABC. 
and we don't have to add the clarification as Chance suggests. Okay, moving on to the supplement. Let's just talk about that and quickly get it changed. Okay, page seven of the document uses the old name outdoor dining structure. I think David can easily change that to Parkway. Um, the piece, there's two potential pieces where we have to have some work. And this is where we talk about flood safety. And, it, and so I want to know, since I did provide that early, I know David's not feeling well, um, if we can include that language, removing the term anchoring, if that works, just to, I already read it out. I don't think anybody wants to hear it. It, it has a spot in the first bullet on page six that would fit because it says all platforms must provide adequate curbside drainage flow and may not block gutters. So why not just replace that with the language from the San Anselmo that you already submitted? Um, well, I think, I think that that one sentence that you just read is good. And then if we just add the little bit more from that I already provided and I already read, uh, from San Anselmo, I think we're good to go. Just remove the term and anchor. David, does that work for you? I, I did yes. provide that prior. Okay, yes, and yes. then the only thing I didn't provide specific language to, and I'll just ask, is the heater, the second bullet says electric heaters are allowed and must comply with all safety requirements. Do you believe that covers the idea of taping down the cord so people aren't tripping and falling over those? To me, that means a little bit more about not having some old kind of wiring that'll start a fire. So I'll just ask your expertise here, David. Um, Councilmember Kohler, I don't think it's necessary to provide that additional information. You know, keep in mind that the building official is going to be issuing the parklet permit there is going to be an inspection. Uh, there will be monitoring. So I think what's there is adequate and you don't need to provide that further detail. Okay, thank you. I withdraw that comment. <laughs> thank you for your expertise and staying up so late with us, David. Yeah, and just to, just to say, I, you know, I've spoken several times about the possibility of of cutting through a sidewalk and bringing conduit out and so forth. And I'm happy with the language that's in there right now. It basically says it needs to be safe. And I trust our building inspector to know what safe is. So Excellent. yeah, okay. I, I think it's good the way it is. Okay. So if if we have that, I'm happy to to make the motion if it's helpful, just because I could say what those few changes are. Um, before you make the motion, I, you know, I, I, everyone's saying that we're just talking about sort of design things, but in section 5.58.030, page three of the ordinance, um, it does have criteria, it's criteria. So it's not necessarily just design. Are we going to have a place to talk about music when we bring back fees and all of that next bit of the conversation? or do we need to have that as part of the criteria? I, I just don't know how, if music's just gonna be plopped in around fee schedule and permitting, does I, it fit? I could through the mirror. I think it would be helpful to get a sense from, from the council, what your feeling is, what the direction is in terms of music. I, I lack some information on this at this time. I don't know if the town is requiring uh, a permit for, you know, outdoor amplified music, that sort of thing. I don't have that information at this time. Um, but is it your intent to require some sort of extra permitting for outdoor music at a parklet? Um, it, you know, are you trying to encourage um, music at the parklets or are you trying to control it? You know, where are you coming from in terms of music at the parklets? I would like to propose that we allow acoustic um, in the parklets. 
and just uh, it doesn't require a permit, but no amplified. Um, it's just such a nice ambiance. Some of these places could have one person playing classical guitar, acoustic, and you'd be it would be lovely. Can I just add one thing to that? Um, is say no amplified music and no percussion because you could have a drummer out there making a whole lot of noise. If you just kept it to no amplified or no, I don't know if percussion's the right, is that for drums? I don't know. Yeah, but you know, I mean, percussion is also shakers and I, I feel a little strange that we've put those constraints. I'm not sure where they came from on the farmer's market music, which has been entirely respectful this year. I can't even hear it. Um, but I don't like constraining musicians, although I do believe we can say no amplified music. So I don't know how y'all feel about that. I like that, Renee. I'm okay with that. So why don't we add to 5.58030 and F, which says no amplified music in the parklets. Okay. Sounds good to me. Okay, so I'm ready to make the motion now because I think I'm the one who made a lot of changes. So I think I might be able to. Okay, if I may. Chance, were you about to say something though? You're okay, all right. I think Janet was about to say something. I, I'm trying, yes, I'm looking at it and I'm trying to understand the comment about the uh, ABC, what you want to add in. Um, I see that in the definition of licensed establishment. Is there something? Sure. Okay, well, I may have missed that. Let's see. Um, I, okay, then that's fine. Withdrawn. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, thanks for pointing that out. Okay, now I'm ready to make the motion. I'm going to, can I do it in two separate or this is long. Okay, I'll, I'll do what I can. Okay, introduce number one. Introduce way first reading and read by title only an ordinance of the town council of the town of Fairfax establishing a parklets program and adding a new chapter 5.8 parklets to title five of the Fairfax town code with these changes. The fourth whereas in attachment A shall read, shall be deleted, and instead shall read, whereas on July 6, 2022, the town council adopted resolution number 22-53, extending the expiration date for all outdoor dining, TEPs and TEPs to December 15, 2022, semicolon, and, and on Attachment A, page 5.58030, adding item F, which states no amplified music in the parklets. And okay, that's number one. Number two, introduce way first reading and read by title only an ordinance of the town of Fairfax amending town code chapter 12.32, temporary carports and other structures in the public rights of way to include separate processes for granting encroachment permits for residential structures from commercial parklet structures, amending section 12.32, 32.020 to regulate only residential structures and adding section 12.32.025 to regulate commercial structures and amending chapter 17.096 CH Highway Commercial Zone, section 17.096.040 principal permitted uses and structures, and chapter 17.100 CC Central Commercial Zone, section 17.100.040, principal permitted uses and structures to allow parklets as a permitted use 
and parklet enclosures with an encroachment permit issued by the Public Works Department for commercially developed properties in the CH and CC zone districts. And three, adopt a resolution adopting parklet standards with two changes. On page seven, the diagram shall replace the name outdoor dining structure with the term parklet. And then on page five and six, where it talks about design, add under flood safety. This is from San Anselmo's guidance. Parklets must be designed to prevent flotation, collapse, or lateral movement due to water action, including hydrodynamic and hydrostatic loads and buoyancy, period. If located in a flood zone, platforms must be designed to allow water to flow through the area utilizing materials such as hog wire or other material that may be removed during high flood risk rain events. The plat period, the platform and associated improvements must comply with FEMA flood regulations and allow for the free flow of water in the roadway. Someone want to second that, please? I'll second that. And that was a magnificent reading. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can we get a roll call, please? Yes. Uh, Council Member Goddard. Yes. Council Member uh, Ackerman. Yes. Council Member Kohler. Yes. Vice Mayor Cutrano. Yes, with uh, special gratitude to Council Member Goddard for her leadership on this work. Mm -hmm. And Mayor Hellman. Yes. With eyes all. Passing. Thank you, David. Thank you, Heather. And yes, thank you, Renee. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need to invoke the 1130 rule right now. One more thing on the agenda. One more thing. I, I got to tell you, I'm hanging on by a string. It's 2.30 a.m. where I am. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, but I know, Sean, you've, you've been sticking it out. So I'm not going to suggest anything other than. This you is, this see, is a status update, not a decision. So I'm yeah. going for it. So we're waiving the 11.30 rule and continuing with. I would one. move to do that. Yeah. I'll second. Thank you. Uh, I just Council. wanted to let you know I'm I'm not going to be at my best. Well, <laughs> and Sean's been here for quite a while too, so I think we owe it to him to hear his update. Can we do a quick roll call vote that. on that, please? Council Member Kohler. Yes. Council Member Goddard. Yes. Council Member Ackerman. Yes. Vice Mayor Catrano. Yes. And Mayor Hellman. Yes. Thank you. Go. Shall I take it away? <laughs> good, 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 good evening, and I, I I am sorry that you have to bear through yet another presentation, but um, I will try to be brief. Unfortunately, it is a bit technical too, so um, yeah, try to stay awake with me here. Um, but I would like to provide an update on where we're at in the development of a countywide uh, green building. Model reach code. Oh, I should probably start the presentation. There we go. Um, including the details of what we know it will include at this point, the current timeline for proposed reach code adoption, and policy considerations for adopting the reach code. But um, just want to emphasize we're not making any key decisions tonight, um, thankfully. And uh, this is more just to provide an update of where we're at and, and some considerations to just prime future discussion on this topic. Um, and to set the stage for the discussion, I just want to quote something from the uh, CEC's uh, 2022 Building Energy Efficiency Standards Summary, which says, REACH standards are an important tool for jurisdictions to meet their own climate goals. It allows them to decide on standards that meet their needs and interests, so long as they also meet or exceed state code requirements. 
Um, historically, such local ordinances have served as a bellwether for statewide, statewide standards. They provide a place to test market readiness for new technologies and regulations, drive innovation of new technologies and efficiencies, and bring down the cost of efficient building technologies by creating an installed user base that encourages scale manufacturing. So quick background, building codes. Um, the state of California updates building code every three years and all jurisdictions must adopt this code at a minimum. However, cities and counties may also choose to adopt uh, local building codes uh, that reach above and beyond the state minimum known as reach codes. A local jurisdiction can choose to adopt reach code in order to achieve additional health, safety, and environmental benefits, such as increased energy and emission savings. The latest uh, 2022 California Building Standards Code was published July 1st, 2022, with an effective date of January 1st, 2023. Uh, the County of Marin, in collaboration with local jurisdiction staff, including building officials and sustainability staff and MCE staff, have been developing a model of green uh, building reach code since September 2021 that includes additional requirements that go beyond the 2022 state code. Um, specifically for new construction and remodels of existing residential buildings. So getting into what we know about this REACH code so far, um, it will address two primary building categories, new buildings, including residential, multifamily, and commercial, and existing residential buildings, including single and low-rise multifamily homes. So that's the first important aspect of the REACH code to consider is the scope of building types included. Um, starting with new buildings, the REACH code would require the buildings to be all electric. This would not have any effect on Fairfax's existing building code since Fairfax has already adopted an ordinance to require all electric appliances for new buildings. For renovations of existing residential buildings, it would require the project to meet a target energy score using a point system that allows for a flexible range of building measures and presents opportunities uh, to favor electric heat pumps, space, and water heaters that are more energy efficient, um, which is referred to as the flexible compliance path. And this path acknowledges that every renovation project is unique and a rigid set of requirements may not be optimal. The exact square footage threshold of when a renovation would be uh, required to meet the target Energy score is still being determined, but any project less than the threshold would just have to meet the minimum state building code requirements. Uh, at this time, the proposed REACH code is not expected to include requirements for substantial remodels, which applies when more than 50% of the building floor area is remodeled, nor will it include any all electric requirements for renovations, but it will incentivize electrification for renovations by allocating more points to measures like installing heat pump water heaters. Lastly, there will be no time of uh, no time of replacement requirements for gas appliances in existing buildings in which gas appliances would have to be replaced with electric appliances uh, upon failure, for example. So the process of developing this uh, model reach code started back in September 2021 and Fairfax staff have gone involved in the steering committee and technical working group meetings over the past few months. The steering committee has hosted several technical working group meetings with Marin jurisdictions, uh, building officials to discuss challenges and concerns associated with building electrification and how to overcome them. Uh, members of the building community, including architects and contractors, have also been invited to these meetings to provide their input along with utility representatives. Uh, to gather input from the larger Marin community, the steering committee hosted a virtual community workshop on June 22nd that include discussions about impacts of building electrification on affordable housing, the power grid, the environment, and public health. And two focus groups have also been held to gather input from local community-based organizations and multifamily developers. <clears throat> uh, county staff are currently drafting the REACH code, including a template staff report ordinance in the code itself, that will be first reviewed by jurisdiction staff, including the building officials, and they are targeting to have it ready by mid-August, so pretty soon. Um, after receiving feedback from jurisdiction staff, a refined version of the REACH code will be shared with the Climate Action Committees, councils, and other stakeholders. In order to have the REACH code uh, take effect when the new 
state building code becomes effective on January 1st, 2023, the REACH code would need to be adopted by the end of this year. Um, the original proposed timeline for REACH code adoption provided by the county is on the right hand side of the slide. This timeline also includes submitting the relevant documents to the state agencies, including the CEC and the Building Standards Commission, if a REACH code is adopted. So again, just to prime like the future discussion on this, um, I want to cover what some of the different policy options are here. So although we're still waiting to see what the initial draft of the REACH code will include, based on what we know thus far, there uh, are important policy options and considerations that will need to be weighed by council prior to introducing an ordinance to update the town's building codes. There are essentially three main policy options for council to consider. So number one, adopt the state building code and maintain the town's existing reach code for all electric uh, for new buildings. Um, number two would be everything in option one plus adopt the countywide model reach code requiring the flexible compliance path for residential remodels uh, beyond a predetermined square footage threshold. And then number three would be everything in option one plus adopt an alternative reach code with either uh, with different requirements uh, than, the, than the model reach code that either go beyond or, or um, change those, those model reach code requirements in some way. So one note about adopting the state building code is that council will also need to consider whether to adopt voluntary tier one or tier two requirements in addition to the mandatory measures um, this is beyond the scope of this REACH code discussion, but um, will need to be uh, discussed in, uh, when we get to the point of um, uh, you know, introducing a, a REACH code if we, if we get to that. On, on the next slide, um, I'll delve more into the policy consider considerations for the model REACH code um, and why it may be advantageous um, or disadvantageous uh, compared to the other policy options described here. So as we delve into these considerations, please note that I'll just be focusing on cons considerations related to remodel projects, um, since again, Fairfax already has the um, all electric ordinance for new construction. The first consideration is what the proposed reach codes impact could be in terms of GHG emissions reductions. Um, although it's unfeasible to estimate what the reductions would be used in the flexible compliance path, as each project would be able to implement different energy efficiency or electrific electrification measures. Um, we can say that the REACH code would result in further emissions reductions than if option one were to be pursued where the state building code is adopted and the existing REACH code is maintained. Um, however, to achieve a 100% reduction of emissions from the 2005 baseline by 2030, additional mandatory measures will likely be required to reduce emissions from the building sector rapidly. For example, one of those proposed measures in Fairfax's climate action plan is measure E1, which includes adopting requirements to phase out natural gas starting with new construction and then substantial remodels. This is where poly op policy option three may need to be considered to impose additional requirements to ensure Fairfax meets its emission reduction goal. Cost effectiveness is another important policy consideration. Using the flexible compliance path for remodels as proposed by the REACH code, a cost effectiveness explore tool would be used to develop a variety of cost effective efficiency measures, such as the example shown on the right hand side of the slide. These measures would then be outputted to compliance tables to be placed within policy documents. The advantage of this method is that it allows a jurisdiction to demonstrate cost effectiveness of the REACH code to the CEC without conducting additional studies, thus saving money and staff time. Additionally, if the model reach code were to be adopted with this flexible compliance path for residential remodels, then it would likely be more cost effective for any project subject to those requirements than if stricter all electric requirements are imposed on those same projects. Um, for some final considerations, one of the original goals of developing this model reach code was to try to provide predictability 
and consistency to the building community and project applicants by ensuring all Marin jurisdictions adopt essentially the same requirements for the building codes. If Fairfax pursues an alternative reach code with different requirements, then we will lose out on the opportunity to provide more uniform requirements countywide. Additionally, if an alternative reach code were to be adopted, say that includes all electric requirements <clears throat> for remodels, then this may make it more difficult for project applicants to comply and then may purposely limit the scope of the project to avoid having to meet the uh, additional requirements. If the model reach code were to be adopted, there may be some concern about how this could impact community resiliency in the event of PG&E uh, power outages. Although any additional electrification of appliances could be impacted by such events, it's important to note that natural gas infrastructure is also vulnerable to these PSPS events and often has to be shut down during natural disasters, um, such as wildfires and earthquakes. If solar with battery energy storage are installed on a property, <laughs> this can largely mitigate any vulnerabilities to power outages. And it's expected that installations of solar paired with energy storage will continue to accelerate in the coming years as costs continue to, de to decrease. Finally, equity always needs to be consideration with the adoption of any policy, including the proposed reach code. In this case, the flexible compliance approach for res residential remodels will likely help keep costs down for multifamily remodels, especially if energy efficiency and um, electrification measures are paired, compared to adopting more stringent all electric requirements for these buildings as might be proposed within alternative reach code. Adopting energy efficiency and electrification measures through the flexible compliance path will likely help renters save money on their utility bills and improve public health in the process by reducing emissions and air pollution. Once found draft of reach code is made available, staff will provide further details to council of what it includes and seek council direction on the policy options discussed previously. Um, that concludes my presentation. I know that was a lot <laughs> to go over late at night, but I'm happy to answer any questions um, you might have uh, about uh, what we know so far about this reach code. Well, um, I won't I won't get into details, uh, detailed questions, but I'm glad we're not having to make a decision about this tonight because it's pretty complicated, as you said. Um, there's uh, there's some real. I'm not sure myself what direction I would I would even want to go, but the between the flexible path that the county is pursuing, which and there's also the advantage, as you said, of trying to get all the jurisdictions to do something similar, which I know the building community really prefers. Uh, and then the other considerations you gave, like equity. Uh, there's, there's a lot to be said on that side, but on the other hand, we're not gonna reach our 2030 zero greenhouse gas goal by saying you can do part of it now. And then next time you do a remodel, you can do more because next time you do a remodel is probably not going to be before 2030. So I expect there'll be a robust discussion about this on the Climate Action Committee and and possibly elsewhere. But thank you very much for that presentation. Um, one thing that just comes to my mind just as a question about whether what kind of things uh, you all are thinking about in this ongoing discussion about uh, on the county level. Uh, for example, if someone were remodeling their kitchen and it were not going to be a requirement that they have to change out their gas stove to uh, an induction stove, but would it be a requirement that they need to put in a 240 volt outlet so that they could do that in the future? Because that's sort of a logical time to do that when you're remodeling the kitchen. You know. That's just, a, just, you don't even have to answer that if you don't want to, but that kind of question is, makes a lot of difference in terms of how quickly we're moving this and, and um, how we're kind of taking the approach that, you know, this is all gonna happen for sure. And it's just a matter of when and how hard we push and the equity and economic considerations of how hard we 
have to push people, but that it's not optional. It's all going to happen eventually. They're, we're going to be done with gas stoves, for example, eventually. So therefore, you know, it would be logical to put the, the wiring in while you've got the option. Um, there's a lot to think about with these things, but yeah, thank you for the presentation. Yeah, uh, just on that note, um, Councilmember Ackman, I, so I've been delving into the, the energy code changes of, of the state code and, you know, what the state's trying to do right now is, is try to get, especially new, it's focused on new construction and substantial remodels. I'm, I'm not exactly sure how they define that versus how we define it, but mm -hmm. the, the goal is, is to get those, those homes, you know, multifamily, single family and commercial um, electric ready. So to your point, and, and that's a huge roadblock with um, getting people to adopt these, these electric appliances, because the appliances themselves are real becoming more cost comparable with, yeah. with gas. It's really the electrical upgrades and stuff that are the issue. Um, so the state is trying to, to th there's tons of, of requirements in there to where you have to um, be electric ready now and you have to have a 240 volt, um, you know, dedicated circuit, including if you're going to install, you know, some gas stove, it's, it's also got to be electric ready. <clears throat> so I, I think they're just kind of preempting the eventual code that will require, um, you know, all electric for new construction. Hopefully we'll see that in the next code cycle, but Right now, it's it's more focused on just getting things electric ready, um, and and it doesn't go as far as it, in in certain situations. I think it does require um, like a heat pump, water heater to be installed, but it's only in particular climate zones. So there's there's some uh, caveats there, um, mm -hmm. but that's that's kind of the focus of at least of the energy code the updates to the energy code is to get buildings electric ready. Thank you. Sean, thank you so much for your presentation. I just had one comment or question. I mean, is um, <clears throat> I'm not certain uh, with our current all electric code for new development, um, whether or not we've actually in tested the waters with that or whether or not anybody's actually gone through with that yet or pulled permits for a project that would be Im impacted by that. But I'm curious, as we start to talk about the partial remodel, substantial remodel discussion. Um, when you do come back this fall with something for us, would it be possible to get some data looking back the last, I don't know, five to 10 years or so to get a sense of the number of units that might be impacted annually by you know, doing something either, I mean, of course, new development, but, you know, 75% or 50% or 51% remodel. I just don't have any sense of how many folks are doing this work in our community. So it's hard for me to grasp the implications of, you know, pushing the envelope on, on some of this stuff at the moment. Yeah, I can definitely um, uh, ask Mark for uh, one of the things that we'd like to try to get some data on if it's possible is if we do have a square footage threshold or there will be a square footage threshold, just I'm still figuring out what that will be, how many projects could potentially be impacted by that. But it, it sounds like, at least from what I've heard from the San Selma building official, it can be hard to, um, it's not so easy as just, you know, search a spreadsheet or something for that information. You have to look at the drawings and, and the drawings aren't always accurate. And so you have to use these tools to, actually measure what the true square footage is. So um, it may be a little bit difficult to see how many projects will actually be impacted by the uh, this flexible compliance path tool. Um, but just from what Mark has told me in the past um, about the substantial remodels, or, or sorry, uh, just for, for permits, at least for, um, for these appliances, I, I guess we issued 106 furnace um, permits last year and 47 uh, water, water heater permits. Um, so, you know, these are being, there, there's a, yeah, a substantial number of these plants is being replaced every year. Um, and hopefully we'd at least be able to capture, encourage uh, some of those to, um, you know, be electric appliances through this uh, compliance path tool. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, one one thing that I've read in and we've gotten we've had some presentations, as you know, Sean, on CAC about reach codes. And uh, one thing that I picked up from that is that uh, just the, this flexible approach is trying to kind of look at what people really want. And for example, a water heater, people don't tend to care that much whether it's gas or electric as long as it works and it's um, not too expensive to run. Whereas with, for example, a cook stove, people may have a really passionate feeling about what kind of thing they want to use for cooking. So these yeah, you know, these are different kind of things, even though from an energy point of view, they're you know, they they're all in the same envelope. So I do appreciate that. I appreciate trying to work through the uh, this this uh, difficult thing of trying to convince the entire population to change a whole bunch of things in their houses. <laughs> it's, it's a big thing to do. And so we're, we're actually moving pretty well on it. But um, so I, I appreciate that. The should we go to the, the public? Yeah. Yeah, I think we should. We're getting into discussion. Okay. Okay, let's open the public Oh, there she is. I thought we lost her. <laughs> you went to sleep. <laughs> I'm, I'm hanging on. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. So would any Sean, members of the public, yeah, sorry. If any members of the public wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand now. I see one hand and that is Mark Bell. You're unmuted now. Thanks, Michelle. <clears throat> I don't know how many remodels you're gonna get when you have people with older houses telling them they need a 220, 240 line and their, and their electrical panel is full. Uh, that's quite a ticket. Uh, what I mentioned to the other guy who was uh, on the action committee is, uh, I don't know why there's not a national movement and maybe Sean, you know something about it, is that appliances in the United States use 30 to 40% more electrical energy than those in Europe. And it's the same companies. American companies uh, own portions, if not all of the European uh, models. They have the technology, they refuse to bring it here. And I think that that's something that maybe you should look into, especially if you're concerned with what's happening. Second thing is phantom power. Uh, phantom power is still, uh, pretty prevalent in most devices. And that it eats up, what is it, five to 10% of the grid. And that's another uh, area uh, that should be addressed. And again, on a, a more national level, maybe you know how to go about it since that's your field of study. Uh, and the other thing uh, I have to say is, you know, the constant barrage of of electronic music is using power. And so I just find it odd that, you know, uh, you know, if you really want to know what it's like at the market, as far as the volume is, you should just stand or sit in my front yard. No, it's not acceptable, especially last week for the first hour and a half. It was grotesque. You know, the Fairfax picnic, 85 decibels at my house. That's more than 400% uh, above what the sound limit is for residential area. So I think that those are issues or areas that uh, should be addressed. If you want to be this progressive town and you want to Thank cut you, down on e energy use, then those Thank are three you, areas. Um. I do not see any other speakers, Madam Mayor. Okay. We'll close the yeah. public comment. Thank you.
So we don't have to take action, but what what direction are you looking for right now, Sean? Um, I mean, it, it really was more just to provide an update on where we're at in this process and that, you know, we're, we're getting into the final stretch of having this reach code finalized um, and, and to, you know, just provide some information on, on what we know it includes right now and, and to start thinking through what, um, where, where we might want to go as far as, you know, adopting this estate code, the, this reach code or, or, an, or an alternative. Um, but obviously, you know, without seeing exactly what this reach code includes, what the, you know, these square footage thresholds and stuff, um, it's, it's obviously a little premature to make any um, poly policy decisions at this point. So um, as soon as we have that final draft available and, you know, it's been circulated and um, I, I would plan on, on bringing that back to council for discussion and, and further direction on, you know, it, there's there's also, you know, we, we still have to figure out, and I think Mark needs to be included in this, uh, for the, you know, Cal Green, you know, tier one, tier two, um, there, there's a lot of decisions to make on that too. And it, it all needs to be, it all needs to be part of one one package, basically. So, um, and, we, and I think we, we need to delve more into those those considerations as well for for the Cal Green changes um, to to the building code, and 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 to be honest, the county is still the county staff is still figuring out what they want to recommend as part of the model reach code for you know uh, adopting tier one versus tier two and, and things like that. Okay, well, thank you very much. We'll look forward to the next update and further discussion on CAC as well. Sounds good. Thank you. Vice Mayor, could I ask you to take over for the rest of the meeting? Sure. Yeah, that, that sounds all right. Okay, so let's get us across the finish line here. We have um, just the council reports and comments. Anything? Great. Okay, then we'll move on to the next thing, town manager's report. Anything from you, Heather? Uh, in the interest of uh, brevity, I just want to turn it over to David briefly to give you an update on the housing element timeline. Okay, thank you. Well, good evening or good morning. I'm not quite sure what to say, but probably good morning. Uh, today, the housing element subcommittee met uh, with Andy Flower and a number of his team members and we were given an update on the housing element. And also we discussed timeline and, and some of the components of the housing element project, like the eco village that's been discussed and also talked a bit about odds. But the focus I'd, I'd like to give tonight is just to give you kind of an overview of timeline and approach to finishing this project. We're, we're at a point now, um, being here in August, that we're behind the curve and really need to move this project forward. Uh, the project really, you know, needs to be completed technically by January 31st of 2023. There is a 90 day grace period. And with the project schedule that we discussed today, we're well into that 90 day grace period. So let me go over some dates and just give you kind of a sense of dates and approach to completing this project. At, at this point, we're looking at likely the week of September 20th for completion of what I'm going to refer to as the administrative draft of the housing element. And that would be the initial draft and the Administrative draft would be reviewed by staff and given the short timeline that we have at this point, the suggestion is that the housing element subcommittee would review this initial draft uh, with staff and the consultant team EMC. And based on our collaboration working together, we would release that draft 
out for a 30-day required public review, local public review. So that document would go out um, about the 27th or so of September for about 30 days or for 30 days. And during that period, the public would be encouraged to comment on that draft. And there would be, uh, during that period, a community meeting. And the community meeting would be a time uh, when the consultant would give an overview of the project, it would probably be a Zoom meeting, and encourage comments at that Zoom meeting. But in addition, comments would be uh, encouraged and received by way of an app, by way of email, by way of letters. And there was even discussion today about perhaps having a stand at the farmer's market. We would need written comments. At the end of the 30-day period, which would be about October 27th, those, those comments would be gathered, reviewed, and then suggested responses to those comments on the draft EIR, I'm sorry, the draft housing element would be put together, reviewed by the, the subcommittee and staff, and then forwarded on to HCD for their required 90-day review. And with that timeline, what we'd be looking at is that the draft housing element, after the 30-day local public review, receiving comments in the many media that I described, responding to those comments and forwarding it on to HCD, it would get to HCD probably about mid-November for a 90-day review. That gets us to about mid-February. And again, technically, the project, the housing element should be completed by January 31st, 2023. There is that 90-day grace period that I mentioned. So we would get comments back, theoretically, from HCD, first round of comments back mid-February, and then we would have to respond to those comments. At that time, what we would receive back from HCD and the proposed responses would go before the council. The council would work with the team, EMC staff, to decide how to respond to the comments from HCD. Hopefully, we would have only two rounds. That's maybe optimistic, but hopefully two rounds. And then the objective would be that by March of 2023, within the 90-day grace period, that the project could be completed. And when I say completed, that means that the housing element update, the safety element, that the EIR, certified EIR, all of that would be accomplished. And, and that's big picture. Along the way, the, the intent is that the objective design and development standards, the inclusionary zoning and rezonings as needed to support the housing element would be carried through planning commission and town council. And the idea is when the housing element with local responses goes to HCD for the 90 day review that the consultant team EMC would be able to say to HCD and the town of Fairfax is in the position of moving forward with its rezonings its inclusionary housing ordinance, and, and also its objective design and development standards. And that hopefully when the 90-day review is completed that, and we get the first comment letter back from HCD, we'd be in a position to say those elements had been done, that the odds had been approved, that the inclusionary zoning ordinance had been approved, and that the rezonings um, hopefully have been approved or are along the way to be approved. That would be the objective. And, and the rationale for that is to uh, give HCD, State Housing and Community Development, some comfort uh, that the town of Fairfax is, is seriously moving forward with implementing its policies and programs 
to support the housing element. So that that's kind of a, a general overview. Uh, council members Kohler and Goddard were at that meeting today. Uh, I think what's what's key here is to is to really be clear that in terms of where we are in terms of completing this project within the allotted time frame, uh, there is a need to facilitate this moving forward. And, and I believe that using the subcommittee to help in the review process could, could do that, could be very helpful. So the council members may, may wanna comment further on this. Uh, there was discussion today at the committee meeting about making sure that the full council was aware of kind of the overall timeline and the suggested approach to doing this project. So that's my, my overview, and I'd be happy to respond to any questions you may have. That was fantastic. Thank you, David. Really appreciate that. You're welcome. Um, I see uh, Councilmember Kohler's hand is up. Or, I'm sorry, explain. I asked you to run the meeting, and now I'm <laughs> all good, Mayor. All good. Um, I just want to add that um, there's a couple of things we need to keep in mind. Uh, number one, that um, our current housing element has a conditional certification because we never completed the zoning. And so Fairfax is red flagged with the HCD. The other piece that even though we started quite a long time ago and actually before some of our uh, colleagues in other jurisdictions were quite a bit behind, um, the desired deadline to get the draft to HCD and what they've asked is September 15th. And we can't, that's the public review draft having gone through public review response to comments. So we're looking at what we can do to move this as quickly as possible with making sure that we get the ideas of how much we know about Fairfax and our policies, and we are behind. So I'm totally committed to working uh, my proverbial butt off to um, help us get to the finish line. And I know I'm not, I don't want to speak for Council Member Goddard, but I know she's really committed as well. And so, I think with David's help, um, and we're very lucky to have David here, um, we're still going to be late. And part of the lateness means that our rezoning has to be completed in one year versus three years. And what David's pointing out is because we have this kind of red flag on us, we'd be better suited to have all that work done very earlier in the process. So um, just to add, and thank you, David, for staying up so late. Um, I, I have a clarifying question. Has this timeline that you just shared with us, has, has have the planning commission, they've been briefed on this or is there a plan to do that? So we're all in lockstep on the game plan because it really feels like that's needed. Um. Mayor, I agree with that. And our check-in was first with the subcommittee, which yeah. we, we did earlier today. And now we're coming to you, the town council. Our, our next steps were trying to schedule a couple of working sessions with the planning commission to, to review the odds and in, in other aspects of this project. And we have a date that we're targeting to, to meet with the planning commission and that's August 31st. So no, this, this particular timeline has not been shared yet with the planning commission, but the intent was to check in with the subcommittee, check in with the town council, and then hopefully we can schedule this working session with the planning commission on August 31st to, to talk about the project in some detail and, and likewise kind of give them a status report and get feedback from them and share with them uh, this approach and this timeline. And, okay, yeah, so you yes. would you would intend as far as that meeting on the 31st to publish 
a, a schedule so it's in black and white for everyone to really digest and commit to. Um, I would, in, in fact, yeah. I would hope actually to be able to do that sooner. Yeah. Um, to, be, to be honest, I mean, in terms Absolutely. of the website, in terms of the website, if, if this general timeline and this approach um, is acceptable, um, I would really like to work with an Andy Flower and his team on the website to kind of update the website and include kind of some of these dates um, that we feel more certain about and, and also the descriptions to give everybody kind of a sense of how we're moving forward and to get everybody kind of going in the same direction and to realize uh, the pressure that we're under at this point. You know, as, as Councilmember Kohler mentioned, you know, technically we, we really should have our, our draft, our, you know, local draft to, to ACD, going out to ACD mid-September. Uh, we're not gonna be able to do that, not even close. So uh, we're behind the curve and we really need to kind of all you know, get together and, and move this forward. Can I just ask a lame question and then chancel? Is there anything, is there any form of extension that you can ap apply for if you can demonstrate that you've made good on certain key milestones or anything like that? Well, HCD has already provided, you know, across the board, a 90 day grace period. And as Councilmember Kohler indicated, uh, you know, there are some concerns on the part of HCD with respect to Fairfax at this point. So in terms of the overview I gave you, the brief overview I gave you, the idea is to try to, you know, in parallel, get some of these things done or and indicate to HCD that we're doing some of these things like rezonings, odds, uh, inclusionary zoning, things like that. So right. I don't think beyond the 90 days, we can even discuss that at this point until, you know, this, this community really, you know, steps up and does a few things. Right. Thank you. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, uh, David, thanks for the, the update. Um, I just had one clarifying question about the timeline. Um, so if I understand this right, it would be, and, I, and it, please don't take this as like uh, me criticizing the, the process because I know that we're in a tight timeline, but it, I'm just trying to clarify for my own understanding, like when I'll, when I will be participating in any piece of the housing element in the future. So is it from, from now on the only time that the council would see the housing element before it comes back in Jan late January from HCD would be reading whatever comes out in, sep in that September to October 30 day window. And then like the community workshop would be like the one time that the council would be involved. Um, Vice Mayor Cutrano, in terms of directly involved, you're correct. However, the council subcommittee would be more directly involved in terms of reviewing that administrative draft housing element that would be received during the week of September 20th before it would go out to the public. And when it goes out to the public, council members like community members, all members of, of the community would have the opportunity to read and comment on that draft. And there would be that community meeting during that 30 day period when all members of the community could comment. All of the comments will need to be recorded um, and responded to and the, re and the recorded comments and the responses would go to HCD with a draft. Um, you're right though, in terms of when it would all come back, it would come back in total to the council when the HCD 90 day review is completed. And then you would receive it at that time with that comment letter to see how HCD has responded. But that's not to say that council members, like all community members, 
wouldn't have the opportunity to comment on the draft. And, and you do have the council subcommittee that would be working with the consultant team and staff more directly. Am I clear? Did I give you? Yeah, yeah, it is. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, it is clear. I, it, it, fe it feels tough, <laughs> but it feel, but it's also my first time being part of a housing element process. So it's, it feels hard to, to go forward and feel like I don't really know anything about it. Um, in terms of the, um, what, what it would look like substance wise, uh, until it comes back to us and has gone through a, a full process. But, um, I understand the gravity of the situation in terms of the timeline. Uh, it's just, I'm trying to make sense of it all, but anyway, I'll pass it along to uh council member Goddard. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm just sitting here feeling a little uncomfortable um, and um, council member Kohler is going to get angry at me, but since we've opened this conversation, even though it's not on the agenda, so I'm a little bit concerned about that. Um, I went back and listened to the meeting when council member Kohler and I were appointed to be this subcommittee and, you know, it was, it was not entirely clear. There is the, the, the authority was given to us to form this subcommittee to be um, involved in bringing David up to speed and to work on the housing element. And I did listen very carefully. Um, but this is a lot coming back to council um, with a timeline already in place. And um, Vice Mayor Catrano's points, I'm I'm feeling um, are a bit like the other council members have been left out of what is now a very, very quick timeline, understandable and very, <laughs> we're in a, we're in a, we're in a tough spot, but I'm just not feeling totally good that everyone's in agreement that this should go this way with the subcommittee moving so closely um, along with the process and the council only having a couple of touches on it. So, I mean, I think that that conversation should be had. This is our only open session until September. So I don't know when that would happen, but but I am feeling a little uncomfortable leaving three council members uncertain and having this sprung on them at 1220 in a town manager's report. Um, maybe Janet can speak to this. Well, um, I understand your concern, but I do I did think that it was pretty clear that we were making a housing element subcommittee and that they would be working closely with David uh, and EMC to continue on and finish out the, the housing element um, to the next steps. You know, it's um, there are going to be many opportunities for review of this. Um, it's not like it's going to be finished when it goes off to HCD. We'll have comments, it'll come back. And so I do understand your concern, but you know, my concern, frankly, with having you as being one of the council members on the subcommittee was that you won't be here after December. And um, you had already you know, announced that you weren't going to run again. And so we're gonna to have to have another new member replacement um, in December for this subcommittee to continue on with it. Um, and so at perhaps at that point in time, there can be somebody who's very interested and wants to, you know, has the background and the knowledge that you have, um, can uh, volunteer to also be on the subcommittee then. And maybe that will, that will alleviate some of that. But I, I understand your concern, but I think at this point in time, if we're going to have a hope of making um, the time frame, we need to move this quickly. And we really do need to have the initial reviews done by the subcommittee. There'll be plenty of other opportunities um, to look at the document, to comment on the document, to make changes to it, et cetera. But um, this initial review, we really do need to sort of get it out of the starting gate. And that's why we're, we're taking this tax. And David, if you have something else you'd like to add. Um, no. 
Janet, I don't. I mean, I agree with you completely. Um, I think at this point, uh, working with the subcommittee would be helpful to meet the timeline that I've presented that we discussed earlier today. And there, there will be opportunities through the process for all council members to, to comment, uh, to see the responses, and then ultimately to respond to directly the comments coming back from HCD. So, and there are also other aspects of this project that we'll be working with the council and commission directly on the rezonings, the inclusionary ordinance, the odds. Um, you know, I presume, I wasn't here, of course, but I presume in terms of the sites analysis, which is such a key aspect of a housing element update, that the, the council and commission were, were involved in that. Mm -hmm. and, and frankly, the sites analysis is, is absolutely key and critical to a housing element update. So when we talk about a draft, there are, there are aspects, you know, there, there's a site analysis and there are the other things I just mentioned. So um, there's a lot going on here. And I think that the council probably has been involved with and will be involved with uh, much of this. So we put out this, this timeline and as I look at this timeline, best case, you know, I think it's an op optimistic situation is that we can finish this in March of 2023. And that's just inside the 90 day grace period. So I, I, you know, I feel that that's even optimistic at this point. So yeah. I agree with you, Janet. I want to just add, um, you know, this council has a lot of priorities. And I look at the future forecast, and there's a lot of big policy things, rent stabilization, just cause eviction. We, we seem to want everything at once. And I go back to the last housing element that we did, and it was more involved with the Affordable Housing Committee and with the Planning Commission. And life is different now because we have to have this 30-day public comment review draft that was not required in the past. It, yeah, I think it was still kind of done, but not to the level that we're talking about now. And I'm really concerned. Fairfax has a target on its back with all of Marin because it's well known that Marin people are not really supportive of housing. And um, we could we need to make, I'd like this to get sooner than March, but we're probably not gonna get there. And if we don't make it, I think it's highly likely that we will be targeted as the first one with some other communities elsewhere in the Bay Area that Rob Bonta will go after for penalties and potentially receivership. And if we think we've lost a lot of control with what we're doing with some of the state laws, we would lose everything. So I think that Renee and I, for now, have the most history on this council and the most knowledge of the prior housing element. And yeah, if, if we had been in much better shape, which we're not, then I think we could have gone through the council on everything. But I have watched a couple of council meetings recently where they did approve sending things to HCD. Mill Valley took 45 minutes going through every policy. We would never be able to do that. And um, uh, I know uh, Tiburon, went very quickly. We're we're behind almost everybody in Marin County. So it may feel uncomfortable. And I think Vice Mayor Catrano, when it's time for Renee to leave the council, if if you're really interested in stepping up to the subcommittee, that might be a good time. But um I think David's pointing out that we have been involved as an entire council 
in the most critical piece, which was the science. That was the most critical piece that we got to for the project. And as he said, Council and Planning Commission will be doing the zoning. There'll be many bites at this apple. It's just not reviewing the entire document with David and the team, but you will have an opportunity to review the whole document should you want to. Well, I, uh, I'm in agreement with it and comfortable isn't a word I would use, but I don't see any choice. Um, and David, I, this is the first time I've really had heard you speak with, to any extent other than just saying hello when you came in, but uh, I appreciate your being here. And the, obviously the fact that we have had your position unfilled for a long time as part of part of our issue, but also as Barbara says, uh, we tend to talk about things for a long time in Fairfax. And uh, I, I think what you gave us tonight was it's kind of shocking, but it I think it was very well thought through and, and well presented. And this is what you've got to do. You've got to, you've got to look at it, work out the timeline and say, okay, how are we going to get there? And at this point, when you do that, I can't criticize what you came up with. And uh, yeah, the timeline says we got to move. So yeah, I, uh, I, I, I agree with the approach that you're proposing. Yeah. And with that, I'd have to give enormous thanks to Renee and Barbara for stepping into that subcommittee. I don't know if you knew how deeply you were stepping into it at the time, but yeah, you're all gonna be pretty busy. Let us know any way we can help. <laughs> well, oh man. Well, yeah, there will there will be there'll be a lot more things. I, you know, this is there. We're a very busy council this last year. I don't know how far back it goes, but it just seems like we've just got many overlapping, multiple big things that we're that we're doing. And amazingly, I think we're doing a pretty good job of them, but it's, you know, it's a lot. And it's not like once we get finished with these two we're working on now, then there's a break. It's like, no, it's going to ramp up even more. So we're, we're busy and we're ambitious and we're also being pushed very hard by the state. So here we are. Okay. Um, well, I don't know if Mayor Hellman is is close at hand here. I know it's quite late where she is, but um, thanks for that uh, town manager's report. And um, I think the next, the only other thing on our agenda is the future agenda items. Anything there from anyone? Um, All right. Well, uh, then I believe we can adjourn. Um, in the memory of Judy Cantor, Tim Mazzola, and Sarah, Sally, Bobst, Chure, and Rama Kumar. May I say something, Vice Mayor? Please. Um, Judy Cantor was my cousin who passed away way too soon. Tim Mazzola was a very dear friend who just committed suicide. And uh, Sally uh, Chure. I went to her house for the 90 plus celebration and met her about a week before her 100th birthday. And she was having a birthday celebration the next week. So she made it past her 100th birthday. And when I was with her, incredibly vibrant, 
wonderful woman, and I think most of us knew Rama Kumar. So thank you for adjourning in all these folks' memory. And I would, can I just add that if anybody, or if folks never had a chance to um, read Rama's um, letters to the editor, I recommend that you Google back um, the Marin IJ letters to the editor, Rama Kumar. And he wrote things that just lifted my spirits. He got to the core of, of life in a way that I've never heard in a letter to the editor in the Marin IJ. So I cut m multiple of those out and um, I will hold those um, as a memory of Rama. I think a lot of people miss Rama downtown. If you go by the piano down by Fairfix, Give it a tap and and remember Rama. All right. Well, that concludes our meeting tonight. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.